an alabama student and other biographical essays by william osler preface to a lifelong interest in biography as a recreation i have added a strong conviction of its value in education and so it has happened that for the occasional address a biographical subject was often chosen of those here collected all of which have already appeared in the journals more than half deal with aspects of the life of physicians in the united states in what better way could i show gratitude for the extraordinary kindness experienced during twenty-one years than by a constant appeal to the students to take as their models the great men of the profession of their own country in no age and in no land have the hippocratic ideals been more fully realized than in some of the lives here portrayed pictures such as these detached as many of them are from each other have but one value to the student to waken that precious quality of human sympathy which may enable him to appreciate that in the simple annals of such a career as the alabama student a life may be as perfect as in a harvey or a locke william osler End preface one chief among the hard sayings of the gospel is the declaration he that loveth father or mother or son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me yet the spirit that made possible its acceptance and which is responsible for christianity as it is or rather perhaps as it was is the same which in all ages has compelled men to follow ideals even at the sacrifice of the near and the dear ones at home in varied tones to all at one time or another the call comes to one to forsake all and follow him to another to scorn delights and live the laborious days of a student to the third to renounce all in the life of a sunyasi many are the wand-bearers few are the mystics as the old greek has it or in the words which we know better many are the called but few are chosen the gifts were diversified but the same spirit animated the flaming heart of st teresa the patient soul of palissy the potter and the mighty intellect of john hunter we honor those who respond to the call we love to tell the story of their lives and while feeling perhaps that we could not have been with them faithful unto death yet we recognize in the power of their example the leaven which leavens the mass of selfishness about us these mystics and chosen are often not happy men often not the successful men they see of the travail of their souls and are not satisfied and in the bitterness of the thought that they are not better than their fathers are ready with elijah to lie down and die Tonight I wish to tell you the story of a man of whom you have never heard, whose name is not written on the scroll of fame, but of one who heard the call and forsook all and followed his ideal. When looking over the literature of malarial fevers in the South, chance threw in my way Fenner's Southern Medical Reports, Volumes 1 and 2, which were issued in 1849-50 and 1850-51 among many articles of interest i was particularly impressed with two by dr john y bassett of huntsville alabama in whom i seem to recognize a likeness to the wise below a kindred of the great of old i wrote to huntsville to ascertain what had become of dr bassett and my correspondent referred me to his daughter from whom i received a packet of letters written from paris in eighteen thirty six i have her permission to make the extracts which are here given there are a few men in every community who from temperament or conviction cannot bow to the balls of the society about them and who stand aloof in thought at least from the common herd such men tread a steep and thorny road and of such in all ages has the race delighted to make its martyrs the letters indicate in dr bassett a restless non-conforming spirit which turned aside from the hollowness and deceit of much of the life about him 
as a student he had doubtless felt a glow of enthusiasm at the rapid development of the science of medicine and amid the worries and vexations of a country practice his heart burned with the hope of some time visiting the great centres of learning as the years passed the impulse grew more and more urgent to go forth and see the great minds which had controlled his hours of study all students flocked to paris in the fourth decade nowhere else was the pool so deeply stirred and lenac brosiès louis andral velpeau and others dominated the thoughts of the profession one can imagine how carefully the plan was laid and how for years the little surplus earnings were hoarded for the purpose but the trial which demanded the greatest courage was the leaving of wife and children and there are passages in the letters which indicate that the struggle was hard not indeed without bitterness he apologizes frequently for an apparent cruelty in leaving them for the sake of his profession and the neighbors did not make it easier for the poor wife whose desertion they could not understand in one of the letters he says so people say i have left you well so i have and you ought always to put the most charitable construction on such remarks the same people when i come back will possibly say i have returned sometimes remarks of this sort are made carelessly as men tramp upon worms sometimes from wantonness as boys pull off the wings of flies and pierce them with pins sometimes for sport as hunters shoot inoffensive creatures that are of no service sometimes for spite as we kill fleas sometimes for experiment as philosophers torture dogs but seldom from wickedness as pagans skin saints and as christians skin one another and in another he says my expressions put me in mind of a sick man's repentance i know isaphrena you have borne much for and from me and you will have to do so again and i hope you may do it pleasantly and if it is any gratification to you to know you have a husband who appreciates your conduct the letters begin from baltimore in the last week of december eighteen thirty five he had lost his diploma for he applied to dr james h miller the president and professor of anatomy of the washington medical college for a certificate which is found among the papers stating that he is a regular graduate of that institution but not mentioning the year he took passage by the roscoe captain delano in command bound for liverpool he sailed on january sixth and in an interesting letter an account is given of the voyage they reached the english channel on the twenty sixth a glowing description is given of the fine way in which the passengers lived on these packet ships he entreats his wife to feel sure that all would go well though she might not hear from him very regularly and he begs her in all matters to remember his motto peace on earth and good will towards men he expresses great anxiety about the training of his two children and bids her not to spare the rod if necessary saying as the twig is bent the tree inclines the first long letter descriptive of manchester york and edinburgh is illustrated by very neat little sketches he was very much impressed with york and says that if ever i was to be born again i would like it to be at york in edinburgh he visited everything from the fifteen-story hovels to the one-story palaces he gives a description of some graves at lathe covered with iron grates and locked to keep the surgeons out with a watch kept the entire night he was enchanted with edinburgh in all matters except one he says o oh, scotland thou land o cakes o edinburgh thou city of learning thou cluster of palaces thou city with suburbs in the centre and precincts fit for the residences of princes thou modern athens whose candles seem to emulate the stars in height if not in lustre could you not invent any other method of getting your coal out of the mine save on the backs of females it is a fact that there are women whom they call bearers whose business it is to carry coal out of the pit 
he was very enthusiastic about the museum of the college of surgeons and the infirmary where he witnessed in the presence of mr sim an operation by mr ferguson a young surgeon from edinburgh he proceeded to glasgow then to belfast and dublin then on to london where he spent two weeks apparently of great misery as the weather was atrocious he shook the mud of england from his feet at dover and departed hoping never to be soiled with it again he took a through passage from london to paris for one pound eighteen shillings and he gives an amusing description of the additional payments he asked the master of the hotel to give him some information regarding french travelling and got he says a regular english account johnsonian without his wit they will cheat you at every step they will rob you they will poison you with dirt everything is filthy you will get no mutton or beef and nothing but sour wine and then he says though i paid everything in london i will give you a list of the little extra charges on the road and in eight out of ten cases paid he gives an itemized bill of twenty-eight extra charges in the two days and one night which he spent in the diligence one of his items was for walking down a ladder one shilling he told this fellow to go to hell and jumped over his ladder to the commissioner of one of the hotels for seeing that nobody cheated you but himself six shillings the commissioner of the diligence the most useless of all damned rascals for pestering you and telling lies one shilling and sixpence he reached paris and took lodgings in the place pantheon he writes i am now in the very region of voltaire and rousseau and the pantheon in which one set of bigots deposited their bodies from whence another set tore their bones raises its classic front before my window i look on it and i feel i am not so much of an infidel as when surrounded by christians he attached himself at once to the clinic of velpo at la charite on his first day he says he did not understand more than half he said but he understood his operations he says there was a gentleman from mobile mr jewett who had been there for three years americans were not scarce there were four or five from new york two from baltimore and several from boston and philadelphia he did not mention their names but it is pleasant to think he may have attended classes at la pitie with bowditch holmes shaddock gerard and stillet he began dissections at once subjects were cheap six francs apiece and he secured a child on the first day for forty sous some of the lectures were in the evening at seven o'clock and he went to hear monsieur helmagand on midwifery he says the hospitals here are conducted on the most liberal terms there is nothing to pay but for the private courses and the fee is small for them the facilities for the study of midwifery are astonishing there are plenty of cases always on hand and this i determined to profit by in a letter of march sixteen he mentions his daily routine i get up in the morning at six o'clock and am at la charite by seven follow velpo until eight see him operate and lecture until after nine breakfast at ten at a cafe at eleven i am at a school of practical anatomy where i dissect until two then i attend a class of practical surgery until three then hear brousset and andral until five then dine at seven i attend helmagrand's class of midwifery which lasts until nine then i come to my room and read or write until eleven when i retire he was much impressed by the opportunities for dissection in his letter of july three he says there is a dissecting school at clamart for the summer on a most extensive scale there is room and material for two hundred or upwards though there are but few there at present this place was provided for the inscribed students of the school and they get their subjects for a mere trifle there is not the least prejudice existing here against dissections even the subjects do not seem to mind it though they are aware of their fate for more than two-thirds of the dead are carried to the l'ecole pratique or clamart 
i have private instruction in the use of the stethoscope for heart complaints and la pitié the other day an old woman bade me adieu as we passed her bed without calling and i stopped to ask if she was going out then she said she was going to clamart and that we might meet again he had evidently occupied his time to good advantage as early in july he received from velpeau the appointment of externe at la charite he says in his letter of july ten i have a piece of news to communicate that i know will gratify you at least i feel very much gratified myself this morning i received the appointment of externe at la charite under velpeau the duties of an externe require him to be at the hospital at six o'clock answer to his name follow the surgeon round a certain number of beds attend to his prescriptions and dress the patients for this service we receive nothing and for this privilege we pay nothing you ought to be gratified at this because it will convince you i have not been wasting my time i was on the eve of starting for switzerland and was only waiting to witness the celebrations on the twenty seventh twenty eighth and twenty ninth but when this offer was made me i did what i have been doing all my life made another sacrifice for my profession and determined to remain and take the service i have not been more gratified since i have been in europe it is a real benefit and came unsolicited he was very much impressed by the incessant industry of the french physicians he says when i look at some of the medical men by whom i am surrounded it makes me blush for shame old men daily may be seen mixing their white locks with boys and pursuing their profession with the ardour of youth there is not a solitary great man in france that is idle for if he was that moment he would be outstripped it is a race and there are none so far ahead that they are not pressed by others many are distant it is true but there are none allowed to walk over the course witness brousset lecturing and laboring daily to sustain himself after having elevated himself to the pinnacle lefranc an old bachelor with thousands who after making his daily visit and leçon for ten months for duty during the vacation of two months gives from choice a course of operations and old rollier may be seen daily supporting himself from bedpost to bedpost as jolly as if he were not far over sixty Verpeau, from a poor boy without money time education or friends has by industry made himself one of the first surgeons in europe in one of his last letters there is this interesting note about brousset who had just finished his course on phrenology the pupils of thirty-six have struck off his head it is in bronze a little less than our old washington and franklin in wax brousset is a genius and when he entered life he saw that something was to be done or rather that he must do something and he sees the science of medicine as a good old doctor would a bottle of lotion and shook it manfully france germany all europe parts of asia and america have felt the agitation but younger men also feel the necessity of doing something and they are now endeavouring to quiet the commotion he has raised and in france they have measurably succeeded when the giant dies i doubt if he will find a successor his conquests like alexander's will be divided and then fall into insignificance he fights well while in the ring against awful odds for the truth is against him but some of her brightest geniuses he has put to rout or silence time is now about to enter the field and i have no doubt will place a splendid monument over him to prevent him from being forgotten i am glad i know what great men are i am glad i know of what they are made and how they made themselves great though this knowledge has broken the last of my household gods yet it has taken away the flaming swords that stood before the gates of this paradise where may still be seen the track of the serpent and of the devil himself so i will keep out of bad company 
Scattered through his long, often closely crossed letters, there are here and there some choice bits which indicate the character of the man. For months he did not hear a word from home, then letters came at long intervals. He apparently had been rereading some of his wife's letters, in one of which she had been reproaching him for using strong language. He says, Isafina, you tell me to break myself of swearing and not to spend my time about different professions of religion, that it will make enemies and so forth. Now listen to me while I speak the truth, for on this subject you know that I always do speak what I think is true. I never did swear much, and I have quit it almost entirely, for nobody would understand me, and it would be useless to waste breath when I know I can put it to better use. As to religion, there is not much here of any kind, and I assure you I have not said ten words on the subject since I left nor do I expect to. And here, where Voltaire, Rousseau, and the whole constellation of mighty-minded men lived and wrote and died, I feel, Isophania, not so much an infidel as when at home, surrounded by church-going people. Why is this? I have never for a moment doubted the sincerity of my immediate friends, but at home I looked into the evil more closely than the good effects. There I saw ignorance, bigotry, and deceit ever foremost. They were the most prominent, therefore the most likely to be seen. Here I still look on the evil side and find it terrible. God save me from a country without religion and from a government with it. I know you will say amen also to the next sentence, and return me safe to a country with religion and a government without it. I am convinced that the evils of infidelity are worse, aye, much worse, than any religion whatever. Had I the talents of the above-mentioned men, I would not spend it as they did, nor would they, could they see the effect produced. Their object was good, to correct the evils of a corrupt priesthood, but their works were like edged tools given to children. Human nature is not perfect and their refined and perfected systems of morals will not apply, and if we were perfect we would not need them. I speak the words of truth and soberness. He evidently was of St. Paul's opinion with reference to the subjection of the wife. He says in one place, What if I have spoken cross to you, scolded at you? If it was not my duty, it was at least my privilege, and I expect to have the pleasure of doing it again. Are we not told, if our right hand offends, to cut it off, etc.? Then surely, if our better half offends, we ought to have the liberty of swearing a little. His last letter is from Paris, dated October 16, and he speaks in it of his approaching departure. I have no information as to the date of his return, but his intention was, he states frequently in his letters, to be back by the first of the year, so that after this date he probably resumed practice at Huntsville. The two papers in Fenner's Southern Medical Reports are the only ones I see credited to him. They are charmingly written, and display in every page the wise physician wise not only with the wisdom of the schools, but with the deeper knowledge of the even-balanced soul who saw life steadily and saw it whole. The report in Volume One deals with the topography, climate, and diseases of Madison County. Dr. Finner states that it was accompanied by a beautiful map drawn by the author and a large number of valuable statistics. In an historical sketch of the settlement, he thus depicts the early border life. The most of those who did not procure homes at that time belonged to a class who, from taste or compulsion, had separated themselves from the whites to live on the trail of the Indians, and who, like tigers and judases, were not without their use in the mysterious economy of nature. They surpassed the natives in physical force and in genius, and equaled them in ferocity. They had the piratical appetite for gain natural to the English race, which they had cultivated among the whites, and they readily acquired the Indian taste for blood. 
thus without any particular standard of morals of their own and having fallen out with that which restrained their christian brethren they found their interest in adopting the ancient one of moses and of the savages among whom they resided an eye for an eye and blood for blood these men like the fabulous behemoth that lay in the reedy fens of the early world drinking up the abundant waters and eating down the luxuriant forests to make way for civilization have left little more than a vague tradition of their existence and exploits the latter of which has been so embellished that the former already begins to be doubted such a race leave but short records of their diseases where bloodshed is always epidemic and every man his own surgeon the few that recover feel grateful to none and hang no votive tablets on the natural columns of their forests and when a missionary or a novelist is the only historian it would puzzle hippocrates himself to collate the cases but as most things as well as lions track the earth in some manner as they pass over it these early squatters have also made their mark. The good example of Dr. Thomas Fern, who in the early days of the regular settlement was the leader of the profession, is well described. The influence of this gentleman's reputation upon the profession was favorable to the residents of thoroughbred physicians in the neighborhood, many of whom he had been directly instrumental in educating. Another consequence followed quackery and empiricism abated although quackery is indigenous in the human heart like thieving and lying and always will exist yet it flourishes in the indirect ratio of the science and general qualifications of the regular part of the profession when regular and extensively patronized physicians armed with all requisite diplomas and the experience of years suffer themselves to grow so dull in diagnosis as to bleed a typhoid patient half an hour before death in the evening that they had been stimulating through the day or so far forget or compromise the dignity of their high calling as to practice mesmerism or prescribed mother's relief to a parturient woman men of smaller pretensions and more professional pride or better information should not and do not wonder at quackery springing up around such like mushrooms in a spring morning where a fat cow has lain overnight and warmed the soil for their reception dr fern is credited with the practice of giving enormous doses of quinine in the malarial fevers dr bassett mentions five or six cases of night blindness caused by these large doses very full accounts are given of epidemics of scarlet fever and of smallpox and a discussion on the cold water treatment of the former disease dr bassett must have had a well-equipped library and his references to authors both old and new are not only very full but most appropriate in the spring of 1833 we were visited by the scarlet fever in its most malignant form. During the prevalence of this epidemic, more than fifty infants perished in Huntsville. At the only age, they are not an annoyance here. I treated nine bad cases and four terminated fatally. I lost nearly half in almost every instance. An older practitioner was called in, but I am not certain that in their own proper practice they were more fortunate. In more than one instance there lay more than one dead child in the same house at the same time. I feel certain that this was a most malignant disease, but I do not feel certain that in every case our best physicians remembered the united counsel of Hippocrates and Ovid that nothing does good but what may also hurt and which should never be lost sight of by the men of medicine. The following is an extract from the account of the smallpox epidemic of 1835. My treatment was pretty much that laid down by Dr. Mead. Bleeding, gentle aperients, cool air, sub-acid drinks, mild anodynes, and vitriolic infusion of barks. 
although the purgative part of this treatment embroiled the faculty of the early part of the eighteenth century to such a degree that the like has not been heard since the days of Gui Patin and antimony shaking the authority even of the celebrated triumvirate meade friend and radcliffe who on their part embalmed one dr woodward in their gall and handed him down to posterity like a dried preparation as a specimen of the folly of small men who attempt to run against the throne opinions of the world and a proof that polite literature does not always polish its possessors yet we of huntsville were too willing that our brethren should have our cases to question each other's practice dr bassett states that among the thirty thousand inhabitants of the county thirty physicians practiced who were paid about thirty thousand dollars a year which he says is but bread and scarce at that and when we contemplate the fifty pounds calomel and a thousand ounces quinine which they swallow it reminds one of falstaff's bill of fare but one halfpenny worth of bread to this intolerable deal of sack there is a very clever discussion on the question much debated at that time of the use of anaesthetics in labor the following is a good extract it is truly humiliating to science to have to stop and rest upon her course until the dullness of the clergy can frame an excuse for an obvious truth to see such a man as dr simpson of edinburgh stopping in the midst of his labor to chop logic by the wayside like a monk of the fifteenth century to endeavor to prove a truth at midday by argument which he had proven by practice in the morning and thereby running at least a risk of losing by night what he had earned through the day let us examine in plain english his new translation of the hebrew authority for the use of chloroform and see if in getting one dent out of his turtle's egg he does not put another in Two at the head of the article by dr bassett in the second volume of finner's reports stands the quotation celsus thought it better in doubtful cases to try a doubtful remedy than none at all which he quotes only to condemn in the following vigorous style in giving my individual experience and opinions i desire to censor none in such cases the best informed fear the most and experience but renders us charitable i will therefore only say that i have been fortunate in my own practice in reversing the aphorism at the head of this article that rule of practice has found favor in the eyes of every generation of both doctors and patients and it is not wonderful that the few able men of every age that have opposed it have warred in vain that the science of french expectancy and the quackery of german homeopathy have alike failed dying men will have pills and parsons when physicians were required by public opinion to follow the dictates of hippocrates and his immediate successors as closely as christians now profess to follow the commandments of moses and the prophets they claimed a right to act boldly their faith in these authorities and public opinion sustained them and however difficult the task they found it much easier to understand the written language of hippocrates than the yet more obscure teachings of nature between which and his followers he stood an infallible interpreter making her mystery so plain that wayfaring men though fools could not err therein hippocrates was but our fellow-servant and we are but ministers of nature our whole art consists in understanding her language and laws our whole practice in obeying her mandates if we do not understand them it is either our fault or misfortune to act as though we did is quackery celsus says of this bold practice of old fera quos ratio non restituit temeratus adjuivat but shrewdly remarks that physicians of this sort die at other men's patients more happily than their own 
i doubt however if in the present state of medicine a thorough physician is ever in any stage of any disease so completely without rational education as to be thus nonplussed and driven to the necessity of dealing a blow in the dark where there are no intelligible indications it is clear there should be no action then if i have not followed the advice of this master it has not been lightly laid aside nor as i have stated without precedent and if i have in a measure adopted another of his rules to make food physic optimum vero medicamentum est zibus status it has not been upon his mere authority i revere authority believing with the royal preacher that whoso breaketh a hedge a serpent shall bite yet i rejoice that its fetters are broken in medicine that we no longer are hedged with the eternal cry of hippocrates and reason but if in getting rid of the authority of the ancients we have discarded the example of their labor and learning and turned a deaf ear to their opinions it is easier to be lamented than corrected if the unthinking part of the profession of old that followed authority and on the first day of a fever loosened the belly on the next opened a vein on the third gave a bolus etc are now represented by those who follow fashion and give calomel quinine and cod liver oil every day we have but changed authority for fashion and are yet in bondage but fashion though indomitable changes with the wind and if for a time it carries the small craft the weak or designing in its current it soon leaves them stranded as landmarks at which we can at least laugh without fear of professional martyrdom rarely has the credo of a zealous physician been more beautifully expressed than in the following words i do not say that the study of nature human and comparative as far as it relates to medicine is an easy task let any one undertake a foreign language and when he thinks he has mastered it let him go into its native country and attempt to use it among the polite and well-informed if he succeed let him go among the illiterate and rude where slang is current into the lunatic asylum where the vernacular is babbled in broken sentences through the mouth of an idiot and attempt to understand this should he again succeed he may safely say that he knows that language let him then set down and calculate the cost in labor time and talent then square this amount and go boldly into the study of physiology and when he has exhausted his program he will find himself humbly knocking at the door of the temple and it will be opened for diligence like the vinegar of hannibal will make a way through frozen alps it is the open sesame of our profession when he is satisfied with the beautiful proportions of the interior its vast and varied dimensions the intricate and astounding action of its machinery obeying laws of a singular stability whose very conflict produces harmony under the government of secondary laws if there be anything secondary in nature when he is satisfied and such are not satisfied until informed he will be led to his ultimate object to take his last lessons from the poor and suffering the fevered and frenzied from the jobs and lazaruses into the pest-houses and prisons and here in these magazines of misery and contagion these babels of disease and sin he must not only take up his abode but following the example of his divine master he must love to dwell there this is pathology when such an one re-enters the world he is a physician his vast labors have not only taught him how little he knows but that he knows this little well conscious of this virtue he feels no necessity of trumpeting his professional acquirements abroad but with becoming modesty and true dignity which constitute genuine professional pride he leaves this to the good sense of his fellow-citizens to discover dr bassett developed tuberculosis and the last letter in the budget sent to me was dated 
April 16, 1851, from Florida, whither he had gone in search of health. He died November 2nd of the same year, aged 46. To a friend he writes on the date of April 5th, This world has never occupied a very large share of my attention or love. I have asked but little of it, and got but little of what I asked. It has for many years been growing less and less in my view, like a receding object in space, but no better land has appeared to my longing vision. What lies behind me has become insignificant, before me is a vast interminable void, but not a cheerless one, as it is full of pleasant dreams and visions and glorious hopes. I have covered it with the landscapes of Claude, and peopled it with the martyrs of science, the pioneers of truth, the hound-hunted and crucified of this world that have earned and then asked for bread and received a serpent, all who have suffered for the truth. How glorious it is to contemplate in the future these time buffeted at rest, with their lacerated feelings soothed as mine have been this day by the tender regard your wife has manifested for my future well-being. The saddest lament in Oliver Wendell Holmes's poems is for the voiceless, for those who never sing but die with all their music in them. The extracts which I have read show Dr. Bassett to have been a man of more than ordinary gifts, but he was among the voiceless of the profession. Nowadays, environment, the opportunity for work, the skirts of happy chance, carry men to the summit. To those restless spirits who have had ambition without opportunities and ideals not realizable in the world in which they move, the story of his life may be a solace. I began by saying that I would tell you of a man of whom you had never heard, of a humble student from a little town in Alabama. What of the men whom he revered, and for whom, in 1836, he left wife and children? Are they better known to us? Today scarcely one of those whom he mentions touches us with any firmness from the past. Of a majority of them, it may be said, they are as though they had not been. Felpeau, Andral, Brousset, the great teachers whom Bassett followed, are shadowy forms, almost as indistinct as the pupil, dragged out to the daylight by some laudator temporis acti who would learn philosophy in history. To have striven, to have made an effort, to have been true to certain ideals, this alone is worth the struggle." Now and again, in a generation, one or two snatch something from dull oblivion, but for the rest of us, sixty years, we too are with Bassett and his teachers, and no one asks who or what we have been, more than he asks what waves, in the moonlit solitudes mild of the midmost ocean, have swelled, foamed for a moment, and gone. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2. Thomas Dover, Physician and Buccaneer As Sir Thomas Brown remarks in the Hydriotaphia, the iniquity of oblivion blindly scattereth her poppy and deals with the memory of men without distinction to merit of perpetuity. Thus it happens that Thomas Dover, the doctor, has drifted into our modern life on a powder label, to which way of entering the company of posterity, though sanctioned by Mithridates, many would prefer oblivion, even to continuous immortality, on a powder so potent and palatable as the pulvis epicanine compositus. While Thomas Dover, the buccaneer, third in command, one of the principal owners and president of the Council of the Duke and Duchess, privateers of the ancient and honorable city of Bristol, discoverer of Alexander Selkirk, the original Robinson Crusoe, in spite of more enduring claims on our gratitude, has been forgotten. Of the facts of Dover's life very little is known. 
monk roll of the royal college of physicians volume two states that he was born in warwickshire about sixteen sixty that he was a bachelor of medicine of cambridge on the authority of the author of the athenae cantabrigines but that his name does not occur on the roll of the graduates after taking his degree he settled in bristol and having made money joined with some merchants in a privateering expedition on dover's return to england he resumed practice at bristol and from the number of patients he says he visited each day during an epidemic of the fever he must have obtained the confidence of the inhabitants of the city in seventeen twenty one he settled in london and was admitted a licentiate of the royal college of physicians he resided in cecil street strand but in the latter part of seventeen twenty eight he removed to gloucestershire where he lived for four or five years finally he settled in london at first in lombard street and afterwards in arundel street strand where he died probably in the latter part of seventeen forty one or the beginning of seventeen forty two essentially the same details are given by dr norman moore in the dictionary of national biography in his work the ancient physician's legacy he often speaks with veneration of sydenham as his master and in his description of the smallpox he says whilst i lived with dr sydenham so that he was probably a house pupil of the great physician who was at the height of his fame at the very time we may suppose dover to have been a student of medicine on the title page of the first edition of the legacy seventeen thirty two he speaks of forty-nine years of practice so that he probably took his degree in sixteen eighty three apparently he never proceeded to a doctor's degree since he speaks of himself as a poor bachelor of physic on the title page of the first edition however the letters m d occur after his name we know really nothing of dover's life until he appears as one of the promoters of a privateering expedition to the south seas in seventeen o eight in this he was associated with a group of bristol merchants among whom were alderman bachelor and sir john hawkins two ships the duke and the duchess were fitted out with great care dover went as third in command being styled captain dover and as owner of a very considerable share of both vessels he was president of the council and had a double voice in the deliberations the days of the buccaneers were almost numbered but there was in bristol at this time one of the last and one of the most famous of the old south sea captains william damper a man who knew more of the spanish main and of the pacific than any one living he had returned recently from a disastrous voyage and agreed to accompany captain woods rogers as pilot of the expedition in october seventeen o eight the ships sailed against the spaniard with his hoard of plate and gold which he wrung with cruel torture from the indian folk of old in which words charles kingley well expresses the feelings which animated these highwaymen of the sea the narrative of the voyage is told by captain woods rogers in a cruising voyage around the world seventeen o eight seventeen eleven london seventeen twelve the expedition was rendered memorable by the discovery of robinson crusoe which is thus told in the words of captain rogers we arrived at the island of juan fernandez on the first of february seventeen ten and having a good observation the day before when we found our latitude thirty four degrees ten seconds south in the afternoon we hoisted out our pennant in which captain dover set off to go on shore though not less than four leagues from the ship as it grew dark we observed a light on shore which some were of the opinion was from our boat but it was evidently too large for that and we hung up a light to direct our boat firing our quarter gun and showing lights in our mizzen and fore shrouds that our boat might find us as we had fallen to leeward of the island 
our boat came aboard again about two in the morning having turned back on seeing the light ashore when within a league and we were glad they had got off so well as it now began to blow we were all convinced that the light which we had seen was from the shore and therefore prepared our ships for an engagement supposing it might proceed from some french ships at anchor which we must either fight or want water all this stir and apprehension as we afterwards found arose from one poor man who passed in our imagination for a spanish garrison a body of frenchmen or a crew of pirates and it is incredible what strange notions some of our people entertained about this light yet it served to show their tempers and spirits and enabled us to guess how our men would behave in case there really were enemies in the island while under these apprehensions we stood to the back of the island in order to fall in with the southerly wind till we were past the island then we stood back for it again and ran close aboard the land that begins to form its northeast side the flaws came heavily off the land and we were forced to reef our topsails when we opened the middle bay where we expected to find our enemy but all was clear and no ships either there or in the other bay near the northeast end these are the only bays in which ships can ride that come here for refreshments the middle one being the best we now conjectured that there had been ships here but that they had gone away on seeing us about noon of the second of february we sent our yawl on shore in which was captain dover mr fry and six men all armed and in the meantime we and the duchess kept turning in and such heavy squalls came off the land that we had to let fly our topsail sheets keeping all hands to stand by our sails lest the winds should blow them away these flaws proceeded from the land which is very high in the middle of the island but when they passed by we had little or no wind as our yawl did not return we sent the pennants well armed to see what had occasioned the yawl to stay being afraid there might be a spanish garrison on the island who might have seized her and our men even the pennants delayed returning on which we put up the signal for her to come back when she soon came off with abundance of crayfish bringing also a man clothed in goatskins who seemed wilder than the original owners of his apparel his name was alexander selkirk a scotsman who had been left here by captain stradling of the st ports and had lived alone on the island for four years and four months captain dampier told me he had been master of the cinq ports and was the best man in that vessel so i immediately agreed with him to serve as a mate on the duke during his stay he had seen several ships pass by but only two came to anchor at the island which he found to be spanish and therefore retired from them on which they fired at him but he escaped into the woods had they been french he would have surrendered to them but chose rather to run the risk of dying alone on the island than fall into the hands of the spaniards as he suspected they would either put him to death or make him a slave in their minds the spaniards had landed before he knew what they were and came so near him that he had much ado to escape for they not only shot at him but pursued him into the woods where he climbed up a tree at the foot of which some of them made water and killed several goats yet went away without discovering him he told us he was born in largo in the county of fife scotland and was bred a sailor from his youth the reason of his being left there was a difference with captain stradling which together with the ship being leaky made him at first rather willing to stay here than to continue in the ship and when at last he was inclined to have gone the captain would not receive him he had been at the island before to wood and water when two of the men were left upon it for six months the ship being chased away by two french south sea ships but the cinq port returned and took them off at which time he was left footnote 
selkirk had been sailing master under captain dampier in his expedition which left in may seventeen o three and had been put ashore on the island at his own request dampier's expedition was unsuccessful and the merchants were so sensible of his want of conduct that they resolved never to trust him any more with a command End footnote he had with him his clothes and bedding with a firelock and some powder and bullets some tobacco a knife a kettle a bible and some other books and his mathematical instruments he diverted himself and provided for his sustenance as well as he could but had much ado to bear up against melancholy for the first eight months and was sore distressed at being left alone in such a desolate place he built himself two huts of pimento trees thatched with long grass and lined with goat skins killing goats as he needed them with his gun so long as his powder lasted which was only about a pound at first when all this was spent he procured fire by rubbing two sticks of pimento wood together he slept in his larger hut and cooked his victuals in the smaller which was at some distance and employed himself in reading praying and singing psalms so that he said he was a better christian during his solitude than he had ever been before and then as he was afraid he would ever be again at first he never ate but when restrained by hunger partly from grief and partly from want of bread and salt neither did he then go to bed till he could watch no longer the pimento wood serving him both for fire and candle as it burned very clear and refreshed him by its fragrant smell he might have had fish enough but would not eat them for want of salt as they occasioned a looseness except crayfish which are as large as lobsters and are very good these he sometimes boiled and at other times broiled as he did his goat's flesh of which he made good broth for they are not so rank as our goats having kept an account he said he had killed five hundred goats while on the island besides having caught as many more which he marked on the ear and let them go when his powder failed he ran down the goats by speed of foot for his mode of living with continual exercise of walking and running cleared him of all gross humours so that he could run with wonderful swiftness through the woods and up the hills and rocks as we experienced in catching goats for us we had a bulldog which we sent along with several of our nimblest runners to help in catching the goats but he outstripped our dog and men caught the goats and brought them to us on his back on one occasion his agility in pursuing a goat nearly cost him his life as while pursuing it with great eagerness he caught hold of it on the brink of a precipice of which he was not aware being concealed by bushes so that he fell with the goat down the precipice to a great depth and was so bruised and stunned by the fall that he lay senseless as he supposed for twenty-four hours and when he recovered his senses found the goat dead under him he was then scarcely able to crawl to his hut about a mile distance and could not stir out again for ten days he came at length to relish his meat well enough without bread and salt in the proper season he had plenty of good turnips which had been sowed there by captain dampier's men and had now spread over several acres of ground he had also abundance of cabbage from the cabbage palms and seasoned his food with the fruit of the pimento which is the same with jamaica pepper and has a fine flavor he found also a species of black pepper called malegeta which was good for expelling wind and curing gripes he soon wore out his shoes and other clothes by running in the woods and being forced to shift without them his feet became so hard that he ran about everywhere without inconvenience and it was some time after he came to us before he could wear shoes as his feet swelled when he first began to wear them after he had got better of his melancholy he sometimes amused himself with carving his name on the trees together with the date of his being there and the time of his solitary residence 
At first he was much distressed with cats and rats which had bred there in great numbers from some of each species which had got on shore from ships that had wooded and watered at the island. The rats gnawed his feet and clothes when he was asleep, which obliged him to cherish the cats by feeding them with goat's flesh, so that many of them became so tame that they used to lie beside him in hundreds, and soon delivered him from the rats. He also tamed some kids, and for his diversion would at times sing and dance with them and his cats, so that by the favor of Providence and the vigor of his youth, for he was now only thirty years of age, he came at length to conquer all the inconveniences of his solitude, and to be quite easy in his mind. When his clothes were worn out, he made himself a coat and a cap of goatskin, which he stitched together with thongs of the same cut out with his knife. Subsequently, the expedition sacked the two cities of Guayaquil, in the assault on which Dover led the van. They took several prizes and cruised about the coast from Peru to California, waiting for treasure ships. Of one of the largest prizes, which they named the Bachelor, after the Bristol alderman, doubtless, Dover took command as chief captain. They then sailed across the Pacific to Batavia, where they refitted, and in October 1710 sailed for England, which was reached in 1711. Captain Thomas Dover returned from the South Seas a wealthy man. The expedition had been unusually successful, having realized the enormous sum of a hundred and seventy thousand pounds. To Dover, who is stated to have been the owner of a very considerable part of both ships, fell a considerable share of the spoils. Alexander Selkirk, as mate, received eight hundred pounds prize money harris voyages and so forth makes the following comments on the voyage it has been universally allowed by such as are proper judges of such expeditions that there never was any voyage of this nature so happily adjusted so well provided in all respects or in which the accidents that usually happen in privateers were so effectually guarded against this he attributes to the abilities of the gentlemen of bristol and remarks that it was owing to this expedition that the spirit of privateering in the south seas was not totally lost in england the large sums realized had evidently made an enduring impression and harris adds i might perhaps go too far should i assert that this voyage gave rise to the south sea company but this much i can safely say that the success of this voyage was what the patrons of that company chiefly insisted upon in their defence when the plan of it was attacked as insufficient and chimerical in seventeen twelve dover must have been fifty years of age and quite ready to enjoy a period of leisure where he settled or what he did we do not know but it is certain that three years such as he had spent at sea were no preparation for practice possibly he travelled and in the introduction to the ancient physician's legacy he scoffs at the doctors who have travelled far at home let them take a trip to hungary and see the mines speaking and describing scenes as though he had been there himself he refers not infrequently to his wide knowledge of the globe, and in one place says, If traveling be necessary to make an accomplished physician, I am very sure that I have traveled more than all the physicians of Great Britain put together. In 1721, as mentioned by Monk, he was admitted licentiate of the Royal College of Physicians, a qualification which enabled a man at that time to practice in and six miles around Westminster. It is doubtful how long he remained at this time in London. At any rate, he states, APL, that he lived in Gloucestershire in the years 1728 and 1729. None of the cases which he mentioned in his books are of this period his permanent settlement dates from about seventeen thirty one in a seventeen thirty three edition of the a p l in replying to certain strictures on the use of quicksilver he says 
I challenge you to show when I have lost three patients for the past five years, when I was first called either in acute or chronic cases, though I have settled in town about eighteen months. At this time Dover was well on in years, about or above seventy, a late age at which to begin practice in London. To abet his laudable endeavors he resorted to the time-honored plan of writing a book. Of the popular or semi-popular treatises on medical subjects so common in those days, a few were by very able men. George Cheney's essay on health and long life forms an exception to Latham's sweeping criticism on books of this class, quoted by W. A. Greenhill. They are all bad and many dishonest. A favorite plan was to write a treatise on some mineral water, lauding the virtues of a particular spa. Smollett, who knew so well the trials, vexations, and disappointments incident to beginning medical life in London, has sketched in strong lines the condition of the profession in the fourth and fifth decades of the century. He, too, had made an unsuccessful attempt to introduce himself in an essay on the external use of cold water and so forth. Dr. L. N., with his hotchpotch of erudition and extravagance, and the pedantic doctor in Peregrine Pickle, in whom he satirized the learned Dr. Akenside, were well-known types. While in Dr. Fathom, the mystery of the sons of Paean, as he terms them, is mercilessly exposed. Among the means used to force a trade, Smollett mentions the insertion of cures by way of news in the daily papers, the erection of a hospital, lock, or infirmary by the voluntary subscription of his friends, a scheme which had succeeded to a miracle with many of the profession who had raised themselves into notice on the carcasses of the poor to understand dover's relations with the apothecaries to which subsequent reference will be made the reader must know that they were the general practitioners of that day and dispensed their own medicines but in serious cases always called in a physician or a surgeon Smollett's account of the practice parceled out into small enclosures occupied by different groups of personages who tossed the ball, the patient, from one to another, would almost fit modern usage in which a patient is sometimes tossed in a circle from specialist to specialist until he returns with an inventory of his local woes to the consultant from whom he started. In Smollett's days, the patient had to be content with three, except in the cases requiring a midwife. The apothecary, being summoned, finds her ladyship in such a delicate situation that he declines prescribing, and advises her to send for a physician without delay. The nomination, of course, falls to him, and the doctor being called declares the necessity of immediate venesection, which is accordingly performed by the surgeon of the association. While meriting the general criticism of Latham, the work with which Dover trusted to each practice had many important qualifications for success. It appealed directly to the public in a taking way, not only in the main title, the ancient physician's legacy to his country, being what he has collected himself in forty-nine years of practice, but in asserting that the diseases incident to mankind are described in so plain a manner that any person may know the nature of his own diseases, together with the several remedies for each distemper faithfully set down. It is expressly issued as a popular work on medicine, designed for the use of all private families. The author's name is given, Thomas Dover, M.D., and the work was printed for the author and sold by A. Bellsworth and C. Hitch in Paternoster Row, and so forth, giving the names of two other booksellers, 1732, price stitched, five shillings. This is the title page, date, and so forth of the first edition, a copy of which is in the British Museum. In the Dictionary of National Biography, the date of the first edition is given as 1733. The mistake is due to the fact that in this year appeared an edition of the legacy not stated on the title page to be a second edition. 
this is the earliest copy in the library of the royal medical and chirurgical society and in the radcliffe library the name is spelt dovar and the title page is different forty-nine years of practice are still claimed not fifty and it is stated that the extraordinary effects of mercury are more particularly considered after the author's name thomas dovar m d are the words with remarks on the whole by a learned physician there is also a translation of a treatise on mercury by the learned belost it was printed for the relict of the late r bradley f r s the second and third editions i have not seen this was probably one of them the fourth and fifth editions also appeared in seventeen thirty three the sixth in seventeen forty two the seventh in seventeen sixty two and the eighth the last so far as i know in seventeen seventy one the ancient physician's legacy in the language of one of dover's correspondents made a great noise in london and was the subject of almost every coffee-house it contains a description in plain language of about forty-two disorders illustrated by cases the majority of which are in some way made to attest the author's skill the later editions abound in letters from grateful patients extolling his virtues the pictures of disease are scarcely such as might have been expected from a pupil of sydenham the account of consumption or phthisis as he spells it is very meagre being as it is from the hand of a contemporary possibly a friend of the author of the physiologia there are evidences throughout that the book was written for revenue purposes only and the spirit of the buccaneer was not dead in the old man as no occasion is missed either to blow his own trumpet or to tilt a lance at his colleagues let me but come to people as early in this distemper dropsy as they generally apply for relief from other physicians and it shall be cured and so forth on page eighteen in the section on gout is given the formula of his famous powder take opium one ounce saltpetre and tartar vitriolated each four ounces ipocacania one ounce put the saltpetre and tartar into a red-hot mortar stirring them with a spoon until they have done flaming then powder them very fine after that slice in your opium grind them to a powder and then mix the other powders with these dose from forty to sixty or seventy grains in a glass of white wine posset going to bed covering up warm and drinking a quart or three pints of the posset drink while sweating the same formula is repeated in all the additions he says that some apothecaries have desired their patients to make their wills and settle their affairs before they venture upon so large a dose as from forty to seventy grains as monstrous as they may represent this i can produce undeniable proofs where a patient of mine has taken no less a quantity than an hundred grains and yet has appeared abroad the next day in the treatment of fevers he follows the practice of the good dr sydenham for whose memory he professes the greatest veneration in this distemper as in all other fevers i prescribe the cool regimen which must be followed in case mankind prefer life to death ease to pain a short fit of illness to a long and tedious one a good to a broken and shattered constitution laying aside blisters and all heating and poisonous powders in another place he says i would have cold bathing grow as universal as inoculation he whacked as furious against the unhuman method of blistering and invokes the authority of radcliffe and the honest dr sydenham against it when living with dr sydenham dover had smallpox in the beginning he lost twenty-two ounces of blood and had a vomit he went abroad until he was blind and then took to bed i had no fire allowed in my room my windows were constantly open my bedclothes were ordered to be laid no higher than my waist 
he made me take twelve bottles of small beer acidulated with spirit of vitriol every twenty-four hours the experiences of his travels are referred to frequently and he mentions asia the east and west indies and hungary in connection with special points of practice there is an account of the plague among the sailors of the duke and duchess when i took by storm the two cities of guayaquil under the line in the south seas the ancient physician's chief legacy to his country was quicksilver which was his specific in almost every disease and the use of which is vaunted in a most forcible manner in letters from patients he ordered an ounce or an ounce and a quarter of crude mercury daily believing that it freed the patient from all vermicular diseases opened all obstructions and made a pure balsam of the blood a captain harry coit who had lived by the doctor's direction on ass's milk syrup of snails and such stuff took for his cough and shortness of breath an ounce a day and took altogether an hundred and twenty pounds weight dover says that he was called in derision the quicksilver doctor the legacy stirred up an active pamphlet war and for twenty years or more the merits of crude mercury were much discussed if dover's object in writing the work was to gain publicity he could not have taken a better way than in his sharp comments on the physicians and apothecaries the latter he assaults in terms which must have tickled the frequenters of the coffee-houses among whom we are told the book made such a noise i never affronted any apothecary except in ordering too little physic and curing a patient too soon is in their way of thinking an unpardonable crime i must confess i never could bring an apothecary's bill to three pounds in a fever whereas i have known some of their bills in this disease amount to forty fifty and sixty pounds if they can't cure with less charges i can't forbear saying that i have the same opinion of their integrity as i have of their understanding the doctrine of the apothecary was that tis your writing physician only who has a title to a fee dover takes strong and most reasonable ground against the constant varying of prescriptions when there is no occasion for it the hostility of the apothecaries to him according to his own account arose from his being always inviolably attached to the interest and welfare of my patient and entirely regardless of these gentlemen's unwarrantable gains these attacks did not pass unnoticed and in seventeen thirty three h bradley surgeon criticizes the ancient physician's legacy and makes some animadversions on his scurrilous treatment of the professors of physics in general and with a word or two on the uselessness of his legacy to all private families daniel turner of the college of physicians who in the same year impartially surveys the ancient physician's legacy refers to the guayaquil incident in the following terms i think the doctor had much better have left out his bravado of having taken two cities by storm unless he thinks it an honour to a physician to kill and slay and after to plunder the innocent those who never wronged him and to carry off the spoil a good prelude this to the bloodshed after among his own men dover had had them bled copiously for the plague turner hints that dr dr's quicksilver did not a little to hasten the end of the celebrated tragedian barton booth to whom he had given between may three and eight within two ounces of two pounds of mercury like his master dover's only affiliation with the royal college of physicians was through the minimum qualification of the license sydenham and morton the two most distinguished english clinical physicians of the seventeenth century were regarded as innovators and sectaries by the heads of the college who as sydenham remarks took fire at his attempts to reduce practice to greater easiness and plainness 
the coolness and moderation of the master were not imitated by the ancient physician who in the sixth edition attacks the gentlemen of the faculty and warns unwary people not to take every graduate for a physician nor a clan of prejudiced gentlemen for oracles he added to his legacy the statuta moralia or as he terms it on the title page the moral conversation of the college of physic in latin and english by way of appendix together with a digression dover affirms boldly that the whole purport of the conversation is to conceal their ignorance and to deceive their miserable patients but he avers his desire is more to do justice to mankind than to irritate and provoke a set of gentlemen who like moles work underground lest their practices should be discovered to the populace he again refers to the relations of the apothecaries with the physicians in the following terms the apothecaries generally speaking have it in their power to recommend the physician which is the wrongest step the patient can possibly take the physician to gratify the apothecary thinks himself obliged to order ten times more physic than the patient really wants by which means he often ruins his constitution and too often his life otherwise how is it possible an apothecary's bill in a fever should amount to forty or fifty or more pounds nay i have been creditably informed that several of those apothecaries have declared they would never call in a physician but what would put in fifteen or twenty shilling a day into their pocket what must the conscience of such physicians be that would forfeit their reputation and everything that is dear to them by cheating for others i would venture to say neither sydenham nor radcliffe's bills ever did amount to forty shillings in a fever and yet they recovered their patients without the rule at present prescribed of vomiting bleeding and multiplying blisters in all cases whatsoever so since this is to be their rule of practice they are very indifferent in their inquiries what the patient's disease is dover continued to practice in london and in the seventh edition of the ancient physician's legacy there is a letter to him from catherine hood dated november sixth seventeen thirty eight in which she speaks of having consulted him in seventeen thirty seven his reputation seems to have extended to the continent for in the opera omnia of balonius edited by professor tronchin of geneva seventeen sixty two there is a most laudatory dedication in which he is extolled as one of the most distinguished physicians of the time in seventeen forty two appeared the sixth edition of the legacy which must have been issued by the author as he speaks on the title page of fifty-eight years of practice he is stated by monk to have died in seventeen forty one or seventeen forty two probably the latter but his name does not appear in the register of deaths in the gentleman's magazine in either of those years doubtless the old buccaneer described as a man of rough temper who could not easily agree with those about him was a striking figure as he passed along the strand to the jerusalem coffee-house where he saw his patients a good fighter a good hater as alas so many physicians have been his weaknesses and evil behaviour we may forget but captain thomas dover who on the second of february seventeen ten found robinson crusoe the world should not forget and we also of his craft have cause daily to remember with gratitude the student and friend of the great sydenham who had the wit in devising a powder to remember his master's injunction sine papa veribus sine opiatis et medicamentis ex iis confectis manca et clada esset medicina end of chapter two chapter three john keats the apothecary poet we have the very highest authority for the statement that the lunatic the lover and the poet are of imagination all compact 
in a more comprehensive division with a keener discernment plato recognizes a madness which is not an evil but a divine gift and the source of the chiefest blessing granted to men of this divine madness poetry occupies one of the fourfold partitions here is his definition the third kind is the madness of those who are possessed by the muses which taking hold of a delicate and virgin soul and their inspiring frenzy awakens lyrical and all other numbers with these adorning the myriad actions of ancient heroes for the instruction of posterity but he who having no touch of the muses madness in his soul comes to the door and thinks that he will get into the temple by the help of art he i say and his poetry are not admitted the sane man disappears and is nowhere when he enters into rivalry with the madman here in a few words we have expressed the very pith and marrow of the nature of poetry and a clearer distinction than is drawn by many modern writers of the relation of the art to the spirit of the form to the thought by the help of art without the muses madness no man enters the temple the poet is a light and winged and holy thing whose inspiration genius faculty whatever we may choose to call it is allied to madness he is possessed or inspired oliver wendell holmes has expressed this very charmingly in more modern terms speaking of his own condition when composing the chambered nautilus in writing the poem i was filled with a better feeling the highest state of mental exaltation and the most crystalline clairvoyance that had ever been granted to me i mean that lucid vision of one's thought and all forms of expression which will be at once precise and musical which is the poet's special gift however large or small in amount or value to the base mechanical of the working-day world this lucid vision this crystalline clairvoyance and mental exaltation is indeed a madness working in the brain a state which he cannot understand a holy of holies into which he cannot enter one when all the circumstances are taken into account the english parnassus affords no parallel to the career of keats adonais as we love to call him whose birthday one hundred years ago we celebrate to-day born at the sign of the swan and hoop moorgate pavement the son of the head ostler his parentage and the social atmosphere of his early years conspired to produce an ordinary beer-loving pugnacious cockney but instead there was fashioned one of the clearest sweetest and strongest singers of the century whose advent sets at naught all laws of heredity as his development transcends all laws of environment keats's father succeeded to mine host of the swan and hoop but died when the poet was only eight years old his grandmother was in comfortable circumstances and keats was sent to school at enfield kept by the father of charles coden clark here among other accomplishments he developed his knuckles and received a second-hand introduction to the greek pantheon he is described by one of his schoolfellows as the pet prize-fighter with terrier courage but in the last two years at school he studied hard and took all the prizes the influence of the clarks upon keats was strong and formative particularly that of the younger one charles coden who was an usher in the school in the poem addressed to him he frankly acknowledges this great debt you first taught me all the sweets of song in eighteen ten his mother died of consumption and during a long illness keats nursed her with incessant devotion on the completion of his fifteenth year he was removed from school and apprenticed to mr hammond a surgeon at edmonton the terms of the old indenture as surgeon's apprentice are quaint enough i have one of my uncle edward osler dated eighteen eleven the surgeon for a consideration of forty pounds without board undertook the care and education for five years of the apprentices of whom there were often four or five 
the number of specific negatives in the ordinary indenture indicates the rough and ready character of the tom sawyers of that date the young apprentice promised not to haunt taverns or playhouses not to play at dice or cards nor absent himself from his said master's service day or night unlawfully but in all things as a faithful apprentice he shall behave himself towards his said master and all his during the said term we know but little of the days of keats's apprenticeship a brother student said he was an idle loafing fellow always writing poetry in eighteen fourteen in the fourth year of his indenture the pupil and master had a serious quarrel and the contract was broken by mutual consent it would appear from the following sentence in a letter to his brother that more than words passed between them i dare say you have altered also every man does our bodies every seven years are completely fresh materialed seven years ago it was not this hand that clenched itself against hammond at the end of the apprenticeship the student walked one of the hospitals for a time before presenting himself at the college of surgeons or the apothecary's hall keats went to the at the time united hospitals of guise and st thomas where he studied during the sessions of eighteen fourteen fifteen and eighteen fifteen sixteen he became a dresser at guise in the latter year under mr lucas and on july twenty five eighteen sixteen he passed the apothecary's hall the details of keats's life as a medical student are very scanty in after years one or two of his fellow students placed on record their impressions of him he does not seem to have been a very brilliant student poetry rather than surgery was followed as a vocation one of his fellow students says all other pursuits were to his mind mean and tame yet he acquired some degree of technical skill and performed with credit the minor operations which fell to the hand of a dresser he must have been a fairly diligent student to have obtained even the minimum qualification of the hall before the completion of his twenty-first year in the biographical history of guy's hospital dr wilkes states that sir astley cooper took a special interest in keats what attraction could the career of an apothecary offer to a man already much travelled in the realms of gold who was capable at twenty of writing such a sonnet as that on chapman's homer so far as we know he never practised or made any effort to get established and in eighteen seventeen he abandoned the profession apparently not without opposition in a letter to his friend brown dated september twenty three eighteen nineteen he says in no period of my life have i acted with any self-will but in throwing up the apothecary's profession during the next four years he led to use his own words a fitful life here and there no anchor while a student he had made friends in a literary circle of which lee hunt and hayden the artist were members and he had a number of intimates brown taylor bailey dilkey and others among the coming men in art and science from his letters to them to his brother george who had emigrated with his wife to america and to his sister fanny we glean glimpses of his life at this period his correspondence reveals too so far as it can the man as he was his aspirations thoughts and hopes two the spirit of negative capability dominated these years the capability as he expresses it of being in uncertainties mysteries doubts without any irritable searching after fact and reason the native hue of any resolution which he may have entertained and we shall learn that he had such was soon sickly o'er and he lapsed into idleness so far as any remunerative work was concerned a practical woman like mrs abbey the wife of the trustee of his mother's estate condoned his conduct with the words the keatses were ever indolent that they would ever be so and that it was born in them in a letter to his brother he uses the right word here is his confession this morning i am in a sort of temper indolent and supremely careless 
i long after a stanza or two of thompson's castle of indolence my passions are all asleep from my having slumbered till nearly eleven and weakened the animal fibre all over me to a delightful sensation about three degrees this side of faintness if i had teeth of pearl and the breath of lilies i should call it languor but as i am especially as i have a black eye i must call it laziness this is the only happiness and is a rare instance of the advantage of the body overpowering the mind the gospel of living as against that of doing which milton preached in the celebrated sonnet on his blindness found in keats a warm advocate let us not therefore he says go hurrying about and collecting honey bee-like buzzing here and there for a knowledge of what is not to be arrived at but let us open our leaves like a flower and be passive and receptive budding patiently under the eye of apollo and taking truths from every noble insect that favours us with a visit fatal to encourage in an active man of affairs this dreamy state this passive existence favours in bards of passion and of mirth the development of a fruitful mental attitude the dreamer spins from his own inwards his own airy citadel and as the spider needs but few points of leaves and twigs from which to begin his airy circuit so keats says man should be content with as few points to tip with the fine web of his soul and weave a tapestry empyrean full of symbols for his spiritual eye of softness for his spiritual touch and of space for his wanderings of distinctness for his luxury all the while keats was budding patiently feeling his powers expand and with the viewless wings of poesy taking ever larger flights an absorption in ideals a yearning passion for the beautiful was he says his master passion matthew arnold remarks it was with him an intellectual and spiritual passion it is connected and made one as keats declares that in his case it was with the ambition of the intellect it is as he again says the mighty abstract idea of beauty in all things listen to one or two striking passages from his letters this morning poetry has conquered i have relapsed into these abstractions which are my only life i feel more and more every day as my imagination strengthens that i do not live in this world alone but in a thousand worlds no sooner am i alone than shapes of epic greatness are stationed round me and serve my spirit the office which is equivalent to a king's bodyguard then tragedy with sceptred paul comes sweeping by what the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth the expression in prose of his ever memorable lines beauty is truth truth beauty that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know three keats's first published work a small volume of poems issued in eighteen seventeen contained the verses written while he was a student and before he had abandoned the profession with the exception of one or two small pieces it contained nothing of note the sonnet on chapman's homer written while he was a pupil at guy's was the most remarkable poem of the collection in eighteen eighteen appeared endymion a poetic romance an ambitious work which in the autumn of the year was mercilessly cut up in the quarterly and in blackwood popularly these reviews are believed to have caused keats's early death a belief fostered by the jaunty rhyme of byron tis strange the mind that very fiery particle should let itself be snuffed out by an article the truth is no event in keats's life so warmly commends him to us or shows more clearly the genuine robustness of his mind than his attitude in this much discussed episode in the first place he had a clear for so young a man an extraordinarily clear perception of the limitation of his own powers and the value of his work 
The preface to Endymion, one of the most remarkable ever written, contains his own lucid judgment. He felt that his foundations were too sandy, that the poem was an immature, feverish attempt in which he had moved, as he says, from the leading strings to the go-cart. Did any critic ever sketch with firmer hand the mental condition of a young man in transition? The imagination of a boy is healthy, and the mature imagination of a man is healthy, but there is a space of life between in which the soul is in a ferment the character undecided, the way of life uncertain, the ambition thick-sighted. Thence proceeds mawkishness and all the thousand bitters which those men I speak of must necessarily taste in going over the following pages. It cannot be denied that there are in Endymion, as the Quarterly Review puts it, the most incongruous ideas in the most uncouth language but the poem has lines of splendid merit, some indeed which have passed into the daily life of the people. Naturally the criticism of the Quarterly and of Blackwood rankled deeply in his oversensitive heart. But after the first pangs he appears to have accepted the castigation in a truly philosophic way. In a letter to his friend Hersey, dated October 9, 1818, he writes, praise or blame has but a momentary effect on the man whose love of beauty in the abstract makes him a severe critic of his own works. My own domestic criticism has given me pain without comparison beyond what Blackwood or the Quarterly could possibly inflict, and also when I feel I am right, no external praise can give me such a glow as my own solitary reperception and ratification of what is fine. J. S. is perfectly right in regard to the slipshod Endymion. That it is so is no fault of mine, no, though it may sound a little paradoxical, it is as good as I had power to make it by myself. And he adds, I will write independently. I have written independently without judgment. I may write independently and with judgment hereafter. The genius of poetry must work out its own salvation in a man. A young man of twenty-three who could write this, whatever else he possessed, had the men's sana and could not be killed by a dozen reviews. In June 1820 appeared Keats's third work, Lemia, Isabella, The Eve of St. Agnes, and other poems, which placed him in the first rank of English writers. I will quote briefly the criticism of two masters. No one else in English poetry save Shakespeare, says Matthew Arnold, has in expression quite the fascinating facility of Keats, his perfection of loveliness. I think, he said humbly, I shall be among the English poets after my death. He is, he is, with Shakespeare. Lowell, speaking of his wonderful power in the choice of words, says, Men's thoughts and opinions are in a great degree the vassals of him who invents a new phrase or reapplies an old one. The thought or feeling a thousand times repeated becomes his at last who utters it best. As soon as we have discovered the word for our joy or our sorrow, we are no longer its serfs, but its lords. We reward the discoverer of an anaesthetic for the body, and make him a member of all the societies. But him who finds an apente for the soul, we elect into the small academy of the immortals. And I will add a criticism on the letters by Edward Fitzgerald. Talking of Keats, do not forget to read Lord Houghton's Life and Letters of him, in which you will find what you may not have guessed from his poetry, though almost unfathomably deep in that also, the strong masculine sense and humor, etc., of the man, more akin to Shakespeare, I am tempted to think, in a perfect circle of poetic faculties, than any poet since. 4. Very few indications of his professional training are to be found in Keats's letters. Fewer still in the poems. Referring to his studies, he says in one of the early poems, the epistle to George Felton Matthew, 
far different cares beckon me sternly from soft lydian airs during the four years from eighteen seventeen to eighteen twenty he made fitful efforts to bestir himself into action and on several occasions his thoughts turned toward his calling in a letter to his brother written in february eighteen nineteen he says i have been at different times turning it in my head whether i should go to edinburgh and study for a physician i am afraid i should not take kindly to it i am sure i could not take fees and yet i should like to do so it is not worse than writing poems and hanging them up to be flybone on the review shambles in eighteen eighteen he wrote to his friend reynolds were i to study physic or rather medicine again i feel it would not make the least difference in my poetry when the mind is in its infancy a bias is in reality a bias but when we acquire more strength a bias becomes no bias adding that he is glad that he had not given away his medical books which i shall again look over to keep alive the little i know thitherwards in may eighteen twenty when convalescent from the first attack of hemoptysis he wrote to dilke i have my choice of three things or at least two south america or surgeon to an india man which last will be my fate a year before in a letter to miss jeffreys he spoke of voyaging to and from india for a few years but in june eighteen nineteen he tells his sister that he has given up the idea of an india man and that he was preparing to inquire for a situation with an apothecary allusions to or analogies drawn from medical subjects are rare in his letters in one place in writing from devonshire he says when i think of wordsworth's sonnet vanguard of liberty ye men of kent in wordsworth at all events the degraded race about me are pulvis ipecac simplex a strong dose he played a medical prank on his friend brown who had let his house to a man named nathan benjamin the water which furnished the house was in a tank lined with lime which impregnated the water unpleasantly keats wrote the following short note to brown sir by drinking your damned tank water i have got the gravel what reparation can you make to me and my family nathan benjamin brown accordingly surprised his tenant with the following answer sir i cannot offer you any remuneration until your gravel shall have formed itself into a stone when i will cut you with pleasure c brown in a letter to james rice he tells one of the best maternal impression stories extant would you like a true story there was a man and his wife who being to go a long journey on foot in the course of their travels came to a river which rolled knee-deep over the pebbles in these cases the man generally pulls off his shoes and stockings and carries the woman over on his back this man did so and his wife being pregnant and troubled as in such cases is very common with strange longings took the strangest that ever was heard of seeing her husband's foot a handsome one enough looked very clean and tempting in the clear water on their arrival at the other bank she earnestly demanded a bit of it he being an affectionate fellow and fearing for the comeliness of his child gave her a bit which he cut off with his clasp knife not satisfied she asked for another morsel supposing there might be twins he gave her a slice more not yet contented she craved another piece you wretch cries the man would you wish me to kill myself take that upon which he stabbed her with a knife cut her open and found three children in her belly two of them very comfortable with their mouths shut the third with its eyes and mouth stark staring wide open who would have thought it cried the widower and pursued his journey the estate of keats's mother was greatly involved and it does not appear that he received much from the trustee mr abbey his books were not successful and having no love for the ordinary hack work in literature he was largely dependent upon the bounty of his friends from whom in several of the letters the receipt of money is acknowledged who could resist a charming borrower who could thus write 
I am your debtor. I must ever remain so. Nor do I wish to be clear of my rational debt. There is a comfort in throwing oneself on the charity of one's friends. It is like the albatross sleeping on its wings. I will be to you wine in the cellar, and the more modestly, or rather indolently, I retire into the backward bin, the more falern will I be at the drinking. We must remember, however, that Keats had reasonable expectations. He says to Hayden, December 23, 1818, I have a little money which may enable me to study and to travel for three or four years. He had enough wisdom to try to be correct in money matters, and to have in my desk, as he says, the chronicles of them to refer to, and know my worldly non-estate. To the worries of uncertain health and greatly embarrassed affairs, there were added in the summer of 1819 the pangs, one can hardly say, of disprised, but certainly of hopeless love writing to his friend reynolds may three eighteen eighteen in comparing life to a large mansion of many apartments he says pathetically that he could only describe two the first the infant or thoughtless chamber in which we remain as long as we do not think and the second the chamber of maiden thought in which at first we become intoxicated with the light and atmosphere until it gradually darkens and we see not well the exit and we feel the burden of the mystery for his friends he hopes the third chamber of life may be filled with the wine of love and the bread of friendship poor fellow within a year the younger aphrodite in the shape of fanny brown beckoned to him from the door of his third chamber. Through her came no peace to his soul, and the muse's inspiration was displaced by a passion which rocked him as the winds rock the ravens on high, by Plato's fourth variety of madness, which brought him sorrow and leaden-eyed despair. The publication of Keats's letters to Fanny Brown can be justified. It must also be regretted while there are some letters which we should be loath to miss there are others the publication of which has wronged his memory whether of a young poet as keats or of an old philosopher as swift such maudlin cooings and despairing wails should be ruled out of court with the writings of paranoiacs five keats's mother died of consumption in eighteen ten in the winter of 1817-18 he nursed his brother Tom through the same disease. In the spring they spent several months together in Devonshire, which Keats compares to Lydia Languish, very entertaining when it smiles, but cursedly subject to sympathetic moisture. In the summer he took a trip through Scotland, and in the island of Mull caught a cold which settled in his throat. In a letter dated Inverness, August 6th, he speaks of his throat as in a fair way of getting quite well. On his return to Hampstead we hear of it again, and in September he writes, I am confined by Sowry's mandate in the house now, and have as yet only gone out in fear of the damp night. During the last three months of the year he again nursed his brother Tom, who died in December. From this time the continual references to the sore throat are ominous. On December 31 he complains to Fanny Keats that a sore throat keeps him in the house, and he speaks of it again in January letters. In a February letter to his sister he says that the sore throat has haunted him at intervals for nearly a twelve-month. In June and July he speaks of it again, but the summer spent in the Isle of Wight and at Winchester did him good, and in September he writes to one of his friends that he had got rid of his haunting sore throat. I have laid stress upon this particular feature, as there can be but little question that the tuberculosis of which he died began, as is common enough, with this localization. For more than a year there had been constant exposure while nursing his brother, and under conditions in Devonshire at least most favourable to infection. The depression of the review attacks in the autumn of 1818 must also be taken into account. 
through the summer of eighteen eighteen there are occasional references to an irritable state of health apart from the throat trouble unfitting him for mental exertion i think if i had a free and healthy and lasting organization of heart and lungs as strong as an ox's so as to bear unhurt the shock of an extreme thought and sensation without weariness i could pass my life very nearly alone though it should last eighty years but i feel my body too weak to support me to the height i am obliged continually to check myself and be nothing if we may judge by the absence of any references in the letters the autumn of the year was passed in good health but on december twenty he wrote that he was fearful lest the weather should affect my throat which on exertion or cold continually threatens me on february three the smouldering fires broke out after he had been exposed in a stage ride in an attack of hemoptysis from this date we can trace in the letters the melancholy progress of the disease in april and may the lung symptoms became less pronounced and in spite of much nervous irritability and weakness he was able to direct the publication of his third little volume of poems on june twenty two he had a return of the spitting of blood which lasted several days the serious nature of the disease was by this time evident to both the patient and his physicians he acknowledges that it will be a long tedious affair and that a winter in italy may be necessary tis not yet consumption he writes fanny keats but it would be were i to remain in this climate all the winter this too was a time of terrible mental distress as he became madly jealous of his best friend c a brown the letters of this period to fanny brown tell of the damned moments of one who dotes yet doubts suspects yet fondly loves preparations were made for his journey to italy which he speaks of as marching up to a battery he sailed for naples which was reached after a tedious voyage about the end of october severn the artist accompanied him and has given atlantic monthly april eighteen sixty three a touching account of the last months of his friend's life realizing fully the hopelessness of his condition like many a brave man in a similar plight he wished to take his life severn states in a little basket of medicines i had bought at gravesend at his request there was a bottle of laudanum and this i afterwards found was destined by him to close his mortal career when no hope was left and prevent a long lingering death for my poor sake when the dismal time came and sir james clark was unable to encounter keats's penetrating look and eager demand he insisted on having the bottle which i had already put away then came the most touching scenes he now explained to me the exact procedure of his gradual dissolution enumerated my deprivations and toils and dwelt upon the danger to my life and certainly to my fortunes from my continued attendance upon him one whole day was spent in earnest representations of this sort to which at the same time that they wrung my heart to hear and his to utter i was obliged to oppose a firm resistance on the second day his tender appeal turned to despair in all the power of his ardent imagination and bursting heart in rome keats was under the care of dr afterwards sir james clark who with severn watched him with assiduous care throughout the winter months unlike so many consumptives keats had none of the spes physica which carries them hopefully to the very gates of the grave he knew how desperate was his state i feel he said the flowers growing over me when will this posthumous life come to an end on february fourteen he requested severn to have inscribed on his gravestone the words here lies one whose name was writ in water on february twenty seven he passed away quietly in severn's arms all lovers of poetry cherish keats's memory for the splendor of the verse with which he has enriched our literature 
there is also that deep pathos in a life cut off in the promise of such rich fruit he is numbered among the inheritors of unfulfilled renown with catullus and marlowe with chatterton and shelley whom we mourn as doubly dead in that they died so young it was with true prophetic insight that he wrote in eighteen eighteen to his brother george what though i leave this dull unearthly mould yet shall my spirit lofty converse hold with after times shelley who was so soon to join this gentle band and find with keats a grave among the eternal has expressed the world's sorrow in his noble elegy i quote in conclusion his less well-known fragment here lieth one whose name was writ on water but ere the breath that could erase it blew death in remorse for that fell slaughter death the immortalizing winter flew athwart the stream and time's printless torrent grew a scroll of crystal blazoning the name of adonis End of chapter three chapter four oliver wendell holmes very fitting indeed is it that he who had lived to be the last leaf upon the tree should have fallen peacefully in the autumn which he loved so well delightful too to think that although he had to use the expression of benjamin franklin intruded himself these many years into the company of posterity the freshness and pliancy of his mind had not for a moment failed like his own wonderful one hoss shay the end was a sudden breakdown and though he would have confessed no doubt to a general flavour of decay there was nothing local and his friends had been spared that most distressing of all human spectacles those cold gradations of decay in which a man takes nearly as long to die as he does to grow up and lives a sort of death in life ita sine vite vivere ita sine morte mori enough has been said and doubtless well said by those who make criticism their vocation upon the literary position and affinities of oliver wendell holmes and i shall spare your perhaps already surcharged ears he has been sandwiched in my affections these many years between oliver goldsmith and charles lamb more than once he has been called i think the american goldsmith certainly the great distinction of both men lies in that robust humanity which has a smile for the foibles and a tear for the sorrows of their fellow-creatures the english oliver with a better schooling for a poet had he not learned in suffering what he taught in song had a finer fancy and at his best a clearer note with both writers one is at a loss to know which to love the better the prose or the poetry can we name two other prose writers of equal merit who have so successfully courted the draggle-tailed muses as goldsmith calls them like charles lamb holmes gains the affections of his readers at the first reading and the genial humour the refined wit the pathos the tender sensitiveness to the lights and shadows of life give to the breakfast-table series much of the charm of the essays of elia while it is true that since rabelais and Laniker no generation has lacked a physician to stand unabashed in the temple at delos a worshipper of worth and merit amid the votaries of apollo i can recall no name in the past three centuries eminent in literature eminent i mean in the sense in which goldsmith is eminent which is associated in any enduring way with work done in the science and art of medicine many physicians active practitioners sir thomas brown for example have been and are known for the richness and variety of their literary work but as a rule those who have remained in professional life have courted the draggle-tailed muses as a gentle pastime to interpose a little ease amid the worries of practice few such have risen above mediocrity fewer still have reached it we know the names of garth of arbuthnot and of akenside but we neither know them nor their works 
the list is a long one for the rites of apollo have always had a keen attraction for the men of our ranks but the names fill at the best a place in the story of literature of the country not a place in the hearts and lives of the people far otherwise is it with a select group of men goldsmith crabbe and keats who at the outset members of our profession early broke away from its drudgery in pride we claim them though in reality no influence of their special studies is to be found in their writings two of these at least reached the pure empyrean and to use shelley's words robed in dazzling immortality sit on thrones built beyond mortal thought far in the unapparent oliver wendell holmes may not be placed in the same exalted sphere but he will always occupy a unique position in the affections of medical men not a practitioner he yet retained for the greater part of his active life the most intimate connection with the profession and as professor of anatomy at harvard university kept in touch with it for nearly forty years the festivals at epidaurus were never neglected by him and as the most successful combination which the world has ever seen of the physician and the man of letters he has for years sat amid the asclepians in the seat of honor during the nineteenth century three schools in succession have moulded the thoughts and opinions of the medical profession in this country in the early period english ways and methods prevailed and as in the colonial days the students who crossed the atlantic for further study went to edinburgh or to london then came a time between eighteen twenty five and eighteen sixty when american students went chiefly to paris and the promedical machinery among the old hard-working operatives that they should for a while smile at its pretensions and when its use began to creep in among them that they should observe and signalize all the errors and defects which happened in its practical application gerhard's work on the diagnosis of diseases of the chest was published in eighteen thirty six and with this essay of holmes's opened to the american profession the rich experience of the french school in the methods of direct exploration in all disorders of the chest and of the heart the essay may be read to-day by the student with great profit it is particularly rich in original references to the older writers readers of the autocrat and of others of holmes's literary works have been surprised at the readiness with which he quotes and refers to the fathers of the profession a facility readily explained by these boylston prize dissertations and in their preparation he had evidently studied not only the modern authors of the day but had read in the original the great masters from hippocrates to harvey the prize essay does not constitute the most enduring form of medical literature and though the dissertation on malaria is in some respects one of the very best of the long series of boylston essays yet we could scarcely have spoken of a medical reputation for dr holmes had it to rest upon these earlier productions a few years later however he contributed an article which will long keep his memory green in our ranks childbed fever was unhappily no new disorder when oliver wendell holmes studied nor had there been wanting men who had proclaimed forcibly its specific character and its highly contagious nature indeed so far back as seventeen ninety five gordon of aberdeen not only called it a specific contagion but said he could predict with unerring accuracy the very doctors and nurses in whose practice the cases would develop rigby too had lent the weight of his authority in favor of the contagiousness but the question was so far from settled that as you will hear many of the leading teachers scouted the idea that doctors and nurses could convey the disorder semmelweis had not then begun to make his interesting and conclusive observations for which his memory has recently been so greatly honored in eighteen forty three before the boston society for medical improvement dr holmes read a paper entitled the contagiousness of purpural fever 
in which he brought forward a long array of facts in support of the view that the disease was contagious conveyed usually by the doctor or the nurse and due to a specific infection at the time there certainly was not an article in which the subject was presented in so logical and so convincing manner as sidney smith says it is not the man who first says a thing but it is he who says it so long so loudly and so clearly that he compels men to hear him it is to him that the credit belongs and so far as this country is concerned the credit of insisting upon the great practical truth of the contagiousness of puerperal fever belongs to dr holmes the essay is characterized in places by great strength of feeling he says he could not for a moment consent to make a question of the momentous fact which should not be considered a subject for trivial discussion but should be acted upon with silent promptitude no negative facts no passing opinions be they what they may or whose they may can form any answer to the series of cases now within the reach of all who choose to explore the records of medical science just before the conclusions the following eloquent paragraphs are found portions of which are often quoted it is as a lesson rather than as a reproach that i call up the memory of these irreparable errors and wrongs no tongue can tell the heart-breaking calamities they have caused they have closed the eyes just opened upon a new world of life and happiness they have bowed the strength of manhood into the dust they have cast the helplessness of infancy into the stranger's arms or bequeathed it with less cruelty the death of its dying parent there is no tone deep enough for record and no voice loud enough for warning the woman about to become a mother or with her newborn infant upon her bosom should be the object of trembling care and sympathy wherever she bears her tender burden or stretches her aching limbs the very outcast of the street has pity upon her sister in degradation when the seal of promised maternity is impressed upon her the remorseless vengeance of the law brought down upon its victims by a machinery as sure as destiny is arrested in its fall at a word which reveals her transient claims for mercy the solemn prayer of the liturgy singles out her sorrows from the multiplied trials of life to plead for her in the hour of peril god forbid that any member of the profession to which she entrusts her life doubly precious at that eventful period should regard it negligently unadvisedly or selfishly the results of his studies are summed up in a series of eight conclusions and the strong ground which he took may be gathered from this sentence in the last one the time has come when the existence of a private pestilence in the sphere of a single physician should be looked upon not as a misfortune but a crime fortunately this essay which was published in the ephemeral new england quarterly journal of medicine was not destined to remain unnoticed the statements were too bold and the whole tone too resolute not to arouse the antagonism of those whose teachings had been for years diametrically opposed to the contagiousness of puerperal fever philadelphia was the centre of the teaching and work in obstetrics in this country and if we can speak at all of an american school of obstetricians it is due to the energy of the professors of this branch in that city and for the sake of the memory of the men we should wish expunged the incident to which i now will allude in eighteen fifty two the elder hodge professor of obstetrics at the university of pennsylvania published an essay on the non-contagious character of puerperal fever and in eighteen fifty four charles d meigs professor of obstetrics at the jefferson medical college published a work on the nature signs and treatment of childbed fevers in a series of letters addressed to students of his class both of these men the most distinguished professors of obstetrics in america took extreme ground against holmes and meigs handled him rather roughly nothing daunted in the following year eighteen fifty five 
Holmes reprinted the essay, calling it Purple Fever as a private pestilence. He clearly appreciated the character of the work he was doing, since in the introduction he says, I do not know that I shall ever again have so good an opportunity of being useful as was granted to me by the raising of the question which produced this essay. The point at issue is squarely put in a few paragraphs on one of the first pages, the affirmative in a quotation from his essay. The disease known as purple fever is so far contagious as to be carried from patient to patient by physicians and nurses. 1843. The negative in two quotations, one from Hodge, 1852, who begged his students to divest their minds of the dread that they could ever carry the horrible virus, and of Meigs, 1854, who says, I prefer to attribute them, namely the deaths, to accident or providence, of which I can form a conception, rather than to a contagion of which I cannot form any clear idea. The introduction to the essay, which was reprinted as it appeared in 1843, is one of the ablest and most trenchant pieces of writing with which I am acquainted. There are several striking paragraphs. Thus, in alluding to the strong and personal language used by Meigs, Holmes says, I take no offense and attempt no retort. No man makes a quarrel with me over the counterpane that covers a mother with her newborn infant at her breast. He appeals to the medical student not to be deceived by the statements of the two distinguished professors, which seem to him to encourage professional homicide. One paragraph has become classical. They naturally have faith in their instructors, turning to them for truth, and taking what they may choose to give them. Babies in knowledge not yet able to tell the breast from the bottle, pumping away for the milk of truth at all that offers were it nothing better than a professor's shriveled forefinger. The high estimate in which this work of Holmes's is held has frequently been referred to by writers on obstetrics. Some years ago, in an editorial note, I commented upon a question which Dr. Holmes had asked in his hundred days in Europe. Somewhere at dinner he had sat next to a successful gynecologist who had saved some hundreds of lives by his operations, and he asked, which would give the most satisfaction to a thoroughly humane and unselfish being of cultivated intelligence and lively sensibilities, to have written all the plays which Shakespeare has left as an inheritance for mankind, or to have snatched from the jaws of death more than a hundred fellow creatures and restored them to sound and comfortable existence i remarked that there was nobody who could answer this question so satisfactorily as the autocrat and asked from which he derived the greater satisfaction the essay on purple fever which had probably saved many more lives than any individual gynecologist or the chambered nautilus which had given pleasure to so many thousands the journal reached dr holmes and i read you his reply to me under date of january twenty one eighteen eighty nine i have rarely been more pleased than by your allusion to an old paper of mine there was a time certainly in which i would have said that the best page of my record was that in which i had fought my battle for the poor poisoned women I am reminded of that essay from time to time, but it was published in a periodical which died after one year's life, and therefore escaped the wider notice it would have found if printed in the American Journal of the Medical Sciences. A lecturer at one of the great London hospitals referred to it the other day, and coupled it with some fine phrases about myself, which made me blush, either with modesty or vanity, I forget which. I think I will not answer the question you put me. I think oftenest of the chambered Nautilus, which is a favorite poem of mine, though I wrote it myself. The essay only comes up at long intervals. The poem repeats itself in my memory, and is very often spoken of by my correspondents in terms of more than ordinary praise. I had a savage pleasure, I confess, in handling those two professors, learned men, both of them skillful experts, but babies, as it seemed to me, in their capacity of reasoning and arguing. 
but in writing the poem i was filled with a better feeling the highest state of mental exaltation and the most crystalline clairvoyance as it seemed to me that had ever been granted to me i mean that lucid vision of one's thought and all forms of expression which will be at once precise and musical which is the poet's special gift however large or small in amount or value there is more selfish pleasure to be had out of the poem perhaps a nobler satisfaction from the life-saving labor last year at the dinner of the american gynecological society in philadelphia a letter from dr holmes was read referring to the subject in very much the same language as he uses in his letter to me one or two of the paragraphs i may quote still i was attacked in my stronghold by the two leading professors of obstetrics in this country i defended my position with new facts and arguments and not without rhetorical fervor at which after cooling down for half a century i might smile if i did not remember how intensely and with what good reason my feelings were kindled into the heated atmosphere of superlatives i have been long out of the way of discussing this class of subjects i do not know what others have done since my efforts i do know that others had cried out with all their might against the terrible evil before i did and i gave them full credit for it but i think i shrieked my warning louder and longer than any of them and i am pleased to remember that i took my ground on the existing evidence before the little army of microbes was marched up to support my position fortunately dr holmes medical essays are reprinted with his works several of them are enduring contributions to the questions with which they deal all should be read carefully by every student of medicine the essay on homeopathy remains one of the most complete exposures of that therapeutic fad there is no healthier or more stimulating writer to students and to young medical men with an entire absence of nonsense with rare humor and unfailing kindness and with that delicacy of feeling characteristic of a member of the brahmin class he has permanently enriched the literature of the race search the ranks of authors since elia whom in so many ways holmes resembled and to no one else could the beautiful tribute of landor be transferred with the same sense of propriety he leaves behind him freed from grief and fears far nobler things than tears the love of friends without a single foe unequalled lot below End of chapter four chapter five john locke as a physician part one among the great men of the seventeenth century not one has more enduring claims to our grateful remembrance than john locke philosopher philanthropist and physician as a philosopher his praise is in the colleges as the apostle of common sense he may be ranked with socrates and a few others who have brought philosophy from the clouds to the working-day world of his special virtues and qualifications as the typical english philosopher nothing need be said but were there time i would fain dwell upon his character as a philanthropist in the truest sense of the word the author of the epistle on toleration the treatise on education and the constitution of carolina the man who pleaded for absolute liberty just and true liberty equal and impartial liberty the man who wrote the memorable words all men are naturally in a state of freedom also of equality must be ranked as one of the great benefactors of the race with the faculty locke's connection has usually been described as loose and uncertain indeed we knew him chiefly as a friend of sydenham until the appearance of fox burns life it had not been recognized that he was at times an active practitioner and that throughout the greater part of his long life he was ready to treat cases and to give advice still less was it known that he was a writer of medical essays and that he had left a large body of clinical reports and papers 
I had become familiar with his professional relations through John Brown's essay, Locke and Sydenham, and many additional details are given in the life just referred to, but for the more important facts I have made a careful study of the Locke manuscripts in the British Museum and in the Record Office. 1. Life Let me first give a brief summary of Locke's life. He was born in the county of Somerset in 1632, the son of an attorney who at the outbreak of the Civil War joined the parliamentary side. Of his boyhood and early education, but little are known. In 1646 he entered Westminster School under the famous Dr. Busby, where he had as fellow students Richard Lower, Walter Needham, and John Mapletoft who subsequently became well-known physicians. In 1652 he entered Christchurch, Oxford, and received his B.A. degree in 1655 and the M.A. in 1658. In the following year he became senior student or fellow of Christchurch in 1660, lecturer on Greek, and in 1662, lecturer on rhetoric. In 1665 he served as secretary to the embassy of Sir Walter Vane to the elector of Brandenburg. Until 1660, a student of classics and rhetoric, Locke appears to have been at a loss to know exactly what calling to follow. Thoroughly disgusted, he had broken with the old scholastic philosophy, and, imbued with the new learning of Bacon and Descartes, felt what Dunn calls the sacred hunger of science but what probably turned his attention most actively to medicine was the presence in oxford of the celebrated robert boyle who with his associates had formed a scientific club the invisible college which became the nucleus of the royal society letters of this period show locke to have been busy with experimental physics working at problems suggested by boyle taking daily notes on the weather, a practice which he kept up for many years, and gradually becoming well versed in the sciences cognate to medicine. Unfortunately, we have very little information as to the character of his medical studies, which seem, however, to have been of a rather desultory nature, as he did not comply with the very easy requirements for the degree. On these, Fox Byrne makes the following comment, all that was expected from an applicant for a bachelorship in physic was regular attendance during three years at the lectures of the arabic professor and of the professors of anatomy and medicine together with participation in a certain number of disputations in the medical school and after that little more than a delay of four years was necessary to qualify him for the doctorship the medicine lectures, delivered every Tuesday and Friday morning during term, were limited to an exposition of the teaching of Hippocrates and Galen. For anatomy, the students had in the spring to attend the dissecting of one human body and to hear four lectures, each two hours long, upon it, and in the autumn to hear three lectures on the human skeleton these requirements however were not complied with and in november sixteen sixty six he attempted to have a dispensation so that he could obtain the doctorship without previously becoming a bachelor the request of lord clarendon however was not heeded owing probably to the fact that locke belonged to the puritan party during these years he seems to have been intimately associated with dr david thomas at that time a practitioner in oxford he writes to boyle in february sixteen sixty six seven mr thomas presents his humble service to you he and i are now upon a new sort of chemistry that is extracting money out of the scholars pockets and if we can do that you need not fear but that in time we shall have the lapis for he that can get gold and silver out of scholars cannot doubt to extract it anywhere else though political influence was unavailing to procure the doctor's degree without complying with the regulations it was potent enough to secure him in his senior studentship at christ church a position usually held only by persons in holy orders and this post with the salary attached to it 
Locke enjoyed till his expulsion in 1684. Locke did not receive the bachelorship of medicine until 1674, in which year he was appointed to one of the two medical studentships at Christchurch, and it was supposed by his friends that this was a step preliminary to taking the doctor's degree, but to this he never proceeded. In 1666, when acting as an assistant to Dr. Thomas, Lord Ashley, afterwards the first Earl of Shaftesbury, the celebrated Achitophel of Dryden's satire came to Oxford to drink the waters of the Astrup Wells. He was the subject of a remarkable malady, of which I shall subsequently give a detailed account. Dr. Thomas, to whom he had written to have the waters ready for him, was away, but had left word with Locke to get them, and as there was some trouble and delay, Locke called on Lord Ashley to apologize. There was a mutual attraction, and from this acquaintance began a friendship between the two men, which had important results, as in the following year we find locke installed at exeter house the london residence of lord ashley as physician and literary factotum from this date until sixteen seventy five locke lived in lord ashley's family occupying himself in all sorts of miscellaneous duties some domestic as finding young anthony ashley a wife whom he subsequently attended on several interesting occasions one duty which interests us in america very much is the share which he took in the carolina colony as secretary to the lord's proprietors he was appointed one of the landgraves and wrote it is supposed the celebrated fundamental constitutions of the government of carolina the original draft of which in his handwriting with many alterations and erasures may be seen in the record office the celebrated clause, no person whatsoever shall disturb, molest, or prosecute another for his speculative opinions in religion or his way of worship, expresses the spirit of toleration for which Locke strove all through his life. Subsequently, after Lord Ashley was created Earl of Shaftesbury, Locke became Secretary of Presentations during all this period he was deeply interested in medicine and was in intimate association with sydenham mapletoft and other well-known physicians of the day though it was not until sixteen seventy four that he took his m b at oxford about this time he began to suffer much in health and in sixteen seventy five went to france where he remained chiefly at montpellier and paris for four years his journals during this period, which are very full, indicate his continued interest in the profession, though as he writes to Mapletoft, My health, which you are so kind to in your wishes, is the only mistress I have a long time courted, and is so coy a one that it will take up the remainder of my days to obtain her good graces and keep her in good humor she hath of late been very wayward but i hope is coming about again in another letter he says for i doubt whether all the ortolans in france be able to communicate to me one grain of their fat and i shall be well enough at my ease if when i return i can but maintain this poor tenement of mine in the same repair it is in at present without hope ever to find it much better for I expect not that Dr. Time should be half so favorable to my crazy body as it has been to you in your late disease. Tis a good mark, but may have other dangers in it, for usually those whom that old winged gentleman helps up the hill are not yet got out of the reach of the winged boy who does such mischief with his bow and arrows. From 1679 to 1684, Locke was again with Lord Shaftesbury, busily occupied in public business, though still maintaining an intimate association with Sydenham and his medical friends. After Lord Shaftesbury's death, Locke himself fell under suspicion of having taken part in schemes against the crown, and from 1683 to 1689 found it safer to live in retirement in Holland. 
In 1684, by the peremptory order of the king, he was dismissed from his studentship in Christ Church. At the Revolution, he returned to London and became actively engaged in literary and political work. Failing health compelled his retirement to Oates, in the neighborhood of London, where with Lady Masham and her daughter he found a delightful home. He died quietly in 1704. No member of our profession of any age or any country has made so many important contributions to philosophy and practical politics as Dr. Locke. Professor Fowler remarks that the views published in his treatises on government, religion, toleration, education, and finance form new points of departure with which no writer on the history of these subjects can dispense. The same writer says of the effect of his writings on the history of progress and civilization, In an age of excitement and prejudice he set men the example of thinking calmly and clearly. When philosophy was almost synonymous with the arid discussion of scholastic subtleties, he wrote so as to interest statesmen and men of the world. At a time when the chains of dogma were far tighter and the penalties of attempting to loosen them far more stringent than it is now easy to conceive, he raised questions which stirred the very depths of human thought. And all this he did in a spirit so candid, so tolerant, so liberal, and so unselfish, that he seemed to be writing, not for his own party or his own times, but for the future of knowledge and of mankind. 2. Locke and Sydenham The story of the friendship of these two great men has been told in a delightful way by the late Dr. John Brown, but he knew nothing of the Shaftesbury papers or of several other important manuscripts which have come to light since his essay was published. Sydenham, eight years Locke's senior, had taken the M.B. of Oxford in 1648, four years before Locke entered Christchurch. There is no evidence to indicate that these well-paired friends, as Fox Byrne calls them, had met before Locke went to London with Lord Ashley in 1667. In the following year we find them practicing together, Locke accompanying Sydenham on his rounds, and much interested in the new plan of treating smallpox. In 1668 Sydenham wrote to Boyle, I perceive my friend Mr. Locke hath troubled you with an account of my practice, as he hath done himself in visiting with me very many of my various patients especially. But the best evidence of Locke's practice at this time, and of his intimacy with Sydenham, is found in his own handwriting in the British Museum in a bundle of original medical papers presented by William Seward. They consist of seventeen small quarto pages, closely written, containing the reports of interesting cases which have been well summarized as follows by Fox Byrne. He was attending a kitchen-maid of the Ashley household, who was afflicted with dropsy in September 1667, and again in January, February, and March 1667-8, and May and June 1668. In April and May he prescribed for a hard cough, with which one of his cousins, a boy of fourteen, and the son of his uncle, Peter Locke, was troubled and he cured one young child of inflammatory fever in June and another of hysterics in November of the same year. He visited a sturdy youth laid up with rheumatism every day between August 28th and September 19th when he left him to continue using the medicine he had prescribed for him, and on March 1st, 1668-9, he was able to declare him convalescent. In the same March, he treated a girl for fever, besides prescribing for two or three minor maladies, and in May 1669 he cured a case of angina pectoris. We have no record of any other medical work done by him in 1669, but he had cases of erysipelas and gonorrhea to deal with in January 1669-70 one of Cortan ague in March, another malady, morbilii, with which William Sydenham, apparently the son of his great friend, was afflicted in the same month. 
two of dropsy in april and may sixteen seventy one of inflammatory fever which he treated nearly every day from the twenty sixth of june till its fatal issue on the eleventh of july a case of disease of the kidneys and another of stricture in july one of colic in august and one of fever which occupied him every day from the nineteenth of august till the second of september when the patient died the case which fox burn refers to as angina pectoris may have been of this nature though the disease was not recognized for a little more than a century later the phrase is suffocationem patiabatur et angostoium pectoris et circum colum the report on the son of sydenham a lad aged eleven years who had measles is very complete the case seems to have been a very characteristic one onset with cough a chill and fever and with slight running at the nose on the fifth and sixth days a very abundant rash appeared on the face first then spread over the whole body quite minute details are given the state of the tongue the state of the rash and the condition of the eyes by the ninth and tenth days the rash had disappeared the notes are continued until the thirteenth day then follows a series of interrogations as to points in the case evidence of their friendship exists in the comments and annotations which sydenham has made in his own hand on some of locke's writings and the great interest which locke took in those of sydenham in the second edition of sydenham's methodes curandi febris there is inserted after the preface a latin poem of fifty-four lines signed j locke it was sydenham's purpose at a later date to write a separate work on smallpox and for this locke prepared in sixteen seventy a dedication and a preface neither of which was used they will be referred to later letters written by locke during his long residence in france contain frequent references to sydenham and frequent inquiries after his health particularly the letters to mapletoft who was a common friend he also consulted sydenham about lady northumberland's illness it was probably before leaving england that sydenham gave locke the advice in a letter the original of which is in the record office sydenham to locke your age ill habit of body and approach of winter concurring it comes to pass that the distemper you complain of yields not so soon to remedies as it would do under contrary circumstances however you may not in the least doubt but that a steady persisting in the use of the following directions grounded not on opinion but uninterrupted experience will at last effect your desired cure first therefore in order to the directing and subduing also the icarus matter twill be requisite to take your pills twice a week or for example every thursday and sunday about four o'clock in the morning and your clyster the intermitting days about six constantly till you are well in the next place forasmuch as there is wanting in bodies broken with business and dispirited upon the before mentioned accounts that stock of natural heat which should bring the matter quickly to digestion twill be highly necessary that you cherish yourself as much as possibly you can by going to bed very early at night even at eight o'clock which next to keeping bed that is impractical will contribute more to your relief than can be imagined as to diet all meals of easy digestion and that nourish well may be allowed provided they be not salt sweet or spiced and although excepting fruits roots and such like for wine a total forbearance thereof if it could possibly be and in its stead the use of very mild small beer such as our lesser houses do afford would as near as i could guess be most expedient for thereby your body would be kept cool and consequently all accidents proceeding from hot and strange humours grating upon the part kept off as to injections in your case these things dissuade the use of them first your more than ordinary both natural tenderness and delicacy of sense 
then the blood that has twice already been fetched by this operation which if we are not positively certain as how can we be that it proceeded not from the hurt of the instrument will if often repeated endanger the exoriating the part and making it liable to accidents besides they have been already used perhaps as often as is wont to be done and this is not a remedy to be long persisted in by the confession of everybody sure i am as i have over and over said to you and you know it to be true by my written observations which you have long since seen that i never use anywhere i am concerned alone there being no danger nor less certainty of a cure in the omitting and in relation to this business i have now asked myself the question that i would do and have resolved that i would let them alone this is all that i have to offer to you and i have to thought of it all circumstances relating to your case with the same intention of mind as if my life and my son's were concerned therein notwithstanding that by this way the cure is certainly to be effected yet nevertheless i fear that in ancient bodies especially in the debilitating part of the year some little kind of gleating or moisture but void of all malignity will now and then appear by reason of the weakness of the part and will scarce totally vanish till the return of the warm spring sydenham's chief merit is that he taught the profession to return to hippocratic methods of careful observation and study he and locke were kindred spirits in their manner of looking at the phenomena of disease and in their methods of work nothing could be more like sydenham's plan than that which locke urges upon his friend dr molyneux i perfectly agree with you concerning general theories the curse of the time and destructive not less of life than of science they are for the most part but a sort of waking dream with which when men have warmed their heads they pass into unquestionable truths this is beginning at the wrong end men laying the foundation in their own fancies and then suiting the phenomena of diseases and the cure of them to these fancies i wonder after the pattern dr sydenham has set of a better way men should return again to this romance way of physic but i see it is more easy and more natural for men to build castles in the air of their own than to survey well those that are on the ground nicely to observe the history of diseases in all their changes and circumstances is a work of time accurateness attention and judgment and wherein if men through prepossession or obstinacy mistake they may be convinced of their error by an erring nature and matter of fact what we know of the works of nature especially in the constitution of health and the operations of our own bodies is only by the sensible effects but not by any certainty we can have of the tools she uses or the ways she works by in another place he makes use of an apt illustration saying whether a certain course in public or private affairs will succeed well whether rhubarb will purge or quinquina cure an ague can be known only by experience locke in one place gives an excellent estimate of sydenham volume two page three forty three fox burn i hope the age has many who will follow his example and by the way of accurate practical observation which he has so happily begun enlarge the history of diseases and improve the art of physic and not by speculative hypotheses fill the world with useless though pleasing visions locke's personal intercourse with sydenham came to an end in sixteen eighty three and sydenham's death in sixteen eighty nine terminated a friendship of twenty years which as fox burn remarks if it may have done much towards inclining the greatest of english philosophers to pursue his early studies in physic cannot but have also had a considerable effect in quickening the philosophical temper of the greatest of english physicians with Boyle, also, Locke's relation seems to have been very intimate from the days when at Oxford he was a member of the Invisible College. 
Boyle was intensely interested in medicine, and was perhaps the best amateur student the profession has ever had. There is no work from which one can gain a better idea of the state of medicine about the middle of the seventeenth century than the experimental philosophy, the second part of which is a review of the state of medicine, with many suggestions for its improvement. In 1683, Boyle dedicated his Memoirs for the Natural History of the Human Blood to the very ingenious and learned Dr. J. L., at whose request he had undertaken the work. 3. Locke's Medical Remains Locke's Medical Remains consist of 1. The record of certain remarkable and historic cases, 2. A group of medical essays, and 3. Certain journals and commonplace books which contain memoranda and notes of cases. Of the notable medical cases to deserve full consideration, the hydatids of the liver in Lord Shaftesbury, and the tic douleureux in Lady Northumberland. Lord Shaftesbury's case. The case of superating hydatid cyst of the liver is given with unusual fullness and accuracy. I do not remember in seventeenth century literature a more accurately reported case. It is one of the first instances of operation on hydatid cyst. The consultation on draining of the abscess and the discussion on the propriety of wearing the silver tube give us a unique symposium of medical opinion among the leading consultants of the day. And lastly, Shaftesbury's tap, as the silver tube was called, has an interest in the satirical literature of the day. No single circumstance better illustrates John Locke as a physician than the elaborate details which he has left on record of his most celebrated patient, the first Lord Shaftesbury. This remarkable man is satirized by Dryden in the well-known lines, Of these the false Achitophel was first, a name to all succeeding ages cursed. For close designs and crooked counsels fit, sagacious bold and turbulent of wit restless unfixed in principles and place in power unpleased impatient of disgrace a fiery soul which working out its way fretted the pygmy body to decay and o'er informed the tenement of clay fox burn commenting on the physical description of lord shaftesbury given by dryden as a pygmy body states that this must have been used by poetic license as he was reckoned a handsome man in his day in the fragment of an autobiography there is an account of remarkable attacks of abdominal pain when shaftesbury was only eighteen years of age at the hunting I was taken with one of my usual fits, which for diverse years had hardly missed me one day, which lasted for an hour, betwixt eleven and one, sometimes beginning earlier and sometimes later betwixt those times. It was a violent pain of my left side that I was often forced to lie down wherever I was. At last it forced a working in my stomach, and I put up some spoonfuls of clear water, and I was well, if I may call that so, when I was never without a dull aching pain of that side. Yet this never abated the cheerfulness of my temper, but when, in the greatest fits, I hated pitying, and loved merry company, and as they told me was myself very pleasant when the drops fell from my face for pain but then my servant near me always desired they would not take notice of it but continue their diversions which was more acceptable to me and i had always the women and young people about me at those times who thought me acceptable to them and peradventure the more admired me because they saw the visible symptoms of my pain which caused in others so contrary an effect though the special malady which brought locke and shaftesbury into the relations of physician and patient has an extraordinarily full history the statements with reference to it in the authorities are somewhat meagre fox burn says life volume one page one ninety seven 
but it would seem that lord ashley being himself in bad health and suffering from a malady that no physician could explain and that was every day becoming more painful and having moreover formed a very high opinion of the mental and moral worth of his new friend persuaded locke to reside with him as physician to his family then again volume one page two hundred the internal malady from which lord ashley had been suffering ever since sixteen sixty one and which had been the accidental ground of his acquaintance with locke in sixteen sixty six now caused him great agony and in spite of all locke's efforts to alleviate it by medicinal treatment threatened to kill him my lord ashley is like to die wrote pepys on the nineteenth of june sixteen sixty eight having some imposthume in his breast that he hath been fain to cut into his body that operation was performed and ashley's life was saved by locke it is often referred to as an abscess of the side or as an impaima and is spoken of as following an accident in the record office there are four transcripts of the case in locke's handwriting the most complete is in latin of which the following is a translation the case of the most noble lord anthony ashley baron of winburne st giles and so forth this most noble lord aged forty-five of very slight build and delicate constitution had been an invalid for many years and was exceedingly subject upon the slightest cause to a recurrent yellow jaundice there was a painless internal tumour broad and slightly projecting about the anterior region of the liver and his hypochondria was very apparent to the touch although it had been observed twelve years before the exact time when the tumour first began is uncertain for since the colour of the skin was unchanged and no swelling was apparent externally unless the hand were applied it easily escaped the eye nor through the whole twelve years did it seem to change in the least the doctors called in to consultation on this point amongst whom were some from the excellent london college were inclined to the opinion that this firm and unchanging extuberance was not a morbid tumour but rather some congenital and unusual malformation of the liver however the patient himself suspects not without reason that the tumour first came into existence in the year sixteen fifty six especially as at that time he used to fatigue himself over much by too frequent over exercise his blood became so heated that his skin would immediately be suffused with a deep redness and his whole body seemed to be inflamed all which gave rise to a burning fever from this time on he was conscious of a complete change in the general condition of his body whereas before he was troubled more frequently with pains in the left side and other splenic symptoms from now on he escaped absolutely free from these troubles and in their place acquired a constitution prone to other disorders and especially susceptible to morbus regius footnote jaundice in footnote from the prolonged languor brought on by this disease when his emaciated body and impaired strength would threaten death he was frequently restored by the timely use of acidulae by means of which he obtained relief for one or two years and was carried through so many vicissitudes of health scarcely escaping with his life until last summer then happily an internal abscess at last broke out bringing to a head the source of so many disorders there is one thing here which i cannot pass by and that is that the patient's head never once ached though more than fatigued by disease this however is not the only marvel displayed by that head during a bad night about the end of may sixteen sixty eight he was suddenly seized with excessive vomiting accompanied by much disturbance everything he had eaten in the preceding meal was rejected still raw and undigested in repeated vomitings he was purged next day by dr glisson the learned physician in ordinary on the following morning he appeared discoloured a rusty red which the physician tried to remedy with suitable drugs 
but although the face seemed to return a little to its proper appearance so that he could go about the ordinary duties of life nevertheless the languor and loss of appetite returned anti-icterics and chalybeates being administered in vain moreover about the beginning of june since all the symptoms were running from bad to worse the physician prescribed a purging pill to be taken at bedtime when the patient raised himself up in bed to pass his urine about midnight he was suddenly seized about the region of the stomach and liver with a most acute pain which lasted the greater part of an hour and was finally relieved by resting comfortably in bed when after an hour or two he again sat up in bed the same excruciating pain returned again one hour afterwards he got up and in the same way when he raised himself upon his buttocks the pain attacked him for the third time and after a like interval left him next morning at eight o'clock shortly after taking a purging potion he vomited it up mixed with viscid phlegm after a while he left his bed his servants taking him in their arms and placing him upright on his feet so that his body should nowhere be bent the cathartic had a satisfactory effect and he was purged however though he turned his body he did not dare bend it lest the severe pain should come on again in the evening he began to suffer most acute pain in the back about the loins this ceased after a quarter of an hour and at the same there suddenly sprung up below the insiform cartilage a soft tumour the size of an ostrich egg it was yielding to the touch but on being compressed it did not for a moment retain any traces of the fingers the skin was a brown colour there was hardly any pain and no inflammation this tumour could not be broken up by the drugs which were administered for six or seven days then physicians and surgeons were called into consultation and on june twelfth it was opened by the application of cautery this fact is worthy of observation before the opening of the tumour a somewhat tenacious and flexible plaster fastened itself so firmly to the skin at the border of the tumour that it could not be torn away without leaving behind a large part of its substance while on the other hand the top of the tumour about the width of an english half-crown or more was not even discoloured by it nor was the plaster at all adherent in that part End of chapter 5, part 1 Chapter 5 John Locke as a Physician Part 2 Reader's Note Here follow five pages of daily minute observations of Lord Shaftesbury. These extremely repetitious notes are omitted in this reading. End Note from the long-standing character of the tumour and the character of the material which escaped the innumerable bags there can be no doubt that the disease was hydatids of the liver which remaining quiescent from sixteen fifty six had as is so often the case superated it is one of the first instances on record in which the abscess was opened the use of the sympathetic powder on the tenth eleventh and twelfth shows how strongly popular feeling had affected the profession naturally from the prominent position of the patient and the strange character of the disease the case attracted unusual attention the point that concerned lord shaftesbury himself most acutely was whether it was better to remove the silver drainage tube or to keep it in to get the opinion of the faculty on the subject he sent, with Locke's assistance, a circular letter containing the following questions. 1. Which is most advisable to resolve to keep it constantly open, or to heal it up as soon as conveniently may be? 2. Whether, if it be healed up at all, one of these two dangers is not like to follow, either a new collection of matter, the imposthume lying below the orifice by which it vents itself, or a fever upon stopping of so considerable an issue. 3. Whether if it be to be healed up at all, be not necessary to keep it open as long as any flux of matter comes through the pipe more than would be from an issue of the depth and bigness of the pipe. 
four whether the pipe that is now in be not of the fittest length and bigness to be worn constantly to keep it open five whether whilst it is best open it be not best to dress it but once in two days especially in cold weather six whether whilst it is best open to be convenient to use any injection how often and what sort and what purpose seven whether if it be kept long open it will be in danger of growing in a worse condition than a simple issue of that depth either by turning to a foul ulcer or a fistula or any other way and if there be any such danger how to be prevented eight whether the bare keeping in a silver pipe will without pain keep it open as long as one pleases nine whether i may travel in a coach ride on horseback boat or use any such exercise safely with a pipe in of this length ten whether if it be kept long open nature will not in time so fortify the parts about the end of the pipe as to make the danger it may bring by rubbing upon them in any exercise very little or none at all eleven whether during the time it is kept open frequent purging be necessary and how often twelve whether if it should be kept always open it is not to be feared that a constant flux of matter from it especially if it should continue to be of any considerable quantity may very much weaken and emaciate the body and how to be prevented handwriting not locks to this circular there are among the shaftesbury papers the replies of locke of sydenham of glisson of sir george ent of micklethwaite of timothy clark and of the abbe beaupreur of angers an eminent french physician with the exception of clark who urged that the issue should be healed the opinions agree in the main they are too long to quote at length but those of locke and sydenham are of sufficient historical interest to be given readers note here follow extended discussions by locke and sydenham of the case which are here omitted also omitted are descriptions of the case of lady northumberland and going on to chapter number four end note four medical writings these consist of fragmentary papers the chief interest of which to-day is that they are from the pen of the great philosopher they are among the shaftesbury papers in the record office and i have had them copied with a view to subsequent publication they are a ars medica or de arte medica an introduction to a treatise on the philosophy of medicine one cannot read the fragment without feelings of deep regret that the design was not carried out the scope of the intended work may be gathered from the following summary but not to expatiate into the large field of natural philosophy where perhaps the foundation of the mischief was first laid i shall according to my design confine myself at present to that branch of it which immediately concerns the health of men and in physic shall consider one the present state of the faculty of medicine as it now stands in reference to diseases and their cure two the several degrees and steps whereby it grew to that height it is at present arrived to which i suppose are these following one experience two method founded upon philosophy and hypothesis three botanics four chemistry five anatomy in which i shall endeavour to show how much each hath contributed to the advancing the art of physic and wherein they came short of perfecting it three what yet may be further done towards the more speedy and certain cure of diseases i e by what means and method the practice of physic may be brought nearer to perfection b anatomia a longer paper in which locke contends that nature performs all her operations in the body by parts so minute and insensible that i think nobody will ever hope or pretend even by the assistance of glasses or other inventions to come to a sight of them from the gross parts he thinks not much can be learned we see not the tools and contrivances by which nature works though we cut into the inside we see but the outside of things and make not a few superficies for ourselves to stare at 
the paper is a forcible statement against the hope that anatomy can ever show the true essential causes of disease it is quite possible that the article was prepared at sydenham's suggestion or for his use as at the top of the page in sydenham's handwriting is the sentence others of them have more pomposity and speciously prosecuted the promoting of this art by searching into the bowels of dead and living creatures as well sound as diseased to find out the seeds of discharging them but with how little success such endeavours have been or are likely to be attended i shall here in some measure make appear c respirationis usus a short paper on the subject d tussis an essay on coughs in which subject locke took a personal interest here again is evidence of sydenham's hand in a brief marginal note on cures done by writing in consumption and morbi obscura e a dedication and preface to a proposed work on smallpox by sydenham from the outset of their friendship locke took a deep interest in the writings of sydenham and as i have mentioned he contributed a latin poem in praise of him and of his methods to the second edition of the methodus curande febres sixteen sixty eight it would appear that about sixteen seventy sydenham contemplated writing a separate work on smallpox in the treatment of which he had had great success but the physicians were at first very hostile to his new plan among the shaftesbury papers are a dedication and a preface written by locke sydenham had shared with his friend the professional care of the family of lord ashley and had tried with happy results his cooling regimen in cases of smallpox in the dedication he or rather locke says at least my lord i thought it reasonable to let you see that i had practised nothing in your family but what i durst own and publish to the world and let my countrymen see that i tell them nothing here but what i have already tried with no ill success on several in the family of one of the greatest and most eminent personages amongst them the preface is a sharp and stout defence of the new method in which locke does not spare the colleagues of his friend how much some of my own faculty have fomented and increased these reports they themselves know and with what design i leave it to their own consciences to tell them only they must give me leave to say it would have become them out of common charity as good men as well as out of an obligation to improve their art and save men's lives as physicians upon the first intimation of an unusual method of curing so common a disease as this is to have inquired more particularly of the way observed the circumstances and informed themselves of the events before they cried it down as dangerous and fatal and frighted all that came within their reach from an inquiry into or trial of this method by the abhorrency they had given them against so bold and hazardous a practice evidently sydenham smarted under the calumnies and misrepresentations and the preface speaks of the greatest indignities beyond almost the sufferance of a man and the endangering not only of my reputation and livelihood but even of my life itself the article is chiefly valuable from the account which it gives of the steps by which sydenham was led to adopt his cooling treatment neither dedication nor preface was ever used the projected work did not appear and many years later the observationes medicae which contained his matured experiences was dedicated to mapletoff and another preface was used five journals letters and commonplace books a keen observer a constant note-taker and of most neat and accurate literary habits locke has left a large mass of manuscript which has been carefully searched and sifted by mr fox burn in whose life as well as in that by lord king there are many letters and extracts illustrating his work as a physician the letters to mapletoff about lady northumberland have been referred to of the journals those of his holland sojourn which are said by fox burns to contain much of medical interest i have not yet seen in the british museum is a very characteristic journal in which one may follow locke's medical work for the year sixteen seventy nine 
it is bound with an ephemeris or calendar of the year he was in paris during the early months as usual he was interested in bills of mortality and he states january sixteen that the deaths in paris were from nineteen thousand to twenty thousand a year he makes a note to ask if the deaths of quakers anabaptists and jews are recorded in london on april twelve he comments on the handbill set up about town with a receipt to kill lice there are many notes on the treatment of diseases and receipts to the collection of which he seemed very partial he queries whether the sympathetic powder could be of any use in dentium dolor indicating that he still had a lingering belief in it there are many notes on various topics and memoranda about books and so forth on may eighth he sailed from calais on june four are brief notes of a mr n sick of a fever whom he bled and afterwards jaundice appeared notes on vomiting diseases of the eye icterus hernia hysteria hypochondria rheumatism mania and tussis occur in june on august eighteen he was sent for in consultation in the case of mr beavis of olenley kent and for the next six weeks the journal is very full containing a detailed account of the symptoms of mr beavis and the treatment many notes on the practice of dr jacob the attending physician and a characteristic description of two attacks of fever with which he was himself attacked mr beavis had a long illness possibly typhoid fever and it was not until the end of september that locke left for london the bodleian commonplace book with the anecdota sidnami this is a small folio bound in parchment which originally contained four hundred pages of which two hundred and forty-eight are torn out dr w g greenhill published a part of the manuscript in eighteen forty five as anecdota sid nama and the following extracts from the preface may be quoted they are taken from a manuscript in the bodleian library at oxford rawl c four o six very neatly and for the most part very legibly written apparently about the end of the seventeenth century the name of the writer is not mentioned nor is anything known of the history of the manuscript except that it once belonged to dr richard rawlinson and forms part of the collection of manuscripts bequeathed by him to the university of oxford about the middle of the last century at the beginning of the volume of which about two-thirds have been torn away are these words extracts of sydenham's physic books and some good letters on various subjects this is the whole of the external evidence respecting the genuineness of the following anecdota and perhaps if there were nothing more to say in their favour it might be doubted how far the editor was justified in giving them to the world under the sanction of the name of sydenham the internal evidence however is much more conclusive and indeed to his own mind perfectly satisfactory the writer professes to have been acquainted with sydenham himself and to have originally written the following notes partly from his dictation in the years sixteen eighty two eighty three and partly from some of his manuscripts written chiefly in sixteen seventy these notes he appears to have revised and written out correctly in their present form after sixteen eighty five as he refers to the edition of sydenham's work published in that year and if the editor's conjecture at page sixty nine be correct before sixteen ninety two as that is the date of the first edition of the processus integri apparently it was not until mr fox Byrne examined the manuscript that it was recognized as belonging to locke whose handwriting is most distinctive while largely made up of extracts from dr sydenham's physic books the excerpta ex ore sydenhami dated sixteen eighty two three show the maintenance at this date of an intimate professional relationship between the two great men the other medical papers in the volume illustrate the wide scope of locke's inquiries there are statements about the peruvian bark and the best methods of its preparation but the chief interest after the sydenham notes relates to a sort of collective investigation which locke instituted on public health he seems to have a deep conviction that much good would follow a careful study of the bills of mortality his circular letter contains the following inquiries manuscript page sixty eight one 
what bills of mortality are kept in foreign countries either as to the diseases of which persons die or the number who die weekly or yearly in the most capital cities or towns of europe or other parts of the world as paris madrid amsterdam venice hamburg rome constantinople smyrna dublin edinburgh and so forth as also in new england barbados jamaica and other plantations two the air of different countries with the temper and alteration of the same at the different seasons of the year and the diseases those countries are subject to and the time when three the opinion physicians have of jesuit bark and the best account they can give of it four the esteem which physicians have had of dr sydenham and his works five the order observed in foreign countries as to physicians surgeons apothecaries and herbalists for the improvement of travellers and young students there are answers from several correspondents dr willoughby of dublin april seventeenth sixteen ninety one gives a tabular account of the bills of mortality between sixteen eighty two and ninety inclusive and a description of the air of the country he speaks of the peruvian bark as the only specific i know in nature of dr sydenham he says he has been very honest in rescinding from physic all the unnecessary pomp of alteratives and preparatives and reducing it to the use of the grand remedies which in physic do justly fill both sides of the loaf in another place is an account of dr willoughby's proposal for the improvement of agriculture in ireland the important part of which was that every proprietor who will not improve his wasteland shall make over four-fifths of it to the crown there is a brief statement of the amsterdam bills of sixteen ninety one and sixteen ninety three and an account of dr bett's proposal to the lord mayor for the improvement of the returns in london there are letters from james young of plymouth about various diseases and one from dr eales giving an account of dr morton's books in which he has improved the hints of our good friend the great dr sydenham admirably well dr patrick dunn sends a full statement about the mortality bills of dublin and pages ninety three to six of the manuscript contain in extenso the death rates from january sixteen ninety five to april sixteen ninety eight pages one ten three fifty seven are torn out but from the index pages three sixty nine to seventy one we can glean the contents of the missing leaves books whose authors are unknown books to be wrote and books wrote in defence of the murder of king charles i with a long list of the authors and about the icon basilic and the various controversies upon it extending from pages one ninety nine to two thirty six though qualified and deeply interested in both the science and the art of medicine locke never became as fox burns says in any orderly way a physician until he left england in sixteen eighty three he was still waiting for an opportunity of devoting himself steadily to his favourite occupation he was still generally spoken of by his friends as dr locke and he still regarded himself as before everything else a doctor hereafter questions of philosophy finance education trade theology and so forth occupied his busy life but through it all and to the very end there are references in his letters and journals to show that his first love was not forgotten in the memorable and oft-quoted letter to dr thomas molyneux in praise of sydenham's method january twenty sixteen ninety two three he speaks of himself as one who wishes well to the practice of physic though he meddles not with it yet in the same year we find him prescribing for a friend's wife in sixteen ninety four he is corresponding with dr hans sloane on medical matters in january sixteen ninety seven eight king william consulted him believing that they suffered from similar diseases in seventeen o one he writes again to sloane about a patient with an obstinate fever and in the following year he gives very wise advice to his old friend lambork who was ill evidently locke's clear strong judgment was valued by his friends in all relations of life and as summers and other politicians turned to him for instruction in questions of trade and finance so his friends and others insisted upon utilizing his medical knowledge 
Sydenham, Boyle, Thomas, Mapletoft, and Molyneux had been his intimate associates. In Montpellier, in Paris, and in Holland, he had been a welcome guest in medical circles, and in London we have met him in consultation with the most eminent practitioners of the day upon a most important case, and handing in a written opinion as their colleague and equal. For each one of us there is still a touch divine in the life and writings of John Locke, a singularly attractive personality with a sweet reasonableness of temper and a charming freedom from flaws and defects of character he is an author whom we like at the first acquaintance and soon love as a friend perhaps the greatest certainly as professor fowler says the most characteristic english philosopher we may claim dr locke as a bright ornament of our profession not so much for what he did in it as for the methods which he inculcated and the influence which he exercised upon the english hippocrates he has a higher claim as a really great benefactor of humanity one of the few who reflected the human spirit always on the nobler side one of locke's earliest writings was a translation for lady shaftesbury of pierre nicole's essays in one of which on the way of preserving peace with men locke seems to have found a rule of life which i commend to you live the best life you can but live it so as not to give needless offence to others do all you can to avoid the vices follies and weaknesses of your neighbours but take no needless offence at their divergences from your ideal fox born end of chapter five part two chapter six elisha bartlett a rhode island philosopher Part one. Rhode Island can boast of but one great philosopher, one to whose flights in the Empyrean neither Roger Williams nor any of her sons could soar, the immortal Berkeley, who was a transient guest in this state, waiting quietly and happily for the realization of his utopian schemes. Still, he lived long enough in Rhode Island to make his name part of her history long enough in america to make her the inspiration of his celebrated lines on the course of empire elisha bartlett teacher philosopher author of whom i am about to speak whom you may claim as the most distinguished physician of this state has left no deep impression on your local history or institutions here he was born and educated and to this his home he returned to die but his busy life was spent in other fields where today his memory is cherished more warmly than in the land of his birth. 1. Born at Smithfield in 1804, Bartlett was singularly fortunate in his parents, who were members of the Society of Friends, strong, earnest souls, well endowed with graces of the head and of the heart. The gentle life, the zeal for practical righteousness, and the simplicity of the faith of the followers of Fox put a hallmark on the sensitive youth which the rough usage of the world never obliterated. No account of Bartlett's early life and school days exists, an index that they were happy and peaceful. We may read in his poem called An Allegory certain autobiographical details transferring the meadow and field and forest dale and hill orchards green hedgerows gardens stately trees from the old england which he describes to the banks of narangasat bay paraphrasing other parts of the poem we may say that auspicious stars shone over his cradle with the kindliest light and promise and amid the genial air of a new england home goodness truth and beauty were his portion he tells of the wonder and delight stirred in his young soul by the thousand tales of fairies and genii giants dwarfs and that redoubtable and valiant jack who slew the giants then as the days lengthened he came under the spell of the arabian nights and of robinson crusoe looking back in after years he compared this hearty wholesome life to some bounteous spring that wells up from the deep heart of the earth 
Addison, Goldsmith, and Washington Irving filled his soul with freshness, like the dawn, and led by love and kindness ran the hours their merry round till boyhood passed away. In the ruder discipline and strife of school and college he grew to manhood with, as he expressed it, a fine free healthfulness, and with faculties self-poised and balanced at smithfield at uxbridge and at a well-known friends institution in new york bartlett obtained a very thorough preliminary education details of his medical course are not at hand but we know that after studying with dr willard of uxbridge doctors green and haywood of worcester and dr levi wheaton of providence and attending medical lectures at boston and at providence he took his doctor's degree at brown university in eighteen twenty six a year before the untimely end of the medical department in june eighteen twenty six bartlett sailed for europe and the letters to his sisters which with other bartlett papers have been kindly sent me by his nephew the hon willard bartlett of the new york court of appeals give a delightful account of his year as a student abroad he remained in paris until december then in company with his fellow student dr southwick he visited the chief cities of italy returning to paris early in march the month of may eighteen twenty seven was spent in london and he sailed from liverpool june eighth unfortunately the letters to his sisters contain very few references to his medical studies but i have extracted a few memoranda from them writing august twenty four eighteen twenty six he says the celebrated lanik died at his country residence on the thirteenth of the present month the publication in eighteen nineteen of a new method of ascertaining diseases of the chest forms an era in the history of medicine m lanik fell a victim to one of those diseases the investigation of which by himself has enriched the field of science contributed to the alleviation of human suffering and given his own name a high rank among the great and good men of his age he asked that this memorandum should appear in the providence papers writing september fourth he speaks of attending every day at the jardin des Prens to hear the lectures of Cloquet at Cuvier. One of the professors at the medical school, he says, looked more like a jolly stage driver or a good-natured blustering butcher than anything else. He lectures sometimes standing and sometimes leaning against a post or straddling over a high stool, flourishing a lancet in one hand and a snuff-box in the other, on the contents of which he is continually laying the most inordinate contributions. He wears during the time an old rusty-looking black cap. The familiarity of the distinguished surgeons and physicians with their students struck me at first sight very forcibly, being in such perfect contrast to the proud port and haughty carriage of some of our New England professors. I wish they might step into the Hôtel Dieu and La Charité and take a lesson or two of Boyer and Depuis-Trin, barons of the empire, and two of the most distinguished surgeons of the world. In the letter of October 10th, he says, The public lectures open this week, and we are continually engaged from half-past six in the morning till bedtime. Visits are made at all the hospitals by candlelight, and a lecture delivered at most of them immediately after the visit. He speaks of attending the lectures of Geoffrey St. Lare, who, he says, lectures very badly. His gestures, though he is a Frenchman, are exceedingly awkward, and he has a sing-song tone like that which one often hears in a Methodist or Quaker preacher. Like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Bartlett probably acquired in Paris three principles. Not to take authority when I can have facts, not to guess when I can know, not to think a man must take physic because he is sick. Strangely enough, I find no reference in these Paris letters to the man of all others who influenced Bartlett most deeply. In Louis, even more than in Lenech, 
the young american students of that day found light and leading the numerical method based on a painstaking study of all the phenomena of disease in the wards and in the dead house appealed with peculiar force to their practical minds and louise's brilliant observations on phthisis and on fevers constituted as bartlett remarked a new and great era in the history of medical science I cannot find any definite statement of Bartlett's relations with Louis in 1826-7, at which period the latter was still working quietly at La Clarité. His monograph on Thesis had been published in 1825, and had at once given him a reputation as one of the great lights of the French school. He was at this time very busy collecting material for his still more important work on typhoid fever, and it is scarcely possible that Bartlett could have frequented La Charité without meeting the grave, unobtrusive student who, with notebook in hand, literally lived in the wards and in the dead house. Secluded from the world, living as a voluntary assistant to Chamel in this quiet haven of observation, apart from the turbid seas of speculation which surged outside, Louis for seven years pursued his remarkable career. Whether or not Bartlett came into personal contact with him at this time, I do not know. But, however this may be, subsequently the great French clinician became his model and his master, and to him he dedicated his first edition of the fevers and his essay in the philosophy of medical science. For a young man of twenty-two, these letters, written offhand, show an unusually good literary style, and many incidental references indicate that he had received a general education much above the average. The strong Christian spirit which he felt all through life is already manifest, as may be gleaned from one or two expressions in the letters. Writing on September 4, 1826, to his sisters, he refers to the death of a dear friend and her little sister. There is a cheering consolation in the reflection that of such is the kingdom of heaven, and that their spirits have gone in perfect and sinless purity to their home of bliss, and we may believe that they in their turn have become guardian angels to those who cherished and protected them here. They were their guardian angels here, they guardian angels now to them. In 1827, shortly after completing his twenty-third year, Bartlett settled at Lowell, then a town of only 3,500 inhabitants, but growing rapidly owing to the establishment of numerous mills. This was his home for nearly twenty years, and to it, and later to Woonsocket, he returned in the intervals between his college work in different sections of the country. As Dr. D. C. Patterson remarks, he became at once the universal favorite, and began to take a deep interest in the physical welfare of the townsmen. In 1828 he delivered lectures before the Lowell Lyceum on contagious diseases, and he gave frequent popular lectures on sanitation and hygiene. In 1828 he was the orator on the 4th of July. In 1836 he delivered a course of popular lectures on physiology. Evidently, Bartlett had a grace of favor in a remarkable degree. Bishop Clark pictures him in those days in the following words. Some twenty-five years ago I used to meet a young man in the town of Lowell, whose presence carried sunshine wherever he went, whose tenderness and skill relieved the darkness of many a chamber of sickness, and whom all the community were fast learning to love and honor. Life lay before him, full of promise, the delicate temper of his soul fitting him to the most exquisite enjoyment of all the pure delights of nature, and his cheerful temperament giving a genial and generous glow to the refined circles of which he was one of the chiefest ornaments. When only thirty-two, before he had been in Lowell ten years, he was elected by a respectable majority as the first mayor of the city, and he was re-elected the following year. A letter from the Honorable Caleb Cushing, dated April 20, 1841, gives us an idea of the estimate which a clear-headed layman placed upon him. 
Dr. Bartlett enjoys in the city of Lowell the unqualified respect of that community and its affectionate esteem. Respect and esteem do alike to his public relations to that city, as formerly its popular and useful chief magistrate, and at all times one of its most patriotic and valued citizens. To his unblemished integrity of character and amenity of deportment, to his eminence in his profession, to the endearments of private friendship, and in general to his talents, accomplishments, manners, and principles. To two interesting episodes in his life at Lowell I may refer at greater length. The rapid growth of the industries in Lowell had brought in from the surrounding country a very large number of young girls as operatives in the mills, and their physical and moral condition had been seriously impugned by writers in certain leading Boston papers. These charges were investigated in a most thorough way by Bartlett, who published in the Lowell Courier in 1839 and republished in pamphlet form, 1841, his well-known Vindication of the Character and Condition of the Females Employed in the Lowell Mills. This very strong paper, based on careful personal investigation, really proved to be what the title indicated. It did not, however, escape adverse criticism, and among the Bartlett papers there is a review of the vindication by a citizen of Lowell in 1842, which presents the other side of a picture, by no means a pleasant one, of the prolonged hours of the operatives and their wretched life in boarding-houses one of the most interesting incidents of his life at this period was the reception to dickens whose visit to lowell occurred during dr bartlett's mayority in the american notes dickens speaks of the girls as healthy in appearance many of them remarkably so and had the manners and deportment of young women not of degraded brutes of burden oliver wendell holmes says referring to this occasion I have been told a distinguished foreign visitor, Charles Dickens, who went through the whole length and breadth of the land, said that of all the many welcomes he received from statesmen renowned as orators, from men whose profession is eloquence, not one was so impressive and felicitous as that which was spoken by Dr. Bartlett, the mayor of Lowell, our brother in the silent profession, which he graced with these unwanted accomplishments. In 1840 he was elected to the legislature of the state of Massachusetts and served two terms. In 1845 he was nominated by the governor a member of the Board of Education of the state in the place of Jared Sparks. Holmes, who was familiar with Bartlett in this period of his career, has left on record the following charming description. It is easy to recall his ever welcome and gracious presence on his expanded forehead no one could fail to trace the impress of a large and calm intelligence in his most open and beaming smile none could help feeling the warmth of a heart which was the seat of all generous and kindly affections when he spoke his tones were of singular softness his thoughts came in chosen words scholar-like yet unpretending often playful always full of lively expressions, giving the idea of one that could be dangerously keen in his judgments had he not kept his fastidiousness to himself and his charity to sheath the weakness of others. In familiar intercourse, and the writer of these paragraphs was once under the same roof with him for some months, no one could be more companionable and winning in all his ways the little trials of life he took kindly and cheerily turning into pleasantry the petty inconveniences which a less thoroughly good-natured man would have fretted over two for many years there was in this country a group of peripatetic teachers who went from town to town like the sophists of greece staying a year or two in each or divided their time between a winter session in a large city school and a summer term in a small country one among them daniel drake takes the precedence as he made eleven moves in the course of his stirring and eventful life bartlett comes an easy second having taught in nine schools dunglison t r beck willard parker alonzo clark the elder gross austin flint 
Frank H. Hamilton, and many others whom I could name, belonged to this group of wandering professors. The medical education of the day was almost exclusively theoretical. The teachers lectured for a short four-month session, there was a little dissection, a few major operations were witnessed, the fees were paid, examinations were held, and all was over. No wonder, under such conditions, that many of the most flourishing schools were found amid sylvan groves in small country towns. In New England there were five such schools, and in the state of New York the well-known schools at Fairfield and at Geneva. As there was not enough practice in the small places to go around, the teachers for the most part stayed only for the session, at the end of which it was not unusual for the major part of the faculty with the students to migrate to another institution, where the lectures were repeated and the class graduated. T. R. Beck's introductory lecture in 1824 at Fairfield on the utility of country medical institutions pictures in glowing terms their advantages. One sentence brought to my mind the picture of a fine old doctor on the Niagara Peninsula, a graduate of Fairfield, who possibly may have listened to this very address. Dr. Beck asks, What is the clinical instruction of the country student? It is this, after attending a course of lectures on the several branches of medicine and becoming acquainted with their general bearing, he, during the summer, repairs to the office of a practitioner, attends him in his visits to his patients, views the diseases peculiar to the different districts, observes the treatment that situation or habits of life indicate, and from day to day verifies the lessons he has received. Here, then, is a direct preparation for the life he intends to pursue. And I may say that it was just this training that made of my old friend one of the best general practitioners it has ever been my pleasure to know. In the letters we can follow Bartlett's wanderings during the next twenty years, from the time of his appointment to one of the smallest of the schools, to his final position as one of the chief ornaments of the leading school of New York. In 1832 he held his first teaching position, that of Professor of Pathological Anatomy and of Materia Medica, in the Berkshire Medical Institute at Pittsfield. The following is an extract from a letter to Dr. John Orne Green, dated Pittsfield, November 25, 1833. The character of the class is said to be superior even to that of last year. We have a large number of excellent students. Parker is as popular as ever, and Professor Childs has the credit of having improved very much in his manner of teaching. The members of the class are attentive to their studies, eager for knowledge, and regular in their attendance on the lectures. I have lectures most of the time twice a day, at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. I shall finish my course on Materia Medica by the middle of this week, and the remainder of my time will be occupied with lectures of medical jurisprudence and pathological anatomy. The commencement will be on Wednesday of week after next. He held the chair at Pittsfield for eight sessions. Among his colleagues were Childs, Dewey, and Willard Parker, who was a very special friend. In a letter of October 2nd, 1836, he says, Parker, with his sunny face and his hearty welcome, was in a few minutes after my arrival. It does one good to meet such men. In 1839 he was appointed to the chair of practice in Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire, the school founded by Nathan Smith in 1798. In a letter to his friend Green, dated September 8, he gives brief sketches of some of his colleagues, among them a delightful account of Oliver Wendell Holmes, then a young man of thirty. Dr. Holmes you know something of. As a teacher there is no doubt of his success, although he will not show himself during this his first course. He has his anatomy, some of it at least, to study as he goes on, and he has not yet got the whole hang of the lecture room. He does not give himself his whole swing. His attainments in medical science are extensive and accurate, and his intellectual endowments are extraordinary. His mind is quick as lightning and sharp as a razor. His conversational powers are absolutely wonderful. 
His most striking mental peculiarities consist in a power of comprehensive and philosophical generalization on all subjects, and in a fecundity of illustration that is inexhaustible. His talk at table is all spontaneous, unpremeditated, and he pours himself forth, words and thoughts, in a perfect torrent. His wit and humor are quite lost in the prodigal exuberance of his thoughts and language. In this same letter is the following characteristic memorandum illustrating his desire to see the schoolhouses beautified and adorned. One word about the high school house. Pray don't forget in the planning of the rooms my plan for some embellishments. Even if we should get some busts, I do not know that niches would be any better than suitable stands or shelves. I hope we shall raise, by a fair, from five hundred to one thousand dollars for pictures and so forth, for ornaments to the two principal rooms. It is quite possible that Bartlett lectured both at Woodstock and at Pittsfield, as the terms were purposely arranged so as not to clash, and in the catalogue of the Vermont Medical College, 1844, there is an advertisement of the Berkshire School. The names of Bartlett and Holmes occur only in the 1839-40 and 1840-41 announcements. In 1841 he accepted the chair of the theory and practice of medicine in the Transylvania University, Lexington, at that time the strongest and best equipped school in the West. On his way to Lexington he visited New York, Philadelphia, Washington, and Baltimore, and in a letter to Green of September 7, 1841, he gives an interesting account of the men he met in these cities. One item is of interest to Baltimoreans. Day before yesterday I spent with Dr. Nathan R. Smith at Baltimore on my return from Washington. I found him very attentive and hospitable. He took me into his gig and went to see some of his patients. He has a pretty large surgical practice and is, I should think, a man of excellent sound sense, industrious and devoted to his profession, not so great a man as his father, but a very capital good fellow. He speaks well of Lexington and the school, says it is the best appointed school in the country. In his letters there are interesting descriptions of his life in Lexington, some of which are worth quoting. In the school we are getting on very well. The class is of a good size, rather larger than last year, worth a little over $2,000, intelligent, attentive, well-behaved. I have given fifty-eight lectures, and we have just six weeks more. My own success has been good enough, I think. So far as I have means of judging, my instruction is entirely satisfactory, to say the least. My colleagues, Dudley, you know, is the great man here. He has many peculiarities. He is very much pleased with me. He teaches singular doctrines and follows in many things a practice very peculiar to himself. The other day he tied the common carotid before the class in an anastomosing aneurysm in the orbit, patient from St. Louis. Day before yesterday he cut for the stone, patient a lad from Mississippi. He has two more cases of stone here for operation. He is exceedingly cautious, sends many patients of all sorts away without operation uses the bandage for everything almost in surgery tart ant and starvation or low diet in most diseases he had a pretty large property a garden as he calls it of a hundred and fifty acres or so a mile from the city richardson and obstetrics boards with me a plain common sense man who fought a duel in early life with dudley has made a pretty large fortune here in practice and now lives in the country eight miles or so from here on a farm of five hundred acres the style of lecturing here is quite different from what it is in the east more emphatic more vehement it is quite necessary to fall somewhat into the popular style we stand in the lecture room on an open platform with only a little movable desk or table on which to lay our notes on the whole i like it better than being seated in a desk as they are in boston december twenty one eighteen forty one in march eighteen forty three he writes to green that his receipts for the session have been more than two thousand dollars 
there are a few good families who send for me and i get occasionally a consultation we never make a charge less than a dollar and consultation visits in ordinary cases the first visit are five dollars these few enable me situated as i am to make even a small and easy business somewhat profitable i have made one visit twenty-five miles distant for which the fee was twenty-five dollars and i saw a second patient at the same time incidentally for five dollars more you see from all this that my place gives me rather more money than i could earn in lowell for a much smaller amount of responsibility and labor i have hardly indeed been called out of bed during the winter in a business point of view i feel quite content with my situation from an interesting account of a consultation in the country we can gather how the planters of those days did their own doctoring colonel anderson belongs to a class of men pretty large i think in this state rather rough with a limited school education but intelligent shrewd clear-headed and enterprising he has a farm entirely away from any travelled road of five hundred acres but his principal business is that of bagging and soap manufacturing his farm serving only to feed his family this consists of about one hundred eighty or more of which are his negroes he has no physician whom he is willing to trust nearer than lexington and in nearly all common acute diseases treats the patient himself his daughter mrs breck was seized with acute pleurisy soon after miscarriage and her father had bled her twice pretty freely and given calomel and antimony before any physician had seen her he had followed the same course a year ago in the case of his wife february eighteen eighteen forty four in the same letter he says typhoid fever has been very widely prevalent in many parts of kentucky for the past year there were it is said two hundred deaths in an adjacent county last summer and fall it is evidently the common fever of this country with all the features so familiar to us at the east in the autumn of eighteen forty four he accepted the chair of the theory and practice of medicine at the university of maryland among the letters i find but one from baltimore and that is to oliver wendell holmes about a review of his book the philosophy of medical science which had appeared that year in eighteen forty four he accepted the chair of materia medica and obstetrics in the vermont medical college the session of which began in march and continued for thirteen weeks among his colleagues were alonzo clark palmer and edward m moore and later john c dalton bartlett's name occurs in the catalogues of the school until eighteen fifty four the year before his death in may eighteen forty five he and mrs bartlett sailed for europe in a letter to green july twelve there is an interesting reference to louis and james jackson jr i have seen a good deal of louis who has been very civil and attentive i dined with him soon after my arrival and met there amongst others louiset and grisol two of his most intimate medical friends i never see him that he does not speak of young jackson sir pauvre jackson as he calls him he told me with a great deal of feeling that jackson the last night that he spent in paris wrote him a letter from his hotel which was moistened with his tears and that he thought jackson was almost as much attached to him as to his father in another letter he speaks too of his very cordial reception by louis they spent the winter on the continent travelling about chiefly in italy and in the spring went to london in a letter dated june seventeen eighteen forty six there is an interesting sketch of a magnetic seance at the house of professor ellitson of university college who subsequently came to such grief over hypnotism and then he ran full tilt off upon his hobby animal magnetism calling it one of the most sacred and holy of all subjects one of the greatest truths and so on dr forbes the editor he spoke of as a wretch all because the doctor has shown up some of ellison's magnetic operations dr e afterwards invited me to see some magnetic phenomena at his house 
I went about three o'clock in the afternoon and found his spacious and elegant drawing-room quite filled with well-dressed gentlemen and ladies assembled for the same purpose. The doctor had two subjects, one a young delicate-looking girl, and the other a damsel of a certain age, upon whom he performed the standard and stereotyped experiments, putting them into the magnetic sleep, stiffening their limbs, leading them around the room with a common magnet, exciting their phrenological organs, and so on. I can only say that I was not specially delighted with Elliotson's manner, and that if I were to choose a man by whom I should swear, without using my own eyes, certainly it would not be him. In the same letter he speaks of having seen a great deal of Forbes, editor of the Medico-Chirurgical Review, of Marshall Hall of Walls, a young man and a good fellow, of Sir Henry Holland, and of that interesting American physician who lived so long in England, Dr. Boot, and of Dr. Southwood Smith at the Fever Hospital. On his return from Europe we find him, during the session of 1846-7, in his old chair at Lexington, whence he writes, on March 18, 1847, to his friend Green, from which a paragraph relating to the second edition of his book on fevers may be quoted, I have been drudging away all winter at my second edition. I do not feel any great interest in it, though I hope and intend to make a good book of it. The first edition for a monograph has sold very well, mostly at the South and West, so well at least that Lee and Blanchard propose publishing the second edition and paying also something for the right to do so. The sessions of 1847, 8, and 9 were spent at the Transylvania University. In the spring of 1848 there is a letter from Pliny Earle, dated April 16, saying that he had received a catalogue of the medical department of Transylvania University, from which he had received his first intimation of Bartlett's resignation of the professorship. He asked Bartlett's advice as to the propriety of applying for the position. On March 13, 1849, Bartlett received the appointment as Professor of the Theory and Practice of Medicine in the University of Louisville. At this time, in a letter from Dr. J. Cobb, we have the first intimation in the letters of ill health, as there is the sentence, Accept my best wishes for your complete restoration to health. The University of Louisville had drawn heavily upon the classes of the other western schools, chiefly at the expense of Lexington, and the faculty, when Bartlett joined it, was very strong, comprising such well-known men as the Elder Gross, the Elder Yandel, Rogers, Benjamin Silliman, Jr., and Palmer. The condition of medical politics at that time in the town of Louisville was not satisfactory. A new school had been started in opposition to the university, and among the Bartlett letters are a number from the elder Yandel which show a state of very high tension. Bartlett spent but one session in Louisville. He and Gross accepted chairs at the University of New York. The appointment of the former to the chair of the Institutes and Practice of Medicine is dated September 19, 1850. From some remarks in a letter from Yandel, it is evident that Bartlett did not find the position in New York very congenial. Gross found his still less so, and returned to Louisville the following year. J. W. Draper, the strong man of the university school, had secured Bartlett, and in a letter dated August 12, 1850, he promised him a salary of at least $3,500. The same letter shows how thoroughly private were the medical schools of that day. It perhaps may be proper to repeat what is the condition of the real estate. The college building is owned equally by the six professors. Its estimated value when Dr. Dixon left us in the spring was $78,600, and there is a mortgage upon it of $48,000, bearing interest of 6%. Excluding this mortgage, the share of each professor is therefore $5,000, and a mutual covenant exists among us that on the retirement or decease of one of the faculty, his investment shall be restored to him or his heirs, the newcomer starting in all respects in the position he occupied. 
during these years bartlett seems to have been very busy at work at the microscope and there is a letter from alonzo clark dated june fifteen eighteen forty eight descriptive of a fine new oberhauser the zeiss of that day and in eighteen fifty one there is an interesting letter from jeffreys wyman giving a list of the most important works on invertebrate zoology among his colleagues in the university were draper martin payne and granville sharp pattison things do not seem to have worked very smoothly in the spring of eighteen fifty one overtures were made to him from the college of physicians and surgeons of new york in which faculty were his warm friends alonzo clark and willard parker and he was elected to the chair of materia medica and medical jurisprudence in the following year eighteen fifty two here he lectured during the next two sessions until compelled by ill health to retire i may fittingly conclude this section of my address with a sentence from a sketch of bartlett's life by his friend elisha huntington never was the professor's chair more gracefully filled than by dr bartlett his urbane and courteous manners his native and simple eloquence his remarkable power of illustration the singular beauty and sweetness of his style all combined to render him one of the most popular and attractive of lecturers the driest and most barren subject under his touch became instinct with life and interest and the path in which the traveller looked to meet with briars and weeds only he was surprised and delighted to find strewn with flowers beautiful and fragrant there is a magic about the man you could not withstand a fascination you could not resist three bartlett began his career as a medical writer with the monthly journal of medical literature and american medical students gazette only three numbers of which were issued he says in the introductory address dated october fifteenth eighteen thirty one that there are plenty of practical journals of high character and extensive circulation but he wishes to see one devoted to medical history medical literature accounts of medical institutions and hospitals medical biography including sketches of the character lives and writings of the chief masters of our art and of all such as have in any way influenced its destinies and left the deep traces of their labors on its history to the medical student and the young practitioner to all those who aspire to any higher acquisitions than the knowledge that calomel purges and salivates and that tartarized antimony occasions vomiting who are not willing to rest supinely satisfied in a routine familiarity with doses and symptoms a familiarity which practice and habit render in the end almost mechanical we cannot but think these matters must be interesting and he adds the devotion of an occasional hour to such pursuits must have a tendency to enlarge and liberalize the mind it will help to keep alive and stimulate in the young medical scholar the sometimes flagging energies of study by calling his attention and directing his desires to high standards of acquisition and excellence it will urge him on towards their attainment delightful and fascinating in many respects as the study of his profession may be to him there are many hours which must be occupied with mental and bodily drudgery he must make what to others would be loathsomeness pleasure to himself amid the wear and tear the toil and fatigue of such pursuits he needs at times some intellectual recreation and stimulus and where can he find one pleasanter or more appropriate than in surveying the career and studying the characters of those who have trodden before him the same laborious path and who have followed it on to its high and bright consummation if our profession ever vindicates its legitimate claim to the appellation of liberal it must be cultivated with some other than the single aim of obtaining patience for the sole purpose of getting for services rendered an equivalent in fees in the first number there is a statement that on a future occasion the journal will give a detailed consideration of the character of the old physician of kos the venerable father of physic and of the reform which he effected in medical science 
a promise which was not fulfilled to the profession for many years as bartlett's well-known lecture on hippocrates the last indeed of his professional writings was not issued until eighteen fifty two the literature of science its philosophy its history the history of the lives and labors of the founders and cultivators these he believed it important for the student to cultivate among the articles in these three numbers there are some of special merit one signed s n on the claims of medicine to the character of certainty may have suggested to bartlett his well-known essay on the degree of certainty in medicine the enterprise was not a success, and, as Bartlett had said in his introductory address, of all weekly things we most heartily pity weekly periodicals. He had the good sense, after three numbers had been issued, to give up a publication which the profession did not sustain. In July 1832 he became associated with A. L. Pearson and J. B. Flint in a much more pretentious and important journal, The Medical Magazine, a monthly publication which continued for three years. It was a very well-conducted periodical with excellent original articles and strongly written editorials. John D. Fisher's original paper on the cephalic brain murmur occurs in volume two, and in the same one is an excellent paper by E. Hale, Jr., on the typhoid fever of this climate, which is of special interest as containing very accurate statements of the differences between the common New England autumnal fever and the typhus as described by Armstrong and Smith there are also reports of three autopsies giving an account of ulceration in the small intestine among the first to be published in this country there are in addition numerous well-written critical reviews among the latter is one of the most virulent productions of that most virulent of men dr charles caldwell it is entitled medical language of literature I have heard it said in Philadelphia that Dr. Samuel Jackson never forgave the bitterness of the attack in it upon his principles of medicine. In Volume 3 there was the interesting announcement that a dollar a page would be paid for all original communications. In 1831 appeared a little work entitled Sketches of the Character and Writings of Eminent Living Surgeons and Physicians of Paris, translated from the french of j l h pice of the nine lives those of dupuytren and brusses are still of interest to us and there is no work in english from which one can get a better insight into the history of medicine in paris in the early part of the nineteenth century one little sentence in the translator's preface is worth quoting after making all reasonable allowance for natural tact or talent and for the facilities and advantages of instruction to be had in extensive medical establishments it will be found that study intense untiring unremitted study is the only foundation of professional worth and distinction a great stimulus had been given to the study of phrenology by the visit of spurzheim to this country he gave a course of six lectures on the anatomy of the brain and spinal cord at one of the apartments of the medical college in september of that year and subsequently a popular course of lectures on phrenology in eighteen thirty two he died in boston of typhus fever his brain it is stated was in the possession of the boston phrenological society before which in january eighteen thirty eight bartlett gave an interesting address on scientific phrenology in eighteen thirty nine bartlett edited paley's natural theology that delightful book dear especially to those of us who were trained in religious colleges to some of us at least the freshness of the natural theology which in paley's hands was really a delightful commentary on anatomy and physiology was a happy change from artificial theology or even from the ore paulinae of the same author bartlett's claim to remembrance so far as his medical writings are concerned rests mainly on his work on fevers issued first in eighteen forty two and subsequently in the years eighteen forty seven eighteen fifty two and eighteen fifty seven it remains one of the most notable of contributions of american physicians to the subject 
Between the time of Bartlett's visit to Paris and 1840, a group of students had studied under Louis and had returned to this country thoroughly familiar with typhoid fever, the prevalent form in the French capital at that time. In another place I have told in detail how largely through their labors the profession learned to recognize the essential differences between the two prevalent forms of fever, typhoid and typhus. The writings on fever, chiefly accessible to the American reader of that day, were the English works of Fordyce, Armstrong, Southwood, Smith, and Tweedy, in which, as Bartlett says, they describe a fever or form of fever, that is typhus, rarely met with in this country, and the writings did not actually represent the state of our knowledge upon the subject indeed for a number of years later a chaotic condition of mind prevailed among writers in great britain and it was not until eighteen forty nine fifty that william jenner by a fresh series of accurate observations brought the british medical opinion into line as the British and Foreign Medico-Chirurgical Review, in a most complimentary notice of Bartlett's work, said, A history of British fever such as Louis has furnished to France, or such as given in the volume under discussion, did not exist. Still, even at that date, 1844, the review expressed the ultra-conservative opinion held in England that the common continued fever, or the low nervous fever of Huxham, was only a mild form of typhus fever. The work is dedicated to his friends James Jackson of Boston and W. W. Gerhard of Philadelphia it is he states a history of two diseases many points of which they especially among his own countrymen have diligently and successfully studied and illustrated the chief interest of the work to-day lies in the remarkably accurate picture which is given of typhoid fever a picture the main outlines of which are as well and firmly drawn as in any work which has appeared since it is written with great clearness, in logical order, and he shows on every page an accurate acquaintance with the literature of the day, and, as the author of the review already mentioned remarks, a knowledge also of that best of books, the Book of Nature. The practical character of Bartlett's mind is indicated by the briefness with which he discusses the favorite topic of the day, namely the theory of fever. He acknowledged at the outset that the materials for any satisfactory theory of typhoid fever did not exist. He went so far as to claim that the fundamental primary alteration was in the blood, and that the local lesion was really secondary, and he refers to the prevalent theory of fever as wholly a creation of fancy, the offspring of a false generalization and of a spurious philosophy. What then can its theory be but the shadow of a shade? This work immediately placed Bartlett in the front rank of American physicians of the day. It had a powerful influence on the profession of the country. Among his letters there is an interesting and characteristic one from James Jackson, already referred to in the dedication. Acknowledging the receipt of a copy, he says, I am now writing to express to you the great satisfaction the book has given me. I think that it entirely answers the end that you proposed. It, in fact, translates to the common reader, in a most clear style and lucid method, the acquisitions which science has made on its subjects within the last few years. Nowhere else can the same comprehensive view of those subjects be found. What may be the conclusions of medical men in regard to essential fevers twenty years hence, I would not pretend to say. It is certain their views have changed very much within a shorter period, and if new discoveries are made in ten years to come, I doubt not you will be ready to change yours. We must take today the truth so far as we know it, and add to it day by day as we learn more." It is evident from his letters that the success of the work on fevers was a great gratification to Bartlett. The second edition was issued in 1847, and while the history of typhoid and typhus fever remained much in the same state, with certain additions and developments, the subject of periodical and yellow fevers was greatly extended. The third edition was published in 1852. The fourth edition was edited by Bartlett's friend Alonzo Clark of New York.
The dedication of the second, third, and fourth editions was to Dr. John Orne Green of Lowell, with whom the early and active part of the writer's life was passed, in a personal friendship which no cloud for a single moment ever shadowed or chilled, and in a professional intercourse whose delightful harmony no selfish interests or personal jealousy ever disturbed. From every standpoint, Bartlett on Fevers may be regarded as one of the most successful works ever issued from the medical press, and it richly deserves the comment of the distinguished editor of the fourth edition. The question may be fairly raised whether any book in our profession illustrates more clearly the beauties of sound reasoning and the advantages of vigorous generalization from carefully selected facts certainly no author ever brought to his labor a more high-minded purpose of representing the truth in its simplicity and in its fullness while few have been possessed of higher gifts to discern and gracefully to exhibit it End of chapter six part one chapter six elisha bartlett a rhode island philosopher part two an essay on the philosophy of medicine eighteen forty four a classic in american medical literature is the most characteristic of bartlett's works and the one to which in the future students will turn most often since it represents one of the most successful attempts to apply the principles of deductive reasoning to medicine and moreover illustrates the mental attitude of an acute and thoughtful observer in the middle of the century the work consists of two parts in the first science is defined and its canons laid down ascertained facts with their relations to others obtained by observation or experience and generalized into laws and principles this constitutes science he dwells upon the hurtfulness of theories and sketches in an interesting manner newton's position as an observer and as a theorist if he, Newton, bowed at any time or in any degree his strong neck to the yoke of hypothesis, it was always with a perfect consciousness of his ability at will to shake it off as the lion shakes the dewdrop from his mane. He quotes from Sir Humphrey Davy, When I consider the variety of theories that may be formed on the slender foundation of one or two facts, I am convinced that it is the business of the true philosopher to avoid them altogether. Bartlett is the strongest American interpreter of the modern French school of medical observation, which is characterized by its strict adherence to the study and analysis of morbid phenomena and their relationships, by the accuracy, the positiveness, and the minute detail which it has carried into this study and analysis, and by its rejection as an essential or legitimate element of science of all a priori reasoning or speculation. The spirit which animates and guides and moves it is expressed in the saying of Rousseau that all science is in the facts or phenomena of nature and their relationships, and not in the mind of man which discovers and interprets them. It is the true Protestant school of medicine. It either rejects as apocryphal, or holds as of no binding authority, all the traditions of the fathers, unless they are sustained and sanctioned by its own experience." There are weak points in his arguments, some of which are well pointed out in an able article in the British and Foreign Medical Chirurgical Review, July 1845, but it is a work of a strong and thoughtful mind, and for a time at least it had a powerful influence in the profession. A contemporary writer, Samuel Henry Dixon, speaks of it in the following terms. It was particularly well-timed and addressed effectively to the requirements of the profession at the period of its publication. It breathes a spirit of thoughtful and considerate skepticism, which was then needed to temper the headlong habit of confident polypharmacy prevalent over our country. When addressed, however, by Bartlett on this side of the Atlantic, and on the other by Forbes, he, the orthodox disciple, stopped to listen and consider. These gifted men spoke with authority, and they pleaded impressively, eloquently, wisely. If, in the natural ardor of controversy, they went somewhat too far, 
let that slight fault be forgiven for the great good they accomplished nay let them be honoured for the courage and frankness with which they attacked prevalent error and risked their popularity and position by assailing modes of practice rendered familiar by custom and everywhere adopted and trusted to in eighteen forty eight appeared one of bartlett's most characteristic works a little volume of eighty-four pages entitled an inquiry into the degree of certainty of medicine and into the nature and extent of its power over disease the iconoclastic studies of louis and certain of the paris physicians and the advocacy of expectancy by the leaders of the vienna school had between eighteen thirty and eighteen fifty disturbed the profession not a little and in eighteen forty six appeared an article by dr forbes in which as bartlett said were drawn in strong and exaggerated colours the manifold imperfections of medical science and the discouraging uncertainties of medical art these circumstances had combined to shake and disturb the general confidence in the profession with the effect that the hold which medicine has so long had upon the popular mind is loosened there is a widespread scepticism as to its power of curing diseases and men are everywhere to be found who deny its pretensions as a science and reject the benefits and blessings which it offers them as an art to bartlett it appeared high time to speak a clear and earnest word for the science which we study and teach and for the art which we inculcate and practice and in this essay he set himself the task of vindicating the claims of medicine to the regard and confidence of mankind in his endeavour to show how far and with what measure of certainty and of constancy we are able to control to mitigate and to remove disease bartlett occupied at the outset very advanced ground for that date we must remember that the general body of the profession had the most implicit confidence in drugs and polypharmacy was almost as much in vogue as in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries the reception of the essay in certain quarters indicates how shocking its tone appeared to some of the staid old conservatives of the day i have a review of it in the medical examiner november eighteen forty eight from which i give the following extract this is a curious production the like of which we have seldom seen from the pen of any one who had passed the age of a sophomore what makes it the more remarkable is the circumstance that the writer is a gentleman of education and experience and the author of works which have given him a wide reputation the force of the rebound sufficiently indicates the intensity with which the attack was felt bartlett's position however reminds one somewhat of the sermon of the liberal scotch presbyterian on things which cannot be shaken in which he proceeded at the outset to shake off three-fourths of the cherished beliefs of evangelical christianity after a preliminary discussion on anatomy and physiology and on the remarkable rapidity with which these sciences were progressing he proceeds to speak of the state of pathology and therapeutics as illustrated in the well-known disease pneumonia time will not permit me to do more than to refer to the result of his analysis of the evidence he classifies the cases into first those which terminate naturally and spontaneously quite independent of any active medical treatment a proportion probably large second a group which will terminate fatally notwithstanding any assistance which art may furnish they are as sir gilbert blaine said of the worst forms of yellow fever determinedly fatal and finally a third class not tending necessarily either in one direction or the other in which the issue depends upon the treatment of the disease in these cases art judiciously applied saves the life of the patient the issue of the cases in death or in recovery is dependent upon the treatment of the disease then follows a discussion on the nature and limits of the medical art in the various groups of diseases and he concludes with a section on the triumphs of preventive medicine the initials a s at the end of a review in the american journal of the medical sciences october eighteen forty eight enables us to estimate the impression which the book made upon a kindred spirit 
professor alfred stille of the university of pennsylvania still with us i am happy to say wrote he has done a good work a work for which he deserves the respect and gratitude of the medical profession and of all sound-hearted men whatever their pursuits who fight under the banner of truth and are the sworn enemies of all imposture the determined opponents of all error at times and in degrees differing with our temperaments there come upon us bouts of depression when we feel that the battle has been lost and that to fight longer is not worth the effort periods when amid the weariness the fever and the fret of daily practice things have gone against us we have been misunderstood by patients our motives have been wrongly interpreted and smitten perhaps in the house of our friends the worries of heart to which we doctors are so subject make us feel bitterly the uncertainties of medicine as a profession and at times make us despair of its future in a voice that one may trust bartlett concludes his inquiry with these memorable words which i quote in the hope that they may soothe the heartache of any pessimistic brother there is no process which can reckon up the amount of good which the science and art of medicine have conferred upon the human race there is no moral calculus that can grasp and comprehend the sum of their beneficent operations ever since the first dawn of civilization and learning through the dark backward and abysm of time they have been the true and constant friends of the suffering sons and daughters of men through their ministers and disciples they have cheered the desponding they have lightened the load of human sorrow they have dispelled or diminished the gloom of the sick chamber they have plucked from the pillow of pain its thorns and made the hard couch soft with the poppies of delicious rest they have let in the light of joy upon dark and desolate dwellings they have rekindled the lamp of hope in the bosom of despair they have called back the radiance of the lustreless eye and the bloom of the fading cheek they have sent new vigor through the failing limbs and finally when exhausted in all their other resource and baffled in their skill handmaids of philosophy and religion they have blunted the arrows of death and rendered less rugged and precipitous the inevitable pathway to the tomb in the circle of human duties i do not know of any short of heroic and perilous daring or religious martyrdom and self-sacrifice higher and nobler than those of the physician his daily round of labor is crowded with beneficence and his nightly sleep is broken that others may have better rest his whole life is a blessed ministry of consolation and hope. The last of Bartlett's strictly medical publications was a little monograph on the history, diagnosis, and treatment of edematous laryngitis, published in Louisville at the time he held the chair of practice at the university in 1850. It is a carefully prepared monograph, based largely on the studies of valix a fresh interest in the subject had been given him by the observation of dr gurdon buck of new york who had cured several cases by directly scarifying the edematous membranes four naturally studious fond of poetry history biography and literature in general and not for long tied and bound in the chains of general practice bartlett had ample opportunities to cultivate his mind he says in one of his letters to green dated pittsfield november one eighteen thirty five i pass a good deal of my time here quite alone so that i find myself whiling away the hours in meditation much oftener than when engaged in the more varied and active affairs of business at home i think that i always leave pittsfield with the better and purer part of my being somewhat strengthened burton concludes his immortal treatise with the advice be not solitary be not idle but the true student at some part of his life at least should know the fruitful hours of still increase for many years bartlett enjoyed a leisure known to-day to few professors of medicine the fruits of which are manifest in his writings among his contemporaries in the profession there were brilliant writers samuel henry dixon jacob bigelow j k mitchell but in a style so uniformly high and polished yet withal so plain not one of them approached bartlett 
Compare, for example, Samuel Jackson's Principles of Medicine, written in 1832, with the first edition of The Fevers, 1842, the one pompous, involved, obscure, the other clear, direct, simple. For style in his medical writings, Bartlett may be called the Watson or the Trousseau of America. Bartlett was at his best in the occasional address, and as we have noticed already, this talent was cultivated very early in his career, since we find him giving the Fourth of July oration before his fellow citizens when he had been scarcely a year in Lowell. All of the lectures and addresses illustrate, as Holmes said, that easy flow of language, that facility of expression, that florid warmth which occasion offers, which commonly marks the prose of those who are born poets. Among these addresses there are four or five worthy of a permanent place in our literature. Perhaps the most characteristic is one entitled The Head and the Heart, or the Relative Importance of Intellectual and Moral Education, which is a stirring plea for a higher tone in social and political morality. In the same clear ringing accent he speaks in his address on Spurzheim of the dangers of democracy. In a lecture on the sense of the beautiful, delivered in 1843, Bartlett appears as an apostle of culture, pleading in glowing language for the education of this faculty. One short fragment I must quote. Amongst the Hebrews, and in the age of Moses, it was linked to religion. It dwelt amidst the mysteries of worship and faith. It brought costly offerings to the costlier altar. It hung the tabernacle with its curtains of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and with cherubim of cunning work. It arrayed the high priest of Jehovah in his gorgeous and consecrated garments, and on the mitre of pure gold upon his forehead it graved, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. At a later day, and amongst a widely different people, it became the handmaid of a refined and luxurious sensuality. It lapped the soul of Greece in a sensual Elysium. Its living impersonations were Pericles and Aspasia. It called the mother of love from the froth of the sea, and bound her zone with its cestus. It filled the hills of Arcady with fleet oreads. It graced with the half-naked naiads the fountains and the rivers. It crowned the Acropolis with the Parthenon, and it embodied its highest conceptions of physical grace and beauty in the Venus and the Apollo. At other periods, during the history of our race, it has manifested itself in other forms than these, under other circumstances, aspects, and influences, and with other results. In 1848 he delivered the Fourth of July oration before his friends in Lowell. At the opening he refers to the fact that twenty years before he had occupied the same position. It was the dewy morning of my manhood, time had not thinned my flowing hair, life with its boundless hopes and its golden visions spread far and fair before me, and cheered by your words of encouragement and aided by your helping hands, your associate and co-worker and in your service, a stranger, but welcomed with frank confidence and trust, I had just entered upon its arduous and upward pathway. In 1849 appeared a brief sketch of the life, character, and writings of William Charles Wells, the South Carolinian Tory, who subsequently became a distinguished man of science in London, and was well known for his researches on the phenomena of dew. One of the last of Bartlett's publications was A Discourse on the Times, Character, and Writings of Hippocrates, delivered as an introductory address before the trustees, faculty, and medical class of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at the opening of the session of 1852-3. The three pictures which he gives of Hippocrates as a young practitioner in the Isle of Thesos, at the deathbed of Pericles, and as a teacher in the Isle of Kos, are masterpieces worthy of Walter Savage Lander. 
in no words of exaggeration the late george d prentice said there are but few word pictures in the english language that exceed the grandeur and loveliness of that one called into being by dr bartlett in which he imagines pericles upon his deathbed with hippocrates in attendance it is remarkable how many physicians write poetry or what passes as such i have been told of a period in the history of the royal college of physicians of london when every elect censor as they were called had written verses some begin young as did bartlett others become attuned in the deep autumnal tone of advancing years when as plato tells us in the phaedo even socrates felt a divine impulsion to make verses before quitting the prison-house those of us who have read the epic of the late distinguished professor george b wood of the university of pennsylvania entitled first and last published when he was sixty-four will devoutly hope that professors of medicine when afflicted with this form of madness will follow his example and publish their poems anonymously and in another country jacob bigelow too when nearly seventy darkened sanctities with song with his american rejected addresses eolopoesis dr barnett had poetical aspirations early in life in a letter to his sister of december three eighteen twenty six he speaks of having been in new york in the garland two fugitive pieces which some months before i had made use of to fill up the corner of a newspaper but what sense they might have contained had been turned into nonsense and i blushed for my wandering orphans notwithstanding they had been so well dressed and though they had found their way into pretty respectable company i should have blushed for myself had they been exhibited to the public as my offspring in another letter of the same period we see how completely he had passed beneath the yoke of byron in december eighteen fifty four bartlett issued a little volume entitled simple settings in verse for six portraits and pictures from mr dickens gallery the inditing of which had been as he says a pleasant occupation which had helped to while away and fill up many an hour which would otherwise have been weary or vacant in his invalid life i have already spoken of one an allegory in which are autobiographical details i cannot do better than quote from an appreciative notice which his friend oliver wendell holmes wrote of the little volume when to the friends he had loved there came a farewell gift not a last effort of the learning and wisdom they had been taught to expect from him but a little book with a few songs in it songs with his whole warm heart in them they knew that his hour was come and their tears fell fast as they read the loving thoughts that he had clothed in words of natural beauty and melody the cluster of evening primroses had opened and the night was close at hand of a warm affectionate nature a manhood fused with female grace to judge from the statements of contemporaries and friends to know bartlett was to love him alonzo clark writes to him always as dear brother and says in one place we all wish that you were among us not to work unless you choose but that we might see that face of yours and feel the influence of the mind that shines through it his confreres john orne green and alonzo clark are invariably addressed as dear brother among the letters is one of sympathy to dr green the desire of whose eyes had been taken away at a stroke in it bartlett unlocked his heart in a most touching and human appeal to the afflicted soul it seems almost too sacred to quote but after listening you will forgive me my dear brother what shall i say to the melancholy allusion in the close of your letter to the death of our dear minerva what poor words of mine can be of any service to one on whom the hand of the great chastener has been so heavily laid how shall i whose life has been comparatively so cloudless and serene come with the message of solace and encouragement into the presence of one whose meridian sun has been shrouded in such utter and dreadful eclipse but why should i not am i not a brother and a man has not bereavement been a guest in the dwelling of my childhood 
has not death been a familiar visitor amid the scenes of my early friendships and happiness and hopes and where too is the future for us all for me as well as for yourself we but follow each other through the furnace of affliction as we follow each other to the grave who of us has so hedged in his earthly treasures that the spoiler cannot easily break through the frail enclosure and rifle him in a moment of the choicest and best the lines of the christian poet familiar to me chiefly from the lips of a now sainted mother occur to my memory here the spider's most attenuated thread is cord is cable to man's tender tie on earthly bliss it breaks at every breeze we are brothers then in all the liabilities and contingencies and uncertainties of the future let us be brothers and fellow helpers also in its hopes and its duties there can be no entire and hopeless wretchedness for the soul of man except that which arises from its self-inflicted degradation the sweet sister the affectionate daughter the beautiful bride and the young mother was taken away in the clear unclouded morning of her life taken away but where and by whom the flower was transplanted from an earthly garden a fair and sunny one it is true but from an earthly garden to be set forever where no worm can feed on its root where no decay can ever dry up its bloom in the paradise of god by whom taken away by her father from a far-off country where she was only a sojourner or a pilgrim to her beautiful and eternal home Take these thoughts into your heart, and they shall lighten up or drive away the darkness of the past, and what is better, they shall again cheer your future with the once familiar forms and faces of happiness and hope. How can we know what, even of present good, our indulgent father may have in store for us? He may have allotted to you many long years to be filled up first with duty, and if filled with duty, to be crowned also with the cheerful light of social and domestic joy. You may say, perhaps, that this is all very well for me to say, but that I know nothing about it but I do know something of the mutability of all earthly things. This uncertainty has long been to me a daily theme of meditation, so I am not wholly a stranger. But I have found an antidote to the gloom and sadness which would otherwise occasion in remembering that all things are in the hands of a wise disposer, and the surest way to please him, as well as to secure our own present as well as future peace, is to submit to his dispensations, and to follow on, in the course of active and cheerful duty to him, to our fellows, and to ourselves." when in louisville some obscure nervous trouble the nature of which i have not been able to ascertain attacked dr bartlett against it in new york he fought bravely but in vain and after the session of eighteen fifty three four retired to smithfield his native place the prolonged illness terminated in paralysis but fortunately did not impair his mental faculties in the least degree he died on july nineteenth eighteen fifty five from the many eulogies which appeared after bartlett's death i select a portion of one written by his dearest friend alonzo clark as the preface to the fourth edition of the fevers sixteen months ago he closed his brilliant professional career after years of growing bodily weakness and pain his mind not dimmed by his physical infirmities but bright and comprehensive glowing with the memories of the past and the visions of the future he died too soon for the profession he adorned the clock had hardly marked twelve at noon on the dial plate of life when its pendulum strokes grew faint and gradually fainter to the ear and now at length when all is still the hand that notes the hours points sadly upward to indicate how much of daytime still remained to reap the harvest of affection and honour in those fields from which he had already garnered up so many golden sheaves he died alas too soon 
the whole profession are his mourners for conspicuous as he had become by his medical writings and his extended professional labors his acknowledged worthiness his innate gentleness and modesty disarmed envy he left no enemies his mind and purpose were pure almost beyond example his high mental endowments were controlled and directed by a considerable judgment and an earnest benevolent heart and as the laws of refraction wrought out into mathematical formulae enable the lapidary to construct the facets which open the fountains of the many-coloured diamond so for him cultivation and elegant taste had brought out the varied and winning native lights of his rich intellectual moral and social nature in translating the lives of eminent french physicians bartlett said he had a twofold object first the delineation of distinguished professional character and attainment and secondly by the influence of such high examples to awaken in the younger members of the medical body a more devoted and worthy emulation of the great masters of our art in this spirit i appear before you to-day glad to tell over the story of your countrymen the story of a life in civic action warm one that all the muses decked with gifts of grace a distinguished teacher an author of widespread influence and distinction a serene philosopher but above all a man in whom you may recognize even from the brief and imperfect sketch which i have given a likeness to the wise below a kinship with the great of old appendix a sketch of hippocrates from a discourse on the times character and writings of hippocrates by elisha bartlett in one of the years of the eighty eighth olympiad in the island of thasos fronting the thracian city of abdera there was sadness in the house of silenus for its young master had been seized with sudden and alarming illness the fiery casus of the clime the year had been marked by some meteorological and epidemic peculiarities a little before the rising of arcturus that is just previous to the autumnal equinox and while this constellation was still upon the horizon there had been heavy and frequent rains with winds from the north towards the equinox and up to the setting of the pleiades there were light rains with southerly winds during the winter the winds were cold strong and dry from the north with snow towards the vernal equinox there were violent storms the spring was cold and rather wet with winds from the north towards the summer solstice there were light rains and the temperature was cool till near the approach of the dog days after the dog days and until the rising of arcturus the summer was marked by great heat not at intervals but constantly there was no water summer itzian winds were prevalent from the rising of arcturus to the time of the equinox there were rains with the wind from the south during the winter the general health of the thasians was good excepting an epidemic prevalence of paralysis at the opening of spring the calsus showed itself and continued to prevail up to the autumnal equinox during the early part of the season the disease was mild but after the autumn rains it became more severe and carried off a great many of its subjects dysenteries prevailed also during the summer and some patients with fever even who had had hemorrhages were attacked with dysentery this happened to the slave of Araton and to milas there was much sickness among the women many had difficult labors and were sick subsequently this was the case with the daughter of telebolus who died on the tenth day after her confinement when the casus proved fatal death commonly took place on the sixth day as in the cases of epaminides salinus and philiscus son of antigonus the parotid glands superated in the case of cratistinax who lived near the temple of hercules and also in that of the servant of Scimus the fuller but omitting any further details of the prevailing diseases of the year let us return to the bedside of the young patient in abdera it is the third day of his disease 
he has had a restless and distressed night with some wandering of the mind the symptoms are all worse in the morning and his family and neighbors are anxious and alarmed the occupations and order of that old thasian household are interrupted and broken up a fresh offering has been placed on the altar of the household jove standing in the centre of the inner court the sound of the flute and the cythera has ceased there is no animated talk of the last winners at the isthmian or the olympian games the clatter of the loom and the domestic hum of the spinning wheel are no longer heard the naked feet of the slaves and the women fall carefully and silently upon the uncarpeted floors and an unwanted stillness reigns throughout the numerous apartments of the dwelling there is no savory steam of roasting wild boar from the kitchen and the fragrant thracian wine stands untasted on the table with a few plain barley cakes and a little salt fish silenus lies in his sleeping chamber in the quiet interior part of the house adjoining the apartments of the women farthest from the vestibule and near to the garden by the bed of the sick man there is a small tripod stand with a circular top and upon it there is a statuette of hercules a bowl of warm barley water and a cup of oxymel leaning her head on the foot of the bed and sobbing sits on a low stool a young greek woman beautiful in her features and graceful in the flowing outlines of her person as the thessalian maidens of homer there is a picturesque combination of barbarian rudeness and grecian elegance in her appearance not an unfitting type and expression of the age and state of society in the midst of which she lived her feet and ankles are bare she wears only a single garment the long ionic chiton of linen with large sleeves reaching only a little below the shoulders leaving uncovered in their snowy whiteness arms that might have rivalled those of the jealous queen of olympus a girdle fastens the robe loosely around a waist like that of the medician venus innocent of the deformities of buckram and whalebone the light auburn hair is simply parted and carried back from the forehead gathered in a knot on the crown of the head fastened with a golden grasshopper and held by a coif of golden network at the end of the bed watching steadfastly and earnestly the appearance of the patient is seated his physician the already celebrated son of heraclides and phenerate hippocrates of kos he has just entered the apartment to make his morning visit his sandals have been taken off and his feet washed by a slave in the vestibule he wears over his linen tunic a large flowing mantle of light fine woolen suited to the season not unlike the later toga of the romans fastened at the neck with a cameo of exculapius and falling in graceful folds nearly to his feet his hair is long and both this and his beard are kept and arranged with scrupulous neatness and care he is thirty years old in the very prime and beauty of early manhood his features through these misty shadows of many centuries we cannot clearly distinguish but we see that his face is dignified thoughtful and serene and his whole aspect manner and expression are those of high antique breeding of refined culture and of rather studied and elaborate elegance his examination of his patient was long anxious and careful he saw at once that the gravity and danger of the disease had increased since his last visit he inquired very minutely into the manner in which the night had been passed and was told by the watchers that the patient had had no sleep that he had talked constantly had sung and laughed and had been agitated and restless he found the hypochondria tumefied but without much hardness the stools had been blackish and watery and the urine turbid and dark colored he noticed the temperature and feel of the skin and he studied for a long time and with great solicitude the general manner and appearance the decubitus the breathing the motions and especially the physiognomy of the patient the only circumstance in the examination that would have particularly attracted the attention of a modern witness of the scene would have been his omission to feel the pulse 
with this exception no examination of the rational symptoms of disease could have been more thorough and methodical having satisfied himself as to the state of his patient he retired to an adjoining room followed by some of the attendants to give directions in regard to the few simple remedies that he intended to use the patient had already been bled and had had a purgative of black hellebore hippocrates directed that instead of the strained decoction of barley which had been the patient's drink he should now have honey and water the favourite hydromel that the bed should be made softer the windows of the room still farther darkened and that a warm flaxseed poultice softened with olive oil should be applied to the abdomen with a sad but decided expression of his fears as to the issue of the case, and a few kindly and pious words to the weeping wife about the dignity, the solace, and the duty, in all our trials, of submission to the will of the gods, he gathered his mantle gracefully about him, had his sandals refitted by the slave who waited in the vestibule, and proceeded on his daily round of visits among the houses of the city and now leaving the sterile island of thesos let us follow the young physician to another sick chamber to a scene of domestic life still further illustrative of that remote and wonderful period with which we are concerned the time is a year or two later it is the house of pericles that we enter and we stand by the deathbed of the great and venerable archon everything in the spacious apartment indicates the pervading presence not of obtrusive grandeur or of showy and ostentatious wealth but of stately elegance and of high various many-sided luxury culture and refinement philosophy letters and art breathe in the quiet atmosphere of the room and the taste of aspasia sheds an asiatic grace over its furnishing and its decorations in one corner stands a statue of minerva from the chisel of phidias and the walls are covered with pictures fresh from the pencils of panenas and polygnatus illustrating the legendary and historic glories of greece there might have been seen theseus bearing off from the field of victory on the banks of the thermodon the masculine and magnificent queen of the amazons half willing perhaps to be the captive of such a victor jason in his good ship argo with his fifty selectus heroes convoyed by the queen of love the awful air and apollo winds his various and adventurous voyage crowded with poetic imagery and romantic incident and brings back the golden fleece from colchis helen at her loom is weaving into her golden web the story of the trojan wars the chaste penelope by the light of her midnight lamp undoes the delusive labors of the day ulysses returned from his long wanderings surveys once more with boyish pride and delight the dear old bow which no arm but his could bend the central figure on that old historic canvas that i have endeavoured to unroll before you is that of the dying statesman raised and resting in solemn and august serenity upon its last pillow lies the head of olympian grandeur which i may say it without presumption after the lapse of nearly twenty-three centuries now finds for the first time its fitting representative and likeness as the character and career of the great athenian find their counterparts also in that illustrious orator and statesman who now walks in solitary majesty amongst us the pride the strength the glory of the republic the pericles of our athens whose acropolis is the constitution of his country whose propylae are the freedom and the federation of the states added to the calamities of that long and disastrous internecine struggle between the two rival cities of greece which had just begun athens was now afflicted with that terrible visitation of the plague the history of which has been left to us by thucydides and pericles was sinking under a protracted and wearing fever the result of an attack of the disease his long and glorious life is about to close 
he had been for more than an entire generation if never the first archon and not always the most popular by common consent the most eminent citizen statesman and orator of the republic the great defender of her constitution the champion of her freedom and her rights the upholder and the magnifier of her renown political rivals disappointed partisans and a few malignant personal enemies and professional libelers and satirists had been hostile to his career and had endeavored to blacken his fair fame but his strong and unshaken democratic faith his far-seeing sagacity his firmness and moderation his enlarged liberal humanizing conservative and pacific policy his moral courage and independence and his high public probity had triumphed over them all and although by braving the prejudices of his friends and supporters in his devotion to the general weal he had gathered over his declining son some clouds of public disfavor the sense of justice and the feeling of gratitude in the minds of his countrymen were quick to return the clouds were already scattered or they served only to deepen and reflect the setting splendor which for a moment they had intercepted and obscured many of his near personal friends and relatives had already fallen victim to the pestilence both his sons had perished and the young pericles the child of aspasia had been sent away with his mother for safety into thessaly phidias and his old teacher anaxagoras his guide philosopher and friend had died a little while before the breaking out of the epidemic those who were left had now gathered around the bed of the dying archon to receive the rich legacy of his parting words and to pay to him the last solemn and kindly offices of life not often in the world's history has there met together a more august and illustrious company these are a few of those whom we are able to recognize amongst them resting his head on the shoulder of socrates and sobbing aloud in unrestrained and passionate sorrow leans the wild and reckless alcibiades just in the first bloom of that resplendent personal beauty which made him seem to the eyes even of the greeks more like the radiant apparition of a young apollo than any form of mere earthly mould subdued for the first time in his life and probably for the last by the spectacle before him of his dying relative and guardian to reverence tenderness and truth sophocles his old companion in arms is there and near him in his coarse mantle and with unsandaled feet may have stood a grandson of aristides still poor with the honourable poverty of his great ancestor conspicuous among this group of generals admirals statesmen orators artists poets and philosophers in rank and fortune in social position in reputation in learning culture and refinement their equal and associate sits the young physician of kos already had his rising fame reached athens and when the city overcrowded with the inhabitants of attica driven from their homes by the armies of sparta was smitten with the pestilence he was summoned from his island home in the aegean to stay if he could the march of the destroying angel and to succor with his skill those who had fallen under the shadow of its wings on a gentle declivity looking toward the southwest in the small island of kos lying in the aegean sea a few stadia from the coast of asia minor stands the temple of asclepius its ionic columns and its ornamented friezes of pentelican marble glitter and flash in the sunlight as we watch them through the swaying branches of the ancient oaks chestnuts and elms that make the sacred grove of the temple in the centre of the principal room or cella of the temple and fronting the entrance stand statues of esculapius and his daughters hygeia and panacea on each side of the entrance are marble fonts of lustral water for the preliminary purification of the sick visitors to the temple near a column of the temple and holding a roll of papyrus in his left hand stands hippocrates gathered about him in picturesque little groups there is a company of greek youths their tasteful and elegant costumes their earnest and intelligent faces and their general air and bearing 
all show plainly enough the superior refinement and culture of the class to which they belong they are medical students young esclapiads who have assembled here from the several states of greece to acquire the clinical skill and experience of the great surgeon and physician of kos and to listen to the eloquent lessons of the illustrious professor thirty years have gone by since we met him at the bedside of the dying pericles the lapse of this generation has thinned his flowing hair and sprinkled his beard with silver it would be gratifying if we could know something of his personal history during this long and active period of his life we know but little however and this little is dim and shadowy that he had led a life of activity and usefulness and of growing reputation and that he had visited various portions of greece is certain what he himself had witnessed and must have felt we know well enough he had seen for this whole period his country torn and distracted by civil war state arrayed against state city against city he had mourned over the disastrous expedition of athens against syracuse and shooting athwart all the murky darkness of this troubled and stormy period instead of the benignant sun of pericles the baleful rays of the star of alcibiades setting at last but too late for his country in ignominy and blood i have not departed from the strictest limits of historical probability in assigning to hippocrates the high powers of didactic and persuasive oratory one of the most potent agencies in the development of greek intellect and the advancement of greek civilization consisted in the general prevalence of public teaching and recitation for many successive centuries it was from the living lips of bards and rhapsodists kindled with coals from the glowing altars of patriotism and religion and not through the medium of any cold and silent written records that the immortal strains of the iliad and the odyssey rang through the land and were made literally familiar as household words even up to an advanced period of grecian culture the art of writing was but little practised and it was by speech and not by reading that statesmen poets orators philosophers and historians acted upon their disciples and the public then the evidence derived from his writings is full and conclusive that hippocrates was not merely a skilful physician but that he was learned in all the philosophy and literature of his age plato speaks of the asclepiads his co-contemporaries as men of elegant and cultivated minds who in the explanations they give to their patients go even to the heights of philosophy it is no violation then of historic probability to presume that the great philosophic and practical physician who had been trained in this unrivalled school of human speech who had listened to the eloquence of pericles in the public assemblies or been charmed by the colloquial magic of socrates in the market-place should have been himself also a master of this high power of instructive and persuasive speech it is by no forced or illegitimate exercise of the fancy that we look back to the scene i have endeavoured to sketch and with little danger of departing far from the truth we may imagine what would be likely to constitute the theme of his discourse especially if the occasion was one of unusual interest or solemnity such as the opening or closing of one of his courses of instruction the introductory lecture or the valedictory address to the graduating class of the school of kos at the term of the first year of the ninety-fifth olympiad the character of hippocrates his position his close observation of nature his knowledge his philosophy the times in which he lived the circumstances which surrounded him all conspired to make him a polemic and a reformer he would probably take such an occasion as that of which i am speaking to lay down and to vindicate the great principles of his system and he would be likely to begin with an exposition of the errors of medical doctrine and practice most important and most generally prevalent i do not suppose that our illustrious historical father was wholly exempt from the infirmities of our common nature and it is very possible that in his animadversions upon the system of his canidian neighbours there were mingled some ingredients more spicy than attic salt 
and he may have indulged perhaps in some allowable self-congratulation that the class of costs was so much larger than that at Canidus. I suppose, however, that as president of the college he would in a graceful and dignified exordium give his greeting and welcome to the members of the class. He would express his gratification at seeing so numerous an assemblage from so many of the states of Greece, from the north and the south, the east and the west, from Attica and Boeotia and the Peloponnesus, from distant Sicily, and even from Egypt after this or some similar appropriate introduction he would probably continue by warning his hearers against the subtle and dangerous errors of superstition of the old therugic faith he would speak of the great revolution that had so recently taken place in the greek mind even then only partially accomplished he would describe in colours such as only he could use who had felt this change in his own spirit and who had witnessed it all about him the gradual dawn and the final rising of the central solar idea of a simple spiritual theism of fixed laws of invariable relations and sequences of events in the economy of nature as he sketched the outlines of this great and pregnant history he could hardly fail to linger for a moment with something of the passionate enthusiasm of his early years and with something also of their strong and simple faith upon that gorgeous theurgic and mythological creation of the greek mind which marked its legendary and religious period he would speak of this mythology and its various and beautiful legends in no cynical or bigoted tone but with philosophical toleration and with something even of loving sympathy and admiration he would say it was the genial and natural product of the quick susceptible many-sided greek mind in the period of its childhood and adolescence kindling with his old enthusiasm he would have likened that early age peopled with its gods and demigods its beautiful women and heroic men to its own young apollo the bloom of immortal youth on his beaming forehead his flowing locks sweet with the ambrosia of the dewy morning of life and all his form radiant with the divine beauty he would have said that the present high civilization of his country was in a great degree the growth of seed planted in that genial soil and nurtured by that genial sun that greek character and art and philosophy are all still steeped in the glorious light of the old homeric age in the third place he would have warned his hearers against the seductive but dangerous influences of the philosophers these men he would have said are for the most part idle dreamers and they are nothing else i know them well they affect superior wisdom and they look down disdainfully upon the physician and the patient observer of nature they seem to think that the economy of the universe including the human system in health and disease can be ascertained and understood by a sort of intellectual divination which they call wisdom and philosophy but which is in reality only empty hypothesis and idle speculation he would then have entered into an examination of these systems he would have exhibited their radical errors and defects he would have compared them with the humbler philosophy of observation and experience and he would have shown that they had accomplished nothing and that in the very nature of things they could accomplish nothing for the advancement of real knowledge as he gazed upon that most impressive spectacle before him so many of his young countrymen gathered at the peaceful summons of science and humanity from all portions of the grecian territory filled with hope with ardour with promise life's full and radiant future stretching far and fair before them a cloud of sadness could hardly fail to throw its shadow over his features as he remembered the long thirty years of civil discord of deadly internecine strife through which his country had just passed and his closing words could hardly fail to rise into a patriotic and panhellenic hymn 
the burden of which should be that the glory and happiness and safety of greece were to be found in the union of her states that they whom he addressed his young friends and disciples were the common and equal heirs of the glory of marathon and thermopylae and they all spoke the language of homer that while they need not forget but might be proud even that they were spartans or athenians or thebans or thessalians they ought to remember with a higher pride that they were also and more than all greeks that they had a common country and that a common destiny awaited them end of chapter six part two chapter seven a backwood physiologist part one come with me for a few moments on a lovely june day in eighteen twenty two to what were then far off northern wilds to the island of michilimackinaw where the waters of lake michigan and lake huron unite and where stands fort mackinaw rich in the memories of indian and voyageur one of the four important posts on the upper lakes in the days when the rose and the fleur-de-lis strove for mastery of the western world here the noble marquette labored for his lord and here beneath the chapel of st ignace they laid his bones to rest here the intrepid la salle the brave tonti and the resolute duluth had halted in their wild wanderings its palisades and blockhouses had echoed the war-hoops of ojibwa and ottawas of hurons and iroquois and the old fort had been the scene of bloody massacres and hard-fought fights but at the conclusion of the war of eighteen twelve after two centuries of struggle peace settled at last on the island the fort was occupied by united states troops who kept the indians in check and did general police duty on the frontier and the place had become a rendezvous for indians and voyageurs in the employ of the american fur company on this bright spring morning the village presented an animated scene the annual return tide to the trading post was in full course and the beach was thronged with canoes and bateaux laden with the pelts of the winter's hunt voyageurs and indians men women and children with here and there a few soldiers made up a motley crowd suddenly from the company's store there is a loud report of a gun and amid the confusion and excitement the rumor spreads of an accident and there is a hurrying of messengers to the barracks for a doctor in a few minutes beaumont says twenty-five or thirty an eye-witness says three an alert-looking man in the uniform of a u s army surgeon made his way through the crowd and was at the side of a young french canadian who had been wounded by the discharge of a gun and with a composure bred of an exceptional experience of such injuries prepared to make the examination though youthful in appearance surgeon beaumont had seen much service and at the capture of york and at the investment of plattsburg he had shown a coolness and bravery under fire which had won high praise from his superior officers the man and the opportunity had met the outcome is my story of this evening one the opportunity alexis st martin on the morning of june six a young french canadian alexis st martin was standing in the company's store where one of the party was holding a shotgun not a musket which was accidentally discharged the whole charge entering st martin's body the muzzle was not over three feet from him i think not more than two the wadding entered as well as pieces of his clothing his shirt took fire he fell as we supposed dead dr beaumont the surgeon of the fort was immediately sent for and reached the wounded man in a very short time probably three minutes we had just gotten him on a cot and were taking off some of his clothing after the doctor had extracted part of the shot together with pieces of clothing and dressed his wound carefully robert stewart and others assisting he left him remarking the man cannot live thirty-six hours i will come and see him by and by in two or three hours he visited him again expressing surprise at finding him doing better than he had anticipated the next day after getting out more shot and clothing and cutting off ragged edges of the wound he informed mr stewart in my presence that he thought he would recover 
the description of the wound has been so often quoted as reported in beaumont's work that i give here the interesting summary which i find in a memorial presented to the senate and house of representatives by beaumont the wound was received just under the left breast and supposed at the time to have been mortal a large portion of the side was blown off the ribs fractured and openings made into the cavities of the chest and abdomen through which protruded portions of the lungs and stomach much lacerated and burnt exhibiting altogether an appalling and hopeless case the diaphragm was lacerated and a perforation made directly into the cavity of the stomach through which food was escaping at the time your memorialist was called to his relief his life was at first wholly despaired of but he very unexpectedly survived the immediate effects of the wound and necessarily continued a long time under the constant professional care and treatment of your memorialist and by the blessing of god finally recovered his health and strength at the end of about ten months the wound was partially healed but he was still an object altogether miserable and helpless in this situation he was declared a common pauper by the civil authorities of the county and it was resolved by them that they were not able nor required to provide for or support and finally declined taking care of him and in pursuance of what they probably believed to be their public duty authorized by the laws of the territory were about to transport him in this condition to the place of his nativity in lower canada a distance of more than fifteen hundred miles believing the life of st martin must inevitably be sacrificed if such attempt to remove him should be carried into execution at that time your memorialist after earnest repeated but unavailing remonstrances against such a course of proceedings resolved as the only way to rescue st martin from impending misery and death to arrest the process of transportation and prevent the consequent suffering by taking him into his own private family where all the care and attention were bestowed that his condition required st martin was at this time as before intimated altogether helpless and suffering under the debilitating effects of his wounds naked and destitute of everything in this situation your memorialist received kept nursed medically and surgically treated and sustained him at much inconvenience and expense for nearly two years dressing his wounds daily and for considerable part of the time twice a day nursed him fed him clothed him lodged him and furnished him with such necessaries and comforts as his condition and suffering required at the end of these two years he had become able to walk and help himself a little though unable to provide for his own necessities in this situation your memorialist retained st martin in his family for the special purpose of making physiological experiments in the month of may eighteen twenty five beaumont began the experiments in june he was ordered to fort niagara where taking the man with him he continued the experiments until august he then took him to burlington and to plattsburg from the latter place st martin returned to canada without obtaining dr beaumont's consent he remained in canada four years worked as a voyageur married and had two children in eighteen twenty nine beaumont succeeded in getting track of st martin and the american fur company engaged him and transported him to fort crawford on the upper mississippi the side and wound were in the same condition as in eighteen twenty five experiments were continued uninterruptedly until march eighteen thirty one when circumstances made it expedient that he should return with his family to lower canada the circumstances as we gather from letters were the discontent and homesickness of his wife as illustrating the mode of travel beaumont states that st martin took his family in an open canoe via the mississippi passing by st louis ascended the ohio river then crossed the state of ohio to the lakes and descended the erie and ontario and the river st lawrence to montreal where they arrived in june dr beaumont often lay stress on the physical vigor of st martin as showing how completely he had recovered from the wound 
in november eighteen thirty two he again engaged himself to submit to another series of experiments in plattsburgh and washington the last recorded experiment is in november eighteen thirty three among the beaumont papers for an examination of which i am much indebted to his daughter mrs keime appendix a there is a large mass of correspondence relating to st martin extending from eighteen twenty seven two years after he had left the doctor's employ to october eighteen fifty two alexis was in dr beaumont's employ in the periods already specified in eighteen thirty three he was enrolled in the united states army at washington as sergeant alexis st martin of a detachment of orderlies stationed at the war department he was then twenty-eight years of age and was five feet five inches in height among the papers there are two articles of agreement both signed by the contracting parties one dated october nineteen eighteen thirty three and the other november seven of the same year in the former he bound himself for a term of one year to serve and abide and continue with the said william beaumont wherever he shall go or travel or reside in any part of the world his covenant servant and diligently and faithfully etc that he the said alexis will at all times during said term when thereto directed or required by said william submit to assist and promote by all means in his power such philosophical or medical experiments as the said william shall direct or cause to be made on or in the stomach of him the said alexis either through and by means of the aperture or opening thereto in the sight of him the said alexis or otherwise and will obey suffer and comply with all reasonable and proper orders of or experiments of the said william in relation thereto and in relation to the exhibiting and showing of his said stomach and the powers and properties thereto and of the appurtenances and the powers properties and situation and state of the contents thereof the agreement was that he should be paid his board and lodging and a hundred and fifty dollars for the year in the other agreement it is for two years and the remuneration four hundred dollars he was paid a certain amount of the money down there are some letters from alexis himself all written for him and signed with his mark in june eighteen thirty four he writes that his wife was not willing to let him go and thinks that he can do a great deal better to stay at home from this time on alexis was never again in dr beaumont's employ there is a most interesting and protracted correspondence in the years eighteen thirty six eighteen thirty seven thirty eight thirty nine forty forty two forty six fifty one and eighteen fifty two all relating to attempts to induce alexis to come to st louis for the greater part of this time he was in berthier in the district of montreal and the correspondence was chiefly conducted with the mr william morrison who had been in the northwest fur trade and who took the greatest interest in alexis and tried to induce him to go to st louis see appendix b in eighteen forty six beaumont sent his son israel for alexis and in a letter dated august ninth eighteen forty six his son writes from troy i have just returned from montreal but without alexis upon arriving at berthier i found that he owned and lived on a farm about fifteen miles southwest of the village nothing would induce him to go the correspondence with mr morrison in eighteen fifty one and fifty two is most voluminous and dr beaumont offered alexis five hundred dollars for the year with comfortable support for his family he agreed at one time to go but it was too late in the winter and he could not get away the last letter of the series is dated october fifteenth eighteen fifty two and is from dr beaumont to alexis whom he addresses as mon ami two sentences in this are worth quoting without reference to past efforts and disappointments or expectation of ever obtaining your services again for the purpose of experiments etc upon the proposals and conditions heretofore made and suggested 
I now proffer to you, in faith and sincerity, new and, I hope, satisfactory terms and conditions to ensure your prompt and faithful compliance with my most fervent desire to have you again with me, not only for my own individual gratification and the benefits of medical science, but also for your own and family's present good and future welfare. He concludes with, I can say no more, Alexis. You know what I have done for you many years since, what I have been trying and am still anxious and wishing to do with and for you, what efforts, anxieties, anticipations, and disappointments I have suffered from your non-fulfillment of my expectations. Don't disappoint me more, nor forfeit the bounties and blessings reserved for you." So much interest was excited by the report of the experiments that it was suggested to Beaumont that he should take Alexis to Europe and submit him there to a more extended series of observations by skilled physiologists. Writing June 10, 1833, he says, I shall engage him for five or six years if he will agree, of which I expect there is no doubt. He has always been pleased with the idea of going to France. I feel much gratified at the expression of Mr. Livingston's desire that we should visit Paris, and shall duly consider the interest he takes in the subject, and make the best arrangements I can to meet his views and yours. Mr. Livingston, the American minister, wrote from Paris, March 18, 1834, saying that he had submitted the work to Orfila and the Academy of Sciences, which had appointed a committee to determine if additional experiments were necessary, and whether it was advisable to send to America for Alexis. Nothing, I believe, ever came of this, nor, so far as I can find, did Alexis visit Paris. Other attempts were made to secure him for purposes of study. In 1840, a student of Dr. Beaumont's, George Johnson, then at the University of Pennsylvania, wrote, saying that Dr. Jackson had told him of efforts made to get Alexis to London, and Dr. Gibson informed him that the Medical Society of London had raised three hundred pounds or four hundred pounds to induce St. Martin to come, and that he, Dr. Gibson, had been trying to find St. Martin for his London friends. There are letters in the same year from Dr. R. D. Thompson of London to Professor Silliman urging him to arrange that Dr. Beaumont and Alexis should visit London. In 1856, St. Martin was under the observation of Dr. Francis Gurney Smith in Philadelphia, who reported a brief series of experiments, so far as I know, the only other report made on him. St. Martin had to stand a good deal of chaffing about the hole in his side. His comrades called him the man with a lid on his stomach. In his memorial address, Dr. C. S. Osborne of Sault-Saint-Marie states that Miss Catherwood tells a story of Etienne St. Martin fighting with Charlie Charrot because Charlie ridiculed his brother. Etienne stabbed him severely and swore that he would kill the whole brigade if they did not stop deriding his brother's stomach. At one time St. Martin traveled about, exhibiting the wound to physicians, medical students, and before medical societies. In a copy of Beaumont's work, formerly belonging to Austin Flint, Jr., and now in the possession of a physician of St. Louis, there is a photograph of Alexis sent to Dr. Flint. There are statements made that he went to Europe, but of such a visit I can find no record. My interest in St. Martin was of quite the general character of a teacher of physiology, who every session referred to his remarkable wound and showed Beaumont's book with the illustration. In the spring of 1880, while still a resident of Montreal, I saw a notice in the newspapers of his death at St. Thomas. I immediately wrote to a physician and to the parish priest, urging them to secure me the privilege of an autopsy, and offering to pay a fair sum for the stomach, which I agreed to place in the Army Medical Museum in Washington, but without avail. Subsequently, through the kindness of the Honorable Mr. Justice Babby, I obtained the following details of St. Martin's later life. Judge Babby writes to his friend, Professor D. C. McCallum of Montreal, as follows. I have much pleasure today in placing in your hands such information about St. Martin as Rev. Mr. Scissioni, Curé of St. Thomas, has just handed over to me. 
Alexis Bridigan, dit St. Martin, died at St. Thomas de Joliet on the 24th of June, 1880, and was buried in the cemetery of the parish on the 28th of the same month. The last sacraments of the Catholic Church were ministered to him by the Reverend Cure Scicione, who also attended at his burial service. The body was then in such an advanced stage of decomposition that it could not be admitted into the church, but had to be left outside during the funeral service. The family resisted all requests, most pressing as they were, on the part of the members of the medical profession for an autopsy, and also kept the body at home much longer than usual, and during a hot spell of weather, so as to allow decomposition to set in, and baffle, as they thought, the doctors of the surrounding country, and others. They had also the grave dug eight feet below the surface of the ground, in order to prevent any attempt at a resurrection when he died st martin was eighty-three years of age and left a widow whose maiden name was marie jolie she survived him by nearly seven years dying at st thomas on the twentieth of april eighteen eighty seven at the very old age of ninety years they left four children still alive alexis charles henriette and marie now i may add the following details for myself when i came to know st martin it must have been a few years before his death a lawsuit brought him to my office here in Joliet. I was seized with his interests. He came to my office a good many times, during which visits he spoke to me at great length of his former life, how his wound had been caused, his peregrinations through Europe and the United States, etc. He showed me his wound. He complained bitterly of some doctors who had awfully misused him, and had kind words for others. He had made considerable money during his tours, but had expended and thrown it all away in a frolicsome way, especially in the old country. When I came across him, he was rather poor, living on a small, scanty farm in St. Thomas, and very much addicted to drink, almost a drunkard, one might say. He was a tall, lean man with a very dark complexion, and appeared to me then of a morose disposition. 2 the book in the four periods in which alexis had been under the care and study of beaumont a large series of observations had been recorded amounting in all to two hundred and thirty eight a preliminary account of the case and of the first group of observations appeared in the philadelphia medical recorder in january eighteen twenty five during the stay in washington in eighteen thirty two the great importance of the observations had become impressed on the surgeon general dr lovell who seems to have acted in a most generous and kindly spirit beaumont tried to induce him to undertake the arrangement of the observations but lovell insisted that he should do the work himself in the spring of eighteen thirty three alexis was taken to new york and there shown to the prominent members of the profession and careful drawings and colored sketches were made of the wound by mr king a prospectus of the work was issued and was distributed by the surgeon general who speaks in a letter of sending them to dr franklin bach and to dr stewart of philadelphia and in a letter from dr bach to dr beaumont acknowledging the receipt of a bottle of gastric juice bach states that he has placed the prospectus in mr judah dobson's store and has asked for subscribers beaumont did not find new york a very congenial place he complained of the difficulty of doing the work owing to the vexatious social intercourse. He applied for permission to go to Plattsburgh in order to complete the book. After having made inquiries in New York and Philadelphia about terms of publication, he decided, as the work had to be issued at his own expense, that it could be as well and much more cheaply printed at Plattsburgh, where he would also have the advice and help of his cousin, Dr. Samuel Beaumont. In a letter to the Surgeon General, dated June 10, 1833, he acknowledges the permission to go to Plattsburgh and says, I shall make my arrangements to leave here for Plattsburgh in about a week to rush the execution of the book as fast as possible. I am now having the drawings taken by Mr. King engraved here. The summer was occupied in making a fresh series of experiments and getting the work in type. 
on december three he writes to the surgeon general that the book will be ready for distribution in a few days and that a thousand copies will be printed the book is an octavo volume of two hundred and eighty pages entitled experiments and observations on the gastric juice and the physiology of digestion by william beaumont m d surgeon in the united states army plattsburgh printed by f p allen eighteen thirty three while it is well and carefully printed the paper and type are not of the best and one cannot but regret that beaumont did not take the advice of dr franklin bach who urged him strongly not to have the work printed at plattsburgh but in philadelphia where it could be done in very much better style the dedication of the work to joseph lovell m d surgeon general of the united states army acknowledges in somewhat laudatory terms the debt which beaumont felt he owed to his chief who very gratefully acknowledges the compliment and the kindly feeling but characterizes the dedication as somewhat apocryphal the work is divided into two main portions first the preliminary observations on the general physiology of digestion in seven sections section one of aliment section two of hunger and thirst section three of satisfaction and satiety section four of mastication insalivation and deglutition section five of digestion by the gastric juice section six of the appearance of the villus coat and of the motions of the stomach section seven of chilification and uses of the bile and pancreatic juice the greater part of the book is occupied by the larger section of the detailed account of the four series of experiments and observations the work concludes with a series of fifty-one inferences from the foregoing experiments and observations the subsequent history of the book itself is of interest and may be dealt with here in eighteen thirty four copies of the plattsburgh edition printed by f p allen were issued by lilly waite and company of boston in the beaumont correspondence there are many letters from a dr mccall in utica new york who was an intimate friend of a mr william combe a brother of the well-known physiologist and popular writer dr andrew combe of edinburgh doubtless it was through this connection that in eighteen thirty eight dr combe issued an edition in scotland with numerous notes and comments appendix c the second edition was issued from burlington vermont in eighteen forty seven with the same title page but after second edition there are the words corrected by samuel beaumont m d who was dr william beaumont's cousin in the preface to this edition the statement is made that the first edition though a large one of three thousand copies had been exhausted this does not agree with the statement made in a letter of december three eighteen thirty three to the surgeon general stating that the edition was to be one thousand copies of course more may have been printed before the type was distributed while it is stated to be a new and improved edition so far as i can gather it is a verbatim reprint with no additional observations but with a good many minor corrections in an appendix d i give an interesting letter from dr samuel beaumont with reference to the issue of this edition a german edition was issued in eighteen thirty four with the following title neue versuche und beobachtungen über den magensaft und die physiologie der verdauung auf eine höchst merkwürdige weise während einer reihe von sieben jahren an einem und demselben subjekt angestellt beaumont's earlier paper already referred to was abstracted in the magasin der ausländischen literatur der gesamten heilkunde hamburg eighteen twenty six and also in the archive general de medicine paris eighteen twenty eight i cannot find that there was a french edition of the work the experiments and observations attracted universal attention both at home and abroad the journals of the period contained very full accounts of the work and within a few years the valuable additions to our knowledge filtered into the textbooks of physiology which to-day in certain descriptions of the gastric juice and of the phenomena of digestion 
copy even the very language of the work. 3. The Value of Beaumont's Observations there had been other instances of artificial gastric fistula in man which had been made the subject of experimental study, but the case of St. Martin stands out from all others on account of the ability and care with which the experiments were conducted. As Dr. Combs says, the value of these experiments consists partly in the admirable opportunities for observation which Beaumont enjoyed, and partly in the candid and truth-seeking spirit in which all his inquiries seem to have been conducted. It would be difficult to point out any observer who excels him in devotion to truth and freedom from the trammels of theory or prejudice. He tells plainly what he saw, and leaves every one to draw his own inferences, or where he lays down conclusions, he does so with a degree of modesty and fairness of which few perhaps in his circumstances would have been capable. To appreciate the value of Beaumont studies, it is necessary to refer for a few moments to our knowledge of the physiology of digestion in the year 1832, the date of the publication. Take, for example, the work on human physiology, published in the very year of the appearance of Beaumont's book, by Dunglison, a man of wide learning and thoroughly informed in the literature of the subject. The five or six old theories of stomach digestion, concoction, putrefaction, trituration, fermentation, and maceration are all discussed and William Hunter's pithy remark is quoted, some physiologists will have it that the stomach is a mill, others that it is a fermenting vat, others again that it is a stewpan, but in my view of the matter it is neither a mill, a fermenting vat, nor a stewpan, but a stomach, gentlemen, a stomach. The theory of chemical solution is accepted. This had been placed on a sound basis by the experiments of Raymour, Spallanzani, and Stevens, while the studies of Tiedemann and Gemellen and of Prout had done much to solve the problems of the chemistry of the juice. But very much uncertainty existed as to the phenomena occurring during digestion in the stomach, the precise mode of action of the juice, the nature of the juice itself, and its action outside the body. On all these points the observations of Beaumont brought clearness and light where there had been previously the greatest obscurity. The following may be regarded as the most important of the results of Beaumont's observations. First, the accuracy and completeness of description of the gastric juice itself. You will recognize the following quotation which has entered into the textbooks and passes current today pure gastric juice when taken directly out of the stomach of a healthy adult unmixed with any other fluid save a portion of the mucus of the stomach with which it is most commonly and perhaps always combined is a clear transparent fluid inodorous a little saltish and very perceptibly acid its taste when applied to the tongue is similar to this mucilaginous water slightly acidulated with muriatic acid it is readily diffusible in water, wine, or spirits, slightly effervesces with alkalis, and is an effectual solvent of the materia alimentaria. It possesses the property of coagulating albumen in an eminent degree, is powerfully antiseptic, checking the putrefaction of meat, and effectually restorative of healthy action when applied to old fetid sores and foul ulcerating surfaces. Secondly, the confirmation of the observation of Prout that the important acid of the gastric juice was the muriatic or hydrochloric. An analysis of St. Martin's gastric juice was made by Dunglison, at that time a professor at the University of Virginia, and by Benjamin Silliman of Yale, both of whom determined the presence of free hydrochloric acid. A specimen was sent to the distinguished Swedish chemist Berzelius, whose report did not arrive in time to be included in the work. In a letter dated July 19, 1834, he writes to Professor Silliman that he had not been able to make a satisfactory analysis of the juice. The letter is published in Silliman's Journal, Volume 27, July 1835. 
thirdly the recognition of the fact that the essential elements of the gastric juice and the mucus were separate secretions fourthly the establishment by direct observation of the profound influence of mental disturbances on the secretion of the gastric juice and on digestion fifthly a more accurate and fuller comparative study of the digestion in the stomach with digestion outside the body confirming in a most elaborate series of experiments the older observations of spallanzani and stevens sixthly the refutation of many erroneous opinions relating to gastric digestion and the establishment of a number of minor points of great importance such as for instance the rapid disappearance of water from the stomach through the pylorus a point brought out by recent experiments but insisted on and amply proved by beaumont seventhly the first comprehensive and thorough study of the motion of the stomach observations on which indeed is based the most of our present knowledge and lastly a study of the digestibility of different articles of diet in the stomach which remains to-day one of the most important contributions ever made to practical dietetics the greater rapidity with which solid food is digested the injurious effects on the stomach of tea and coffee when taken in excess the pernicious influence of alcoholic drinks on the digestion are constantly referred to an all-important practical point insisted on by beaumont needs emphatic reiteration to this generation the system requires much less than is generally supplied to it the stomach disposes of a definite quantity if more be taken than the actual wants of the economy require the residue remains in the stomach and becomes a source of irritation and produces a consequent aberration of function or passes into the lower bowel in an undigested state and extends to them its deleterious influence dyspepsia is often the effect of overeating and overdrinking than of any other cause one is much impressed too in going over the experiments to note with what modesty beaumont refers to his own work he speaks of himself as a humble inquirer after truth and a simple experimenter honest objections no doubt are entertained against the doctrine of digestion by the gastric juice that they are so entertained by these gentlemen i have no doubt and i cheerfully concede to them the merit of great ingenuity talents and learning in raising objections to the commonly received hypothesis as well as ability in maintaining their peculiar opinions but we ought not to allow ourselves to be seduced by the ingenuity of argument or the blandishments of style truth like beauty is when unadorned adorned the most and in prosecuting these experiments and inquiries i believe i have been guided by its light facts are more persuasive than arguments however ingeniously made and by their eloquence i hope i have been able to plead for the support and maintenance of those doctrines which have had for their advocates such men as sydenham hunter spallanzani ricaran abernathy brosses philip Paris, Bostock, the Heidelberg and Paris professors, Dunglison, and a host of other luminaries in the science of physiology. End of chapter 7, part 1 Chapter 7, A Backwood Physiologist, part 2 In reality, Beaumont anticipated some of the most recent studies in the physiology of digestion doubtless many of you have heard of professor pavlov's of st petersburg new work on the subject it has been translated into german and i see that an english edition is advertised he has studied the gastric juice in an isolated pouch ingeniously made at the fundus of the stomach of the dog from which the juice could be obtained in a pure state one of his results is the very first announced by beaumont and confirmed by scores of observations on st martin viz that as he says the gastric juice never appears to be accumulated in the cavity of the stomach while fasting pavlov has shown very clearly that there is a relation between the amount of food taken and the quantity of gastric juice secreted 
beaumont came to the same conclusion when aliment is received the juice is given in exact proportion to its requirements for solution a third point on which pavlov lays stress is the curve of secretion of the gastric juice the manner in which it is poured out during digestion the greatest secretion he has shown takes place in the earlier hours on this point hear beaumont it the gastric juice then begins to exude from the proper vessels and increases in proportion to the quantity of aliment naturally required and received and again when a due and moderate supply of food has been received it is probable that the whole quantity of gastric juice for its complete solution is secreted and mixed with it in a short time a fourth point worked out beautifully by pavlov is the adaptation of the juice to the nature of the food i do not see any reference to this by beaumont but there are no experiments more full than those in which he deals with the influence of exercise weather and the emotions on the quantity of the juice secreted four man and doctor sketches of mr beaumont's life have appeared from time to time there is a worthy memoir by dr t rayburn in the st louis medical and surgical journal eighteen fifty four and dr a j steele at the first annual commencement of the beaumont medical college eighteen eighty seven told well and graphically the story of his life a few years ago dr frank j lutz of this city sketched his life for the memorial meeting of the michigan state medical society on the occasion of the dedication of a beaumont monument among the papers kindly sent to me by his daughter mrs keim are many autobiographical materials particularly relating to his early studies and to his work as a surgeon in the war of eighteen twelve there is an excellent paper in the handwriting it is said of his son giving a summary of the early period of his life so far as i know this has not been published and i give it in full dr william beaumont was born in the town of lebanon connecticut on the twenty first day of november a d seventeen eighty five his father was a thriving farmer and an active politician of the proud old jeffersonian school whose highest boast was his firm support and strict adherence to the honest principles he advocated william was his third son who in the winter of eighteen o six seven in the twenty-second year of his age prompted by a spirit of independence and adventure left the paternal roof to seek a fortune and a name his outfit consisted of a horse and cutter a barrel of cider and one hundred dollars of hard-earned money with this he started laying his course northwardly without any particular destination honor his rule of action truth his only landmark and trust placed implicitly in heaven traversing the western part of massachusetts and vermont in the spring of eighteen o seven he arrived at the little village of champlain new york on the canadian frontier an utter stranger friendless and alone but honesty of purpose and true energy invariably work good results he soon gained the people's confidence and was entrusted with their village school which he conducted about three years devoting his leisure hours to the study of medical works from the library of dr seth pomeroy his first patron he then went over to st albans vermont where he entered the office of dr benjamin chandler and commenced a regular course of medical reading which he followed for two years gaining the utmost confidence and esteem of his kind preceptor and friends about this time the war of eighteen twelve commenced and he applied for an appointment in the u s army successfully he was appointed assistant surgeon to the sixth infantry and joined his regiment at plattsburg new york on the thirteenth of september eighteen twelve on the nineteenth of march eighteen thirteen he marched from plattsburg with the first brigade for sackett's harbor where they arrived on the twenty seventh instant here he remained in camp till the twenty second of april when he embarked with the troops on lake ontario his journal will best tell this portion of his history april twenty second eighteen thirteen embarked with captain humphreys walworth and muhlenberg and companies on board the schooner julia 
the rest of the brigade and the second with forsyth's rifle regiment and the eighth artillery on board a ship brig and schooner remain in the harbor till next morning twenty third eleven o'clock a m weighs anchor and put out under the impression we were going to kingston got out fifteen or twenty miles encountered a storm wind ahead and the fleet returned to harbor twenty fourth six o'clock a m put out with fair wind mild and pleasant the fleet sailing in fine order twenty sixth wind pretty strong increasing waves run high tossing our vessels roughly at half past four past the mouth of niagara river this circumstance baffles imagination as to where we are going first impressed with the idea of kingston then to niagara but now our destination must be little york at sunset came in view of yorktown and the fort where we lay off some three or four leagues for the night twenty seventh sailed into harbor and came to anchor a little below the british garrison filled the boats and effected a landing though not without difficulty and the loss of some men the british marched their troops down the beach to cut us off as landing and though they had every advantage they could not effect their design a hot engagement ensued in which the enemy lost nearly a third of their men and were soon compelled to quit the field leaving their dead and wounded strewn in every direction they retired to the garrison but from the loss sustained in the engagement the undaunted courage of our men and the brisk firing from our fleet with the twelve and thirty-two pounders they were soon obliged to evacuate it and retreat with all possible speed driven to this alternative they devised the inhuman project of blowing up their magazine containing three hundred pounds of powder the explosion of which had well-nigh destroyed our army over three hundred were wounded and about sixty killed on the spot by stones of all dimensions falling like a shower of hail in the midst of our ranks a most distressing scene ensues in the hospital nothing is heard but the agonizing groans and supplications of the wounded and the dying the surgeons wade in blood cutting off arms and legs and trepanning heads while the poor sufferers cry oh my god doctor relieve me from this misery i cannot live twas enough to touch the veriest heart of steel and move the most relentless savage imagine the shocking scene where fellow beings lie mashed and mangled legs and arms broken and sundered heads and bodies bruised and mutilated to disfigurement my deepest sympathies were aroused i cut and slashed for thirty-six hours without food or sleep twenty-ninth dressed upwards of fifty patients from simple contusions to the worst of compound fractures more than half the latter performed two cases of amputation and one of trepanning at twelve p m retired to rest my fatigued body and mind one month after the taking of york he witnessed the storming of fort george the troops were transported from york to four mile creek in the vicinity of fort george where they encamped from the tenth of may to the twenty seventh when they advanced to the attack his journal runs thus may twenty seven eighteen thirteen embarked at break of day colonel scott with eight hundred men for the advanced guard supported by the first brigade commanded by general boyd moved in concert with the shipping to the enemy's shore and landed under their battery and in front of their fire with surprising success not losing more than thirty men in the engagement though the enemy's whole force was placed in the most advantageous situation possible we routed them from their chosen spot drove them from the country and took possession of the town and garrison on the eleventh of september eighteen fourteen he was at the battle of plattsburg still serving as assistant surgeon though doing all the duty of a full surgeon at the close of the war in eighteen fifteen when the army was cut down he was retained in service but resigned soon after deeming himself unjustly treated by the government in having others younger and less experienced promoted over him 
in eighteen sixteen he settled in plattsburg and remained there four years in successful practice in the meantime his army friends had persuaded him to join the service again and having applied he was reappointed in eighteen twenty and ordered to fort mackinaw as post surgeon at the end of the first year he obtained leave of absence returned to plattsburg and married one of the most amiable and interesting ladies of that place she still survives her honored husband and in her green old age is loved devotedly by all who know her he returned to mackinaw the same year and in eighteen twenty two came in possession of alexis st martin the subject of his experiments on the gastric juice by the accidental discharge of his gun while hunting st martin had dangerously wounded himself in the abdomen and come under the treatment of dr beaumont who healed the wound in itself a triumph of skill almost unequalled and in eighteen twenty five commenced a series of experiments the results of which have a world-wide publication these experiments were continued with various interruptions for eight years during which time he was ordered from post to post now at niagara new york anon at green bay michigan and finally at fort crawford on the mississippi in eighteen thirty four he was ordered to st louis where he remained in service till eighteen thirty nine when he resigned he then commenced service with the citizens of st louis and from that time till the period of his last illness enjoyed an extensive and distinguished practice interrupted only by the base attacks of a few disgraceful and malicious knaves self-deemed members of the medical profession who sought to destroy a reputation which they could not share they gained nothing except some little unenviable notoriety and they have skulked away like famished wolves to die in their hiding places the dates of beaumont's commissions in the army are as follows surgeon's mate sixth regiment of infantry december two eighteen twelve cavalry march twenty seven eighteen nineteen post surgeon december four eighteen nineteen surgeon first regiment and surgeon november sixth eighteen twenty six from the biographical sketches of rayburn steele and lutz and from the personal reminiscences of his friends doctors j b johnson s polack and william mcfeeders who fortunately remains with you full of years and honors we gather a clearly defined picture of the latter years of his life it is that of a faithful honest hard-working practitioner doing his duty to his patients and working with zeal and ability for the best interests of the profession the strong common sense which he exhibited in his experimental work made him a good physician and a trusty adviser in cases of surgery among his letters there are some interesting pictures of his life particularly in his letters to his cousin dr samuel beaumont writing to him april four eighteen forty six he says i have a laborious lucrative and increasing practice more than i can possibly attend to though i have an assistant dr johnson a young man who was a pupil of mine from eighteen thirty five to eighteen forty he then went to philadelphia a year or two to attend lectures and graduated and returned here again in eighteen forty two and has been very busy ever since and is so now but notwithstanding i decline more practice daily than half the doctors in the city get in a week you thought when you were here before that there was too much competition for you ever to think of succeeding in business here there is ten times as much now and the better i succeed and prosper for it you must come with a different feeling from your former with a determination to follow in my wake and stem the current that i will break for you i am now in the grand climateric of life threescore years and over with equal or more zeal and ability to do good and contribute to professional service than at forty-five and i now look forward with pleasing anticipation of success and greater usefulness have ample competence for ourselves and children and no doleful or dreaded aspect of the future 
to be sure i have to wrestle with some adverse circumstances of life and more particularly to defend myself against the envious mean and professional jealousies and the consequent prejudices of some men but i triumph over them all and go ahead in defiance of them his professional work increased enormously with the rapid growth of the city but he felt even in his old age that delicious exhilaration which it is your pleasure and privilege to enjoy here in the west in a degree rarely experienced by your eastern confreres here is a cheerful paragraph from a letter dated october twenty eighteen fifty two domestic affairs are easy peaceable and pleasant health of community good no severe epidemic diseases prevalent weather remarkably pleasant business of all kinds increasing product of the earth abundant money plenty railroads progressing with almost telegraphic speed i expect to come to plattsburgh next summer all the way by rail but work was becoming more burdensome to a man nearing threescore years and ten and he expresses it in another letter when he says there is an immense professional practice in this city i get tired of it and have been trying hard to withdraw from it altogether but the more i try the tighter i seem to be held to it by the people i am actually persecuted worried and almost worn out with valutatarian importunities and hypochondriacal groans repinings and lamentations amen he continued at work until march eighteen fifty three when he had an accident a fall while descending some steps a few weeks later a carbuncle appeared on the neck and proved fatal april twenty five one who knew him well wrote the following estimate quoted by dr f j lutz in his sketch of beaumont he was gifted with strong natural powers which working upon an extensive experience in life resulted in a species of natural sagacity which as i suppose was something peculiar in him and not to be obtained by any course of study his temperament was ardent but never got the better of his instructed and disciplined judgment and whenever or however employed he ever adopted the most judicious means for attaining ends that were always honourable in the sick-room he was a model of patience and kindness his intuitive perceptions guiding a pure benevolence never failed to inspire confidence and thus he belonged to that class of physicians whose very presence affords nature a sensible relief you do well citizens of st louis and members of our profession to cherish the memory of william beaumont alive you honored and rewarded him and there is no reproach against you of neglected merit and talents unrecognized the profession of the northern part of the state of michigan has honored itself in erecting a monument to his memory near the scene of his disinterested labors in the cause of humanity and science his name is linked with one of your educational institutions and joined with that of a distinguished laborer in another field of practice but he has a far higher honor than any you can give him here the honor that can only come when the man and the opportunity meet and match beaumont is the pioneer physiologist of this country the first to make an important and enduring contribution to this science his work remains a model of patient persevering investigation experiment and research and the highest praise we can give him is to say that he lived up to and fulfilled the ideals with which he set out and which he expressed when he said truth like beauty is when unadorned adorned the most and in prosecuting these experiments and inquiries i believe i have been guided by its light appendix a the beaumont papers in the possession of his daughter mrs keim of st louis consists of one interesting certificates from his preceptors dr pomeroy and dr chandler the license from the third medical society of vermont the commissions in the u s army several certificates of honorary membership in societies and the parchment of the m d degree conferred upon him honoris causa by the columbian university of washington eighteen thirty three 
2. A journal containing his experiences in the War of 1812, from which I have given an extract, a journal of his trip to Fort Mackinac, a journal containing the reports of many cases, among them that of St. Martin, in addition there is a protocol of the case in loose folio sheets, a journal of the experiments and a commonplace book of receipts and jottings. 3 an extensive correspondence relating to st martin and the book and many rough drafts of sections of the book four a large mass of personal correspondence much of it of interest as relating to conditions of practice in st louis the family has a miniature of him in his army uniform the only picture which has been reproduced is of an older man from a daguerreotype it is satisfactory to know that the ultimate destination of this most valuable collection of papers is the Surgeon General's Library of the United States Army, of which Dr. Beaumont was so distinguished an ornament. Appendix B. On October 20, 1852, he writes to his cousin, Dr. Samuel Beaumont, on the subject of that old fistulous Alexis, as he calls him. Alexis' answer to yours is the very facsimile or stereotype of all his Jesuitical letters to me for the last fifteen years. His object seems only to be to get a heavy bonus and undo advance from me and then disappoint and deceive me or to palm and impose himself and whole family upon me for support for life. I have evaded his design so far but I verily fear that the strong and increasing impulse of conscious conviction of the great benefits and important usefulness of further and more accurate physiological investigation of the subject will compel me to still further efforts and sacrifices to obtain him. Physiological authors and most able writers on dietetics and gastric functions generally demanded of me in trumpet tones i must have him at all hazards and obtain the necessary assistance to my individual and private efforts or transfer him to some competent scientific institution for thorough investigation and report i must retrieve my past ignorance imbecility and professional remissness of a quarter of a century or more by double diligence intense study and untiring application of soul and body to the subject before i die should posthumous time retain my name let historic truths declare my fame simultaneous with this i write to mr morrison and alexis my last and final letters perhaps proposing to him as bribe to his cupidity to give him five hundred dollars to come to me without his family for one year three hundred dollars of them for his salary and two hundred dollars for the support and contentment of his family to remain in canada in the meantime with the privilege of bringing them on here another year upon my former proposition of three hundred dollars a year at his own expense and responsibility and support them himself after they get here out of his three hundred dollar salary i think he will take the bait and come on this fall and when i get him alone again into my keeping and engagement i will take good care to control him as i please appendix c letter from dr andrew Combe, may one eighteen thirty eight my dear sir may i beg your acceptance of the accompanying volumes as a small expression of my respect for your character and scientific labors i need not detain you by repeating in this note the high estimation in which i hold you the volumes herewith sent will i trust convince you of the fact and that it will not be my fault if you do not receive the credit justly due to your valuable and disinterested services i remain my dear sir very respectfully yours andrew Combe. appendix d letter from dr samuel beaumont march sixteenth eighteen forty six your letter of the first of february arrived here in the course of mail and i have attended to the business which you authorized me to do i am afraid however that you will be disappointed and perhaps dissatisfied with the arrangement 
mr goodrich came here some five or six days after i received your letter and made his proposal which was to give you every tenth copy for the privilege of publishing an edition the number he proposed to publish was fifteen hundred which would give you a hundred and fifty copies i did not like to close the bargain on this condition and he was not disposed to give any more this was in the evening i told him to give me time till the next morning and i would make up my mind in the morning after consultation i concluded to offer him the copyright for the unexpired time only one year for two hundred copies after some demurring we closed the bargain i then thought and i still think it was not enough but it was all i could get in making up my mind the following considerations presented themselves first that the copyright would expire in one year and he would then have the right to print it without consulting the author second that it would be somewhat mortifying to the author not to have his work republished even if no great pecuniary benefit was to be obtained by such a republication and it appeared to me to be quite certain that a new edition would not be soon printed if i let this opportunity slip third i have been long anxious as i presume you have been to see the work gotten up in a better dress than it originally had and in a way which will give it a general credit and more notoriety among all classes of the reading public than it has heretofore possessed in fact make it a standard work fourth it has given us a chance to give it a thorough correction a thing which was very desirable the work you recollect was got up in a great hurry and a great many errors escaped our notice you may also recollect that the philadelphia reviewer spoke of the inaccuracies in the work and he had reason enough for it in looking over the work critically with a view of correction i have been perfectly astonished at the errors that occur on almost every page and although we understood perfectly what we meant to say the reader would find it somewhat difficult to decipher our meaning in the first hundred and forty pages i made nearly three hundred corrections these are practically merely verbal alterations or change of phrases or sentences so as to make them more accurate or perspicuous i have in no case so changed the text as to give it a different meaning i flatter myself that it will now be more worthy the public patronage and if for no other this chance for correction i consider alone almost a sufficient remuneration for the brief limits of the copyright i have also written a preface for the second edition making quotations from american and european authorities in praise of the merits of the work from delicacy i have written this as from the publisher i think it is pretty well done the work will probably be published in the course of about a month and those designed for you will be delivered to me when i shall send them to you he guarantees not to sell in the state of missouri or the states south and west of that state but that of course is all gammon the book will be thrown into market and he cannot control the direction in which it will go End of chapter 7, part 2 Chapter 8, The Influence of Louis on American Medicine Harvey and Sydenham, types of the scientific and the practical physician, though contemporaries, were uninfluenced, so far as we know, by each other's work or method harvey had little reputation as a practical physician and sydenham cared little for theories or experiment modern scientific medicine in which these two great types meet had its rise in france in the early days of this century true there had lived and worked in england the greatest anatomist and medical thinker of modern times but john hunter to whose broad vision disease was but one of the processes of nature to be studied was as a voice crying in the wilderness to the speculative theoretical physicians of his day bichat's anatomie generale laid the foundation of the positive or modern method of the study of medicine in which theory and reasoning were replaced by observation and analysis 
Lenec, with the stethoscope and with an accurate study of disease at the bedside and in the post-mortem room, almost created clinical medicine as we know it today. The study of fevers occupied the attention of all the great physicians of the time. Fever, what it was, how it should be treated. What a vast literature exists between Sydenham and Broussais. What a desolate sea of theory and speculation. No one had been more influenced by Bichat's brilliant teachings than Broussais, who ruled supreme in the medical world of Paris in the early decades of the 19th century. A strong believer in careful observations at the bedside and in the post-mortem room, he was led into hopeless error in attributing fevers and many other disorders to irritation in the stomach and intestines, his gastroenteritis. Writing in the American Medical Recorder, July 1821, an American student, Dr. F. J. Didier, said of the Paris professors of that date, they were always talking of Hippocrates, Galen, Celsus, and so forth, as if not a particle had been added to the stock of knowledge since their time. And again, the doctrines of John Brown, mixed up with the remnants of humoral pathology, form the basis of the present system. The same mixture prevailed early in the fourth decade, as you may see from Broussais's Pathology, the American edition of which was issued in 1832, and from Jackson's Samuel, Principles of Medicine, published in the same year. Upon this scene, when Broussais was at the height of his fame, came Louis. He, with his friends Andral and Chomel, were very important factors in substituting finally in the study of medicine for speculation and theory, observation and method. The chief facts in Louis' life may be thus briefly stated. He was born in 1787 at I. He began the study of law, but abandoned it for that of medicine. He seems not to have been of a very strong constitution, as he did not pass the inspection for military service. He began the study of medicine at Rennes, and completed his course in Paris, where he graduated in 1813, in the twenty-seventh year of his age. While waiting at home, hesitating what he should do, Monsieur le Comte de Saint-Prix, who occupied an official position in Russia, happened to stay for a few hours in the town of Aix to see Louis's family, and it was suggested that the young physician should accompany him to Russia. He consented, and in St. Petersburg obtained a diploma to practice. For three years he seems to have had no settled abode, but wandered about with his friend, who was governor of one of the provinces. He then settled in Odessa, where he remained for four years, and practiced with great success. In the last year of his stay in Odessa he was very much disturbed by the high rate of mortality in children with diphtheria, and this appears to have determined him to abandon for a time the practice of medicine and to devote himself to study. With this object in view he returned to Paris and for six months attended the practice at the children's hospital. Among the younger physicians in Paris he found an old fellow pupil, Jamel, physician to La Carité, who offered him opportunities for work in his wards. Louis at this time was thirty-four years of age. Here for six years, uninterruptedly, he set himself to work to study disease in the wards and in the post-mortem room. At first he appears to have occupied the position simply as a voluntary assistant and friend of Chamel, but subsequently he became his chef de clinique, and during this period he occupied a room in the entresol of the hospital. He was a voluminous note-taker, and collected in this time an enormous number of important facts. This remarkable feature in Louis' life has scarcely been dwelt upon sufficiently. I know of no other parallel instance in the history of medicine. It is worth while reading the brief extract from Dr. Cowan's introduction to his translation of the work on phthisis. He entered the hospital of La Charité as a clinical clerk under his friend Professor Chomel. For nearly seven years, including the flower of his bodily and mental powers from the age of thirty-three to forty, he consecrated the whole of his time and talents to rigorous impartial observation. 
all private practice was relinquished and he allowed no considerations of personal emolument to interfere with the resolution he had formed for some time his extreme minuteness of inquiry and accuracy of description were the subjects of sneering and ridicule and to what end was not infrequently and tauntingly asked the absence of any immediate result seemed for a time to justify their contempt of a method involving too much labor and personal sacrifice to be generally popular or easily imitated and m louis himself at moments almost yielded to the increasing difficulties of the task he had undertaken no sooner however were his facts sufficiently numerous to admit of numerical analysis than all doubt and hesitation were dissipated and the conviction that the path he was pursuing could alone conduct him to the discovery of truth became the animating motive for future perseverance many of the results to which he arrived soon attracted general attention and among those who had formerly derided his method while they admired his zeal he found many to applaud and a few to imitate from this moment may be dated the presence of that strong impression of the necessity of exact observation by which the school of paris has been since so distinguished and which is now gradually pervading the medical institutions of the continent and our own country it is undoubtedly to the author of the present volume that we ought to ascribe the practical revival of that system which had for ages been verbally recognized but never before rigorously exemplified the following works appeared as a direct result of his studies during these six years in eighteen twenty three a memoir on perforation of the small intestines in acute diseases a second on croup in the adult a third on the communications between the right and left cavities of the heart archive de médecin in eighteen twenty four two memoirs on the pathological anatomy of the mucous membrane of the stomach another on pericarditis in eighteen twenty six a memoir on abscess of the liver another on the condition of the spinal marrow in pott's disease a third on sudden and unforeseen deaths a fourth upon slow but anticipated deaths which anatomy will not explain a fifth on the treatment of tenia by the darbon potion archive de medecin in eighteen twenty five his anatomical researches and so forth on phthisis one volume eight vo reprinted with many editions in eighteen forty three in eighteen twenty eight researches on the typhoid affection or fever two volumes eight vo reprinted with many editions in eighteen forty one louis introduced what is known as the numerical method a plan which we use every day though the phrase is not now very often on our lips the guiding motto of his life was ars medica tota in observationibus in carefully observing facts carefully collating them carefully analyzing them to get an accurate knowledge of any disease it is necessary to study a large series of cases and to go into all the particulars the conditions under which it is met the subjects specially liable the various symptoms the pathological changes the effects of drugs this method so simple so self-evident we owe largely to louis in whose hands it proved an invaluable instrument of research he remarks in one place that the edifice of medicine reposes entirely upon facts and that truth cannot be elicited but from those which have been well and completely observed american medicine felt the influence of louis through two channels his books and his pupils let us speak first of the former no french writer of this nineteenth century has had such a large audience in this country all of his important works were translated and widely read the work on phthisis the first important outcome of five years hard work at la charite in chomel's wards was published in eighteen twenty five much had already been done by physicians of the french school on this subject bailey's important recherche had been issued in eighteen ten and lenac had revolutionized the study of phthisis by the publication of his treatise on auscultation 
I cannot enter into any detailed analysis of the work, but it is one which I can commend to your notice as still of great value, particularly as a model of careful observation. The work was based upon the study of 123 cases observed in Chamel's clinic. The lesions observed at autopsy are first described under the different organs with great accuracy and detail, and then summarized, following which is an elaborate description of the symptomology. I do not know of any single work on pulmonary tuberculosis which can be studied with greater profit today by the young physician. The eighty years which have elapsed since its publication, and the changes which have taken place in our ideas of tuberculosis, diminish not from the value of his careful anatomical and clinical presentation of the subject. In 1829 appeared his second great work, Anatomical, Pathological, and Therapeutical Researches upon the Disease Known Under the Name of Gastroenterite putrid, adynamic, ataxic, typhoid fever, and so forth, compared with the most common acute diseases. It was based upon 138 observations made between 1822 and 1827. He analyzed and determined the lesions found in 50 patients who had died of the typhus fever, and compared these with alterations found in other acute diseases. Altogether, for this work, he states that he analyzed the changes in the viscera of 133 subjects and the symptoms of nearly 900. In his introduction to this work, he quotes a sentence from Rousseau which is always to be kept in mind. I know that truth lies in the facts and not in the mind that judges of them, and that the less I introduce what is merely my own into the deductions I make from them, the more certain I shall be of approaching the truth. This work was translated by Dr. H. I. Bowditch in 1836. At the time of Louis' observations, although differences were recognized between the various forms of continued fevers, the profession had no accurate knowledge of the subject. It so happened that at this period the disease prevailing at Paris known as typhus was almost entirely what we now call typhoid fever, so that the anatomical lesions found by Louis in his fifty autopsies were chiefly in the intestines in all the pizer's glands were diseased his method was to analyze carefully the appearances found in the different organs in the series of fever cases and compare them with patients who had died of other acute diseases thus of course the contrast was striking in the very matter of involvement of pizer's glands which were more or less seriously changed in structure in all the patients with the fever while in the persons who died of other acute diseases the elliptical patches had no special redness or softening the symptomatology was also given in great detail and the same painstaking comparisons were instituted between the subjects of the typhoid affection and those of other acute diseases Louis's work convinced a majority of the members of the Paris school that the essential lesions in continued fevers were in the intestines, and Louis himself appears not to have had any idea whatever that the disease which he was studying was in any way different from the disease prevailing in other parts of Europe, which we now know as typhus fever. The next important memoir, the essay on bloodletting, had a very potent influence on professional opinion in this country. It appeared in Paris in 1835, and was translated by G. C. Putnam, with an introduction and appendix by Dr. James Jackson. As this learned physician remarks in his preface, if anything may be regarded as settled in the treatment of disease, it is that bloodletting is useful in the class of diseases called inflammatory, and especially in inflammations of the thoracic viscera. When one reads the reports of the treatment by bleeding up to about the year 1840, one is almost forced to ask the question, are the diseases the same? or surely the patients must have possessed much more powerful constitutions than those which we are now called upon to treat. At the time of Louis' return to Paris under the influence of Brousset's doctrine of irritation, local and general bloodletting was practiced more extensively than at any previous period in the history of medicine. 
as an interesting illustration it may be mentioned that the trade in france and spain in leeches had developed to proportions which assumed really those of a national industry and even in this country i believe one of the medical societies offered a prize for the best demonstration of the practical method of cultivating leeches for medicinal purposes it must have been a terrible shock to Brousset and his adherents when Louis attacked the subject of bloodletting in pneumonia with his numerical method. For this purpose he analyzed seventy-eight cases, twenty-eight of which proved fatal, and in a second series twenty-nine cases with four deaths. Among his conclusions were that pneumonitis is never arrested at once by bloodletting, and that the supposed happy effect on the progress of the disease was very much less than was commonly believed. Incidentally, he remarks with reference to the practice of blistering, which was in vogue at the time, that he had rejected the practice after the treatment of a hundred and forty cases of pleurisy without losing a case. I would refer you particularly to Putnam's translation of this article, which you can obtain in any of the libraries, not only for Louis' work, but for the excellent introduction by Dr. Jackson, on the value of the numerical method in medicine, and also for the appendices, analyzing the pneumonia cases of the Massachusetts General Hospital from 1824 to 1834 inclusive. To American students, one of Louis' most valuable works is his Research on the Yellow Fever, in 1828. On November 1, 1828, Louis, with Chevin at Trousseau, left for Gibraltar, where the disease prevailed. They made a very careful study of the symptoms and morbid anatomy, and on their return to Paris made a report to the Academy of Medicine but the work remained in manuscript until dr george c shaddock translated it into english and it was published by the massachusetts medical society as volume ten of their library of practical medicine the work did not appear in french until eighteen forty four it is chiefly valuable as a very accurate and careful record of a series of cases studied clinically and anatomically powerful as was the effect of louis's writings on american medicine it cannot compare with the influence which he exerted through his pupils who caught his clear accents learned his great language made him their model of the great triumvirate of the french school of the fourth decade louis possessed a singular power of attracting hard-working capable men and this in spite of the fact that his rivals and friends chomel and andral possessed more brilliant gifts of a certain kind as a writer in the lancet said eighteen seventy two two year by year fresh bands of students came to imbibe from his lips the instruction which their predecessors had abandoned with reluctance till his academic progeny knew no distinction of race or even color but coalesced into a noble band of enthusiasts in the cause of medicine of science and of humanity in this academic progeny louis american pupils take a very unusual position among the thousands in the profession of this country who have during the nineteenth century sought light and learning in the older lands the group of young men who studied in paris between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty had no predecessors and have had no successors partly because the time was ripe and they were active agents in bringing the new art and science to the new world partly owing to inherent capabilities but not a little because the brightest minds among them fell under the influence of louis they more than others gave an impetus which it still feels to the scientific study of medicine in the united states there had been of course in paris many students from this country prior to eighteen thirty but they do not form a school recognizable to us at present one name comes to my mind that of the rhode island philosopher elisha bartlett a peripatetic of the peripatetics in the days when men moved from city to city like the sophists of ancient greece i do not know whether when in paris in eighteen twenty eight he came personally under louis influence probably not as louis spent part of that year in spain but he brought back recent french methods with gallic lucidity and a keen appreciation of the value of the numerical method 
His well-known work on typhus and typhoid fever, issued in 1842, is in itself a lasting witness to the intelligence and progressive character of the younger teachers of that day. With a clear separation of typhus, typhoid, the periodic, and yellow fevers, it had at the date of its publication no counterpart in European literature, and is in remarkable contrast to the chaotic treatises of Armstrong, Fordyce, Tweedy, Southwood, Smith, and others. The following are among the American students in Paris between 1830 and 1840. This list does not aim at completeness from boston james jackson jr h i bowditch oliver wendell holmes george c shattuck jr john d fisher j c warren then past middle age and j mason warren from new york john a sweat abraham dubois alonzo clark charles l mitchell charles d smith valentine mott senior and john j metcalf from Philadelphia, George W. Norris, W. W. Gerhard, Caspar W. Pennock, Thomas Stewardson, Alfred Stille, Thomas D. Mutter, E. Campbell Stewart, Charles Bell Gibson, John B. Biddle, David H. Tucker, Meredith Clymer, William P. Johnston, W. S. W. Ruschenberger, Edward Peace, William Pepper, Primus. From Baltimore, William Power. From the South, Peter C. Gallard, Gibbs, and Pierre Porche of Charleston, J. L. Cabell, L. S. Joynes, Selden, and Randolph of Virginia, and many more whose names on earth are dark, men of the stamp of Dr. Bassett of Alabama, who felt the strong impulsion to know the best that the world offered, every one of whom has left a deep and enduring impression in his sphere of work it would be impossible to tell in detail how louis students brought back his spirit and his methods to their daily work and of the revolution which they gradually effected in the study and in the treatment of disease i can best perhaps fulfil my object by referring somewhat fully to two of the most distinguished among them james jackson jr and w w gerhard james jackson jr is the young marcellus among the physicians of this country the young marcellus young but great and good i do not know in our profession of a man who died so young who has left so touching a memory he was the son of dr james jackson of harvard one of the most distinguished of new england's physicians a man to whom our generation owes a heavy debt since he with jacob bigelow was mainly instrumental in bringing about more rational ideas on the treatment of disease of louise pupils from this side of the water young jackson seems to have been his special favorite after taking the b a degree at cambridge in eighteen twenty eight jackson attended the medical lectures at harvard and in the spring of eighteen thirty one went to paris where he remained until the summer of eighteen thirty two returning home in eighteen thirty three he graduated in medicine at harvard in eighteen thirty four in the two years and a half of his studies in this country before going abroad he had had exceptional opportunities with his father at the massachusetts general hospital and showed his early industry and ability by taking one of the boylston prizes before the completion of his second year of study in paris he attended the practice of la pitie and st louis he soon became devoted to louis and by him was utilized to the full extent in the cholera epidemic in eighteen thirty two two letters from louis to james jackson senior show how important he thought a prolonged period of study was for a young man he says i pointed out to him james jackson jr the advantage it would be for science and for himself if he would devote several years exclusively to the observation of diseases i now retain the same opinion and am strengthened in it for the more i became acquainted with and the more i notice him applying himself to observation the more i am persuaded that he is fitted to render real service to science to promote its progress i find that he would be well pleased to follow for a certain period the vocation for which nature has fitted him 
but he has stated to me that there are many difficulties which would prevent his devoting himself exclusively to observation for several years but can these difficulties be insurmountable and again let us suppose that he should pass four more years without engaging in the practice of medicine what a mass of positive knowledge will he have acquired how many important results will he have been able to publish to the world during that period after that he must necessarily become one of the bright lights of his country others will resort to him for instruction and he will be able to impart it with distinguished honour to himself if all things be duly weighed it will appear that he will soon redeem the four years which men of superficial views will believe him to have lost in another letter the following year just before young jackson's departure from paris he refers again to this question and urges dr jackson to allow his son to devote himself exclusively to observation for several years in boston the extract from this letter is worth quoting think for a moment sir of the situation in which we physicians are placed we have no legislative chambers to enact laws for us we are our own lawgivers or rather we must discover the laws on which our profession rests we must discover them and not invent them for the laws of nature are not to be invented and who is to discover these laws who should be a diligent observer of nature for this purpose if not the son of a physician who has himself experienced the difficulties of the observation of disease who knows how few minds are fitted for it and how few have at once the talents and inclination requisite for the task the inclination especially for this requires that the observer should possess a thorough regard for truth and a certain elevation of mind or rather of character which we rarely meet with all this is united in your son you ought for all my opinion it is a duty you ought to consecrate him for a few years to science this sir is my conviction and i hope it will be yours also i know very well that every one will not be of the same opinion but what matters it if it be yours if you look upon a physician as i do as holding a sacred office which demands greater sacrifices than are to be made in any other profession young jackson's letter to his father just as he was quitting paris indicates on what affectionate terms he had lived with louis in two hours i am out of paris i will not attempt to describe to you the agony it gives me to quit louis he is my second father and god knows that is a name i of all men cannot use lightly i may not persuade you to look upon him with my eyes exactly as a scientific man but in your heart he must have the share of a brother for he almost shares my affection with you from one upon whom i had no claims but those which my life and mind and habits gave me i have experienced a care an affection which i never could dare expect from any but my dear father and which i shall ever feel to be the most honourable and truly worthy prize of my life he seems to have inspired the same tender feelings in all his american students in the memoir of dr bowditch to which i have already referred he speaks of louis fatherly kindness to him during a prolonged attack of rheumatic fever lasting for many weeks young jackson was one of the founders in eighteen thirty two of the society for medical observation which consisted of the ablest of the students of louis chamel and andral during his stay in paris he made an important study of cholera which was published in this country in eighteen thirty two it was most timely as it gave the profession here a very clear and accurate description of the disease of which up to that time they had had no experience jackson's name too will always be associated with the studies upon emphysema and he is the discoverer of the prolonged expiration in early pulmonary tuberculosis returning to boston in the autumn of eighteen thirty three he spent the winter preparing for his degree and elaborating the notes which he had taken in paris 
in march he fell ill with a dysentery which proved fatal on the twenty seventh of the month in the twenty-fifth year of his age i know of no young man in the profession who had given pledges of such exceptional eminence his influence in extending louis's methods and views throughout new england was chiefly through his father who though a man approaching his sixtieth year became an ardent follower of louis and the numerical method in oliver wendell holmes recently issued biography you will find a delightful description of life at the medical school of paris at this period he bears witness to the good effect which jackson's warm friendship with louis had had in promoting the interests of american students i may conclude with a quotation from dr jackson's senior memoir at the suggestion and request of one of my most judicious brethren i shall add that my son's influence on the profession here in the short time he was with us was of a very salutary description this gentleman states that my son not only caused others who had not yet read the works of m louis to study them with care but that he introduced among the rising members of the profession in our own city the habits of thorough observation of the phenomena of disease in the living and in the dead which he had learned from the same great pathologist he also taught us much in respect to the physical signs of disease in the thorax with which we were imperfectly acquainted before at least i may say this was true as to myself indeed i ought to say more for he aided me very much in regard to the diagnosis of the more obscure diseases of that region derived from the combination of the physical and rational signs on emphysema of the lungs he threw for me quite a new light w w gerhard was the most distinguished of the american pupils in paris between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty when you call to mind the men whom i have mentioned this may seem a strong statement but i feel certain that could we take their suffrages they would accord him the place of merit in consequence of the character of his work dr gerhard was born in philadelphia in eighteen o nine and was graduated from the university of pennsylvania in eighteen thirty one early in the year he went to paris and attached himself to louis at la pitie in one of his letters to his brother dated january eighteen eighteen thirty two he says dr louis is delivering an interesting clinic at la pitie he is a remarkable man very different from the physicians of england or america and remarkable even at paris by the strict mathematical accuracy with which he arrives at his results he is not a brilliant man not of the same grade of intellect as his colleague at la pitie andral in another letter he gives an account of his day's work the morning from seven to ten is occupied with the visit and clinic at the hospital there are several distinct clinics now in actual progress each of them has its advantages i shall vary my attendance at the different hospitals and select those lecturers who are of real merit at this moment we are following Pierre at the salpetriere a very distant hospital two or three miles from our lodgings his patients are all old women and not interesting my object in following his course is to obtain some interesting information on the best mode of investigating the diseases of the chest m pierre has devoted special attention to this subject from salpetriere we return to la pitie we hear a surgical lecture reach home to breakfast and then to the school of medicine the lectures at the school with a private course of anatomy during the hour of intermission fill up the remainder of the day until four fortunately a private clinic at la charite introduces me to a set of very interesting cases especially on pectoral cases dr Dagneau has a class who pay him ten francs a month and enjoy the privilege of examining the patients much more conveniently than is practicable during the morning visit in the midst of a crowd of students we dine at five thirty and then lectures again until eight o'clock imagine the facilities the delightful advantage of acquiring positive information and what is at least as important of learning the mode of obtaining these positive results 
we see and hear the men who are so well known to us in america learn to form a correct estimate of their relative worth in short one of the most striking advantages of a medical visit to europe is to acquire the sort of liberal professional feeling which is rarely secured by the continued intercourse with the same men and the unpleasant medical politics which divide the profession in america evidently brousset made no special impression on dr gerhard he says brousset is the best known his reputation is universal and the benefits he has conferred on medicine are immense but unfortunately he is a wretched lecturer his own opinions are given in the most awkward clumsy manner the manner and style of lecturing are coarse and vulgar in another letter of february three eighteen thirty two he tells how he induced louis to give them private instruction to his brother he writes i must write you at least a few days before the excitement has passed off can you imagine how fortunate i am devinez si vous pouvez two or three days ago jackson pinnock and myself were talking of hospitals and morbid anatomy when the idea occurred of attempting the study of pathology in a particular manner it was this to obtain the specimens and study them the authors in our hand exactly and carefully comparing authorities with the subject before us we addressed ourselves to two of the interns at la pitie attached to the salles of louis and andral and they agreed to procure all facilities in their power and communicate their own information for the compensation of sixty francs from each of us we accordingly visit la pitie on three afternoons of the week and examine the parts at the hospital afterwards carrying home such portions as require minute investigation our first success in this opening of new sources of instruction emboldened us to attempt something of higher importance we were all desirous of studying auscultation of studying it in such manner as to be sure of our ground on our return and to be capable of appreciating the advantages of the art louis public instructions were valuable but his private lessons upon a subject demanding minute and patient inquiry we knew would be infinitely more so i therefore in the name of my friends addressed him a polite note accompanied by a handsome pecuniary offer we did this with little hopes of success but happily for us he accepted our proposition and next week we are his private pupils at la pitie we are i believe the first who have made this arrangement with m louis and you may estimate its importance when i tell you that he is considered in excellence of diagnosis the successor of lenach our advantages for the study of pathology and the diagnosis of diseases of the chest are now superior they are indeed the very best in the world and our eagerness to embrace them will i hope render them of real utility of course they involve an additional expenditure of four hundred or five hundred francs but i should be happy to shorten my stay in paris a month to improve the remainder of my time in this manner if such were necessary for me pennock and myself are very happy to have become intimate with jackson he has superior talents and his excellent education conducted by his father unquestionably the first physician in america has cultivated his mind and developed an ardent attachment to medicine few american students have occupied their time abroad to greater purpose than dr gerhard he appears to have been an indefatigable worker and the papers which he published based upon material collected in paris are among the most important which we have from his pen thus with pennock he described asiatic cholera in eighteen thirty two devoting himself particularly to the study of diseases of children he issued a very interesting paper on smallpox and two papers of very special value the first on tuberculous meningitis and the other upon pneumonia in children both of these papers mark a distinct point in our knowledge of these two diseases he is usually accorded the credit of the first accurate clinical study of tuberculous meningitis 
Late in the year 1833 he returned to Philadelphia, and at his suggestion his friends had secured him the appointment as resident physician at the Pennsylvania Hospital, which he took early in 1834. This step indicated how carefully he had weighed the important influence in Louis's career of the years of quiet work at La Charité. At the Pennsylvania Hospital he had an opportunity to study the common continued fever of the country, and determined that it was identical clinically and anatomically with the typhoid fever of Louis, and characterized by a special lesion in the glands of Bayer. I do not know exactly how long he remained resident physician at the Pennsylvania Hospital, but he was soon after appointed one of the physicians at Blockley, and here, in 1836, he was able to carry out his most important piece of work. The general opinion prevailed that the fever which Louis described and which had the lesions in the small bowel was only a modification of the ordinary typhus fever which at that time prevailed so extensively, particularly in Great Britain and Ireland. In London, Edinburgh, and Dublin the intestinal lesions were regarded as only accidental and not indicative of a special affection. Dr. Gerhard knew the typhoid fever of Louis well, and had had an opportunity of studying it again at the Pennsylvania Hospital, so that when the epidemic of typhus fever developed in 1836 he was in a very good position to make an accurate study of the disease. Two hundred and fourteen cases were observed and as a result of his study he declared positively that the typhus fever which was similar to the disease which he had also seen in edinburgh was a different affection altogether from the typhoid fever with intestinal lesions these observations you must remember were made in eighteen thirty six at a time when the greatest confusion existed as to the forms of fever it took a great many years in great britain before the duality of the prevalent fever was recognized but owing to the influence of gerhard's paper and to the accurate knowledge of fever brought to this country by louis's pupils the differentiation of the two diseases was here quickly recognized since as already mentioned bartlett in eighteen forty two considered them apart Gerhard's work influenced his Paris friends greatly, and this was strengthened by the papers read before the Society for Medical Observation by George C. Shattuck and Alfred Stille, of whom the former had had opportunities of studying typhus fever in Great Britain, while the latter had been one of Gerhard's house physicians in the typhus epidemic at Blockley. Shattuck's paper is published in The Medical Examiner for 1840. I have always regretted that Dr. Stillet's paper has never been printed yet. He was kind enough to let me see it, and as I have mentioned elsewhere, the differential points between typhus and typhoid fever are nowhere more clearly laid down. The University of Pennsylvania early took advantage of Gerhard's training and utilized him as clinical lecturer at the Philadelphia Hospital. He soon acquired a special reputation in diseases of the heart and lungs. In 1842 appeared the first edition of his work on diseases of the chest, which ran through four editions and is still a valuable work of reference. One of his fellow students in Paris, Stewardson, has given a very pleasing picture of him as a clinical teacher. As a clinical teacher he was remarkably successful and exerted a powerful and commanding influence. Without any pretension to eloquence he nevertheless riveted the attention of his hearers and stimulated their enthusiasm. Himself deeply interested in his subject, he communicated this interest to his audience by the sheer force of truth. Students saw that truth was his object, not display. The advancement of science, and not the gratification of personal feelings, whether of vanity or ambition. In short, that in his mind a deep interest in his subject, and a thorough conscientiousness in the pursuit of it, were the overmastering motives in an easy and conversational style he presented to his hearers a graphic portraiture of the case before them bringing into relief its most important symptoms impressing upon their minds the most striking features in its history 
pointing out by a few clear and practical expressions the bearing of any particular fact upon interesting medical questions but avoiding long and labored arguments or general disquisitions upon the nature of diseased action he neither stimulated the fancy by flowers of rhetoric nor amused the intellect with episodes upon theoretical questions but confined himself to drawing such practical conclusions as were clearly deducible from the facts presented no man of his day enjoyed so high a reputation as a clinical teacher and not only did he succeed in an eminent degree in arousing the enthusiasm of students and putting them in sympathy with himself by infusing into them his own ardor in his favorite study but he produced an influence upon the profession here which is felt still which has fostered the establishment of clinical teaching among us and done much to give it that rank which it now occupies here as a branch of medical instruction of the work of louis other students in this country time would fail me to tell of the influence of bowditch holmes and shattuck in boston of sweat clark and others in new york of pennock stewards and stillet in philadelphia and of power in baltimore to them all we owe a heavy debt of gratitude they brought from paris enthusiasm faith in the future faith in the profession of their choice accurate methods and a loyal love of truth endowed with the spirit and zeal of their master they carried his great message to the new world and more than this touched with those finer qualities which made louis so lovable they have become bright ideals for all future generations of american students there remain so far as i know three only of the paris students of whom i have spoken john t metcalf meredith clymer and your honored patron alfred stillet they too must soon go the way of all the earth but among the consolations of old age what greater solace can they feel than that the lives of the men whose fathers and grandfathers they taught are made better by their presence End of chapter eight chapter nine william pepper in rugby chapel that noble poem in memory of his father matthew arnold draws a strong contrast on the one hand between the average man who eddies about eats and drinks chatters and loves and hates and then dies having striven blindly and achieved nothing and on the other the strong soul tempered with fire not like the men of the crowd but fervent heroic and good the helper and friend of mankind dr william pepper whose loss we mourn to-day while not a thomas arnold belonged to this group of strong souls our leaders and masters the men who make progress possible there are two great types of leaders one the great reformer the dreamer of dreams with aspirations completely in the van of his generation lives often in wrath and disputations passes through fiery ordeals is misunderstood and too often despised and rejected by his generation the other a very different type is the leader who sees ahead of his generation but who has the sense to walk and work in it while not such a potent element in progress he lives a happier life and is more likely to see the fulfillment of his plans of this latter type the late professor of medicine at the university of pennsylvania was a notable example the most notable the profession of this country has offered to the world one william pepper began life under conditions which are very often unfavorable to success his father a distinguished physician the professor of medicine in the school in which his son was educated belonged to a family of position and influence for the young man there were none of those tempering blows of circumstance no evil star with which to grapple and grow strong quite as much grit and a much harder climb are needed to reach distinction from the top as from the bottom of the social scale and to rise superior to the res abundans domi has taxed to the uttermost many young men in this country we have heard enough of the self-made men who are always on top it is time now to encourage in america the young fellow who is unhappily born with a silver spoon in his mouth 
like the young man in the gospels he is too apt to turn away sorrowfully from the battle of life and to fritter his energies in europe or to go to the devil in a very ungentlemanly manner or to become the victim of neurasthenia to such the career i am about to sketch should prove a stimulus and an encouragement at the age of twenty one in 1864 the year of his father's death pepper graduated from the medical department of the university of pennsylvania having previously taken the b a degree what now were the influences which sent this youngster bounding up the ladder three rungs at a time in the first place the elder pepper was a clinical physician of exceptional abilities but more than this intellectually he was a son of the great louis one of that band of much-loved american students whom louis sent to their homes with high ideals with good methods of work and with a devoted admiration of their chief the talk at home while young pepper was a medical student must often have been of the old teacher of his ways and works of his noble character and of his loving heart the father's mental attitude had been moulded finally by louis and the son's early work shows deep traces of the same influence indeed all through life the clinical manner and habits of thought of the younger pepper were much more french than english or german in this respect he differed widely from his contemporaries who became dominated by the vienna and berlin schools dr pepper senior died a few months after his son's graduation leaving him a moderate competency and the example of a life devoted to all that was highest in our profession it is interesting to note that the two diseases portrayed most skillfully by louis typhoid fever and phthisis were those which both the elder and the younger pepper studied with special ardor for more than a century the pennsylvania hospital has been the nursing mother the pa mater of the kings of the clinic in philadelphia but in the long list of medical officers given in morton's history of that institution you can find no young man who made his connection with the hospital so immediately productive as william pepper in it i find the second potent factor in his rapid professional development in the summer following his graduation he served temporarily as apothecary in eighteen sixty five he was elected one of the resident physicians and had as a colleague his friend edward rhodes on the completion of his service he was appointed pathologist to the hospital and curator of the museum positions which he held for four years he immediately threw all his energies into the study of morbid anatomy and in eighteen sixty eight was appointed lecturer on the subject in the university making autopsies working in the museum studying tumors and microscopic specimens his time could not have been more fortunately spent for in these early years he thus obtained a knowledge of morbid anatomy which stood him in good stead when time became more precious and engagements numerous throughout his entire career this work lent accuracy and firmness to his diagnosis he never forgot the value of morbid anatomy nor the debt which he owed to it i have known few practitioners more keen or more successful in obtaining permission for autopsies very often he would send an especially interesting specimen to my laboratory knowing that i would gladly get it ready for his clinic quite early in my association with him i saw that he had served an apprenticeship in the dead house he could come into the clinic and pick up a heart which he had never seen but only felt and heard and go at once to the seat of the disease the descriptive catalogue of the pathological museum at the pennsylvania hospital was issued in eighteen sixty nine and while a large portion was from the pen of dr morton every page bears witness to the careful and thorough manner with which dr pepper had worked over the specimens the early volumes of the transactions of the pathological society attest his zeal in this study as the third powerful element in his progress i place his association with dr john forsyth meigs in the revision of the well-known work the diseases of children the third edition had appeared in eighteen fifty eight the fourth edition by meigs and pepper was practically a new work 
Dr. Meigs was an exceedingly busy man, and the bulk of the revision fell to his junior. The descriptions of disease were admirable, the pathology well up to date, and the authors broke away in a remarkable manner from many of the traditions and routines of old-time practice. If you compare Meigs and Pepper of 1870 with the third edition, or with the contemporary books on the same subject, you will see what a radical work it was for that date. To one section of the edition we may turn with special interest, namely to diseases of the cecum and appendix. Nowhere in literature, I believe, before 1870, is the importance of the appendix so fully recognized, or is there so good a description of the results of perforation. One cannot but regret that no edition of this work appeared after the sixth in 1877. The experience gained by Pepper, while still a very young man, in the preparation of this work, was of incalculable value. It familiarized him with the literature, gave him an insight into the art of bookmaking, brought him into close personal contact with a man with remarkable medical instincts, and altogether was a circumstance which, I think, may be justly regarded as one of the three most powerful influences during the formative period of his career. Indeed, in many quarters, Dr. William Pepper, Jr., as he used to be called, really never got the credit for the association with Meigs in the work on diseases of children. For years I had the impression that it was his father who was the joint author of the work, and even quite recently, since Dr. Pepper's death, I heard a man well versed in medical literature and interested in diseases of children express great surprise that the Pepper of Meigs and Pepper was the late provost of the university. In 1870 the Philadelphia Medical Times was started, but the health of Edward Rhodes, who had been selected as editor, had failed so rapidly that the opening of the new enterprise was entrusted to his friend, William Pepper, who brought out the first twelve numbers of the journal, and then transferred the editorship to the late James H. Hutchinson. I have glanced over Volume One to glean indication of Pepper's early work among five or six contributions two are of particular interest as they indicate the sort of work this young man was doing in clinical medicine at page two seventy four is recorded a case of cirrus of the pylorus with dilatation of the stomach an ordinary enough case nowadays but one which has gone into literature and is often quoted on two counts first the accurate study of the peristalsis of the stomach wall which was visible and made the subject a very careful electrical experiment and secondly the practical point of using the stomach tube at that date a novel procedure and so far as i know not previously practiced in america in cases of the kind the other contribution still frequently referred to in the literature on progressive muscular atrophy of the pseudo hypertrophic type is one of the most exhaustive contributions to the subject made up to that date and is a model of accurate clinical and anatomical study. An advertisement in a supplement to one of the numbers gives us an idea of the sort of work he was doing at this time in teaching. In conjunction with H. C. Wood, Jr., he announces a course of practical medicine at the Philadelphia Hospital to extend throughout the months of April, May, and June. They announce that between them they have 175 patients under their care. Dr. Pepper was to meet the class at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, and Dr. Wood at 9.30 a.m. on Friday. It seems to me that, for so young a man, Pepper had a great deal of good sense to have avoided the pitfalls of medical journalism. He must have seen at an early date that to be successful in it meant practically the sacrifice of everything else. By the end of December 1870, young Pepper, then only a little past twenty-seven years of age, already had a well-established reputation as a teacher and worker. I do not know of another instance in the profession in which a man at his time of life had made so favorable a start. From this date on we may divide his life into three periods to 1881, when he was appointed provost at the university, his provostship, 1881-94, to 94, 
and the short period since his resignation from that office. 2. The decade from 1871 to 1880 demonstrated that a man of men, to use a phrase of Milton's, had arisen in the profession in Philadelphia, a man with both geist and go, one who could not only blow a trumpet blast loud enough to awaken the slumbering conservatives of his native city, but could command a following which enabled him, in spite of all opposition, to set on foot much-needed reforms. As illustrating his activity during this period, I can allude, and only briefly, to three important pieces of work. The removal of the university to West Philadelphia doubtless made her friends aware of the possibilities of the situation. In the medical school, then a relatively much more important section, the plans had been organized for well-equipped buildings and laboratories in West Philadelphia an exceedingly judicious plan for which i do not know whether pepper was solely responsible but one in which he had his whole heart was the organization of a hospital to be under the control of the faculty and trustees blockley was within a stone's throw of the new buildings of the medical school and its rich stores of material were available but it was a very wise and far-seeing scheme which regarded the clinical equipment as an integral part of a medical school which should be under the immediate supervision of the faculty for many years it was a hard struggle to make both ends meet and even when i joined the faculty of the university in eighteen eighty four the hospital was constantly in need of funds and much besides one thing it never lacked hopefulness on the part of dr pepper who never for a moment consented to look at the dark side of the picture always saw a few years ahead predicted success in the days when the debt was the greatest, and with many other schemes on hand, he never let an opportunity slip of forwarding the interests of that part of the institution which he loved perhaps better than any other. In 1881, the vice provost, in an address at the inauguration of Dr. Pepper as provost, expressed the popular feeling as follows, to him who has pleaded for mercy to the helpless sick as a lover would plead his own cause who working with other men of good will took by tacit election the headship among them who has touched with a master hand the springs of influence to him public esteem has given the wreath as the moral architect of our hospital it is gratifying to think that he lived to see it placed on a solid basis of success with the maternity department splendidly organized the pepper clinic laboratory which he himself gave in memory of his father the center for high-class work and the new nurses home and the agnew wing in full operation were i asked to name the most satisfactory single piece of work in dr pepper's life i should say unhesitatingly that which related to the promotion of higher medical education this little volume contains two addresses one delivered october one eighteen seventy seven the other october two eighteen ninety three they represent a forecast and a retrospect at the time of the removal of the university to west philadelphia the university faculty was a strong one but it contained a number of men who were saturated with old-time prejudices and who were bitterly opposed to any change in the methods of medical education once before in eighteen forty six the university had made an attempt to elevate the standard of medical education but unsuccessfully in 1871, the Harvard medical faculty had been taken in hand and reorganized so that the example had been set, but there was probably no school in the Union in which the outlook for reform was thought to be less hopeful than at the university. The struggle was a hard one. The brunt of it fell upon the young men, more particularly upon Pepper, who was the very head and front of the new movement the plan of reorganization was not carried without much bitterness indeed it looked at one time as though the faculty would split as professor rogers who did resign very nearly carried with him several strong colleagues as dr pepper says in his second address speaking of the inauguration of the new system in eighteen seventy seven 
we thought too alas of the long and painful controversy lasting almost five years over the proposition to again elevate our standard of medical education and of how the end had been attained only at the cost of old friendships and of the allegiance of valued associates whose convictions remained unchanged as to the injury that should be worked to the university by the proposed advance the movement was immediately successful and the changes then made were but precursors to other more radical advances it was always a source of great gratification to pepper to feel that the plans for which he had worked so hard had been crowned with such success years hence these two addresses with their appendices will be regarded as perhaps the most valuable single contributions to the literature of the phenomenal education movement through which we have lived during the last quarter of the nineteenth century the third event of which i spoke was the organization of the medical department of the centennial exposition of eighteen seventy six i only mention it as one which gave him an opportunity to demonstrate how strong were his executive abilities in eighteen eighty one pepper was elected provost of the university of pennsylvania the feeling was unanimous that he was the man in whose hands the destiny of the institution would at any rate be safe but no one could have predicted such a decade of development as took place under his management the material progress is indicated by an increase in the acreage in west philadelphia from fifteen to fifty two the number of students increased from nine hundred and eighty one to two thousand one hundred and eighty and the fees of the students during the same period more than trebled i do not know that there has been an instance of such remarkable growth in any university in this country unless it has been in a newly established one such as the university of chicago that the university today occupies a position in the very first rank of educational institutions is due to the energy of william pepper passing without further comment the work of his provostship since this has been dealt upon with great fullness in various obituary notices i may here refer to several important undertakings during this period there had never been published in this country a composite work by native writers corresponding to the system of medicine by reynolds or to Ziemzen's encyclopedia a circular was issued in november eighteen eighty one to the joint authors but it was more than three years subsequently before the first volume of the system was issued the five volumes were then published in rapid succession the fifth appearing in eighteen eighty six while unequal as all such systems must necessarily be it remains a great work and contains articles which have become classical in american literature it proved to be perhaps the most successful venture ever made in this country by a medical publishing company and it extended widely the reputation of the editor for many years those of us whose work lay in the special field of medicine had felt that a society was needed in which we could meet our fellows in the same line of work as early as eighteen eighty one i had written to dr tyson shortly after my first visit to philadelphia urging the organization of such a body but it was not until the winter of eighteen eighty five six that the initial steps were taken to form the association of american physicians i remember well in the preliminary meetings how by tacit consent dr pepper assumed the headship and in formulating the details and in arranging the final organization his executive abilities made the work very easy a few years later a much more difficult scheme was engineered by him to a successful issue in the welding of the various special societies into the triennial congress of american physicians and surgeons much of the success of the first meeting in eighteen eighty eight was due to the admirable manner in which as chairman of the executive committee he shaped the policy of the organization 
One astonishing feature in his character was the intense energy and enthusiasm with which he threw himself into these and similar schemes. Letters of suggestion here, of advice in another quarter, conferences, caucuses, as if indeed he had nothing else on his mind, nothing to do but the business at hand. He always appeared at a meeting prepared, knowing exactly what was needed, and, as I have said, took the headship by tacit consent, and the business was put through in a way not always seen in gatherings of medical men. For many years Dr. Pepper had advocated a closer union between the United States and the Latin American republics, the commercial and intellectual relations of which he maintained should be with this country rather than with Europe. He gave practical expression to the conviction by organizing the first Pan-American Medical Congress, of which he was president, and by interesting the governments of the South American states in his commercial museum. Though a chief promoter both of the Association of American Physicians and of the Congress of American Physicians and Surgeons, he was a warm advocate of the claims of the National Association, the meetings of which he very often attended, and in the success of which he was deeply interested. Of late years the extraordinary calls upon his time made attendance upon medical societies very difficult, and more than once he has expressed to me his deep regret that unavoidable engagements either prevented it altogether or made his visits hurried and unsatisfactory. For some years before his formal resignation of the provostship, Dr. Pepper had felt that he had done as much as any one man could, and that it was in the interest of the university that he should give way to someone else. It was his hope, I know, to be able to resign at the end of his ten years' service, but circumstances delayed his action until 1894. But it was not for rest or for any warning that he was doing too much that he asked to be relieved from the cares of the university. Other great schemes had been absorbing his energies. For years he had been impressed with the importance of museums and collections. The Wistar Museum of Anatomy had been a source of great satisfaction. In 1891 he undertook the establishment of the archaeological and paleontological museums. The strong personal interest which he took in archaeology encouraged his friends to hope that he had at last found a hobby which might divert him from more trying duties. He could talk on the outlook in Babylonia, buttonholing some local divas, and impressing him with the need of their last university expedition, as though he had no other interest in life. To the next man it was of the wonderful finds in Florida or Peru, and of their great importance in the history of the early races of this continent. It was extraordinary how he could warm up in talking of these and allied subjects, and his quick receptive mind and retentive memory enabled him to grasp the important points in the problem to be attacked. For a quarter of a century he devoted his marvelous energies to the University of Pennsylvania, believing that in serving her he could best serve his city and state. The last years of his life were given to promote the material and intellectual welfare of his native town. The success of the museum schemes gave courage to his ambition, and he began the organization of the Commercial and Economic Museum, of which he was president at the time of his death. His desire was to see about the University of Pennsylvania a great group of museums which would not only illustrate the past and present history of man in all his relations, but which would reflect the commercial and economic aspect of his present activities, and particularly one in which the raw and manufactured products of the world would be represented, a place in which the businessman of Pennsylvania could be put in touch with producers or consumer in any country. An immense scheme, involving millions of dollars, it was advanced to a stage in which not only is success assured, but in which people are beginning to appreciate what a boon has been bestowed on a great manufacturing city. And then, as if such a colossal enterprise were not sufficient to keep him busy, he undertook the organization of a free library for Philadelphia. 
it was no doubt through his influence that his uncle had given a quarter of a million dollars for the purpose this library was very near to his heart and its remarkable success in so short a time was he told me a source of the keenest pride not long before his death he secured a bequest of a million dollars for a public art gallery from this hurried sketch you may get an idea of the ceaseless energy and activity of his life but it would be very incomplete without some specific reference to his work as a practicing physician the medical profession in every country has produced men of affairs of the first rank men who have risen high in the councils of nations but with scarcely an exception the practice of medicine has not been compatible with such duties so absorbing are the cares of the general practitioner or the successful consultant that he has but little time to mingle in outside affairs and the few who enter public life do so with many backward glances at the consulting room and with well-grounded forebodings of disaster to professional work but dr pepper maintained to the end the closest relations with the profession both as a consultant and a teacher to me one of the most remarkable features of his life is the conscientiousness with which he attended to a large and exacting practice that amid such multifarious cares and duties he should have been able to maintain an undiminished activity in his calling is perhaps the greatest tribute to his genius as a teacher his forte was in the amphitheatre where he displayed precision in diagnosis great lucidity in the presentation of a complicated case and a judicious and thorough knowledge of the resources of our art naturally as he became more and more involved in outside affairs he became less able to contribute important papers to medical literature but a glance through the files of the american journal of the medical sciences and the transactions of the association of american physicians shows during the past ten years a large number of very valuable contributions many of them in collaboration with younger men the journal literature of the same period is full of more ephemeral contributions in the form of clinical lectures i have already referred to several important early contributions among others of special importance i may mention his studies on pernicious anemia the first made i believe by any physician in this country and his contributions to addison's disease in tuberculosis he always took a very warm interest for many years he was supposed to be a victim of pulmonary tuberculosis and indeed the autopsy showed that he had a healed patch of the disease in one lung in lectures and in numerous general articles he dwelt upon the great importance of the disease one of his most interesting contributions was on the local treatment of cavities in the lungs he also made an extensive investigation into the subject of pulmonary tuberculosis in the state of pennsylvania diseases of the stomach and intestines were always favorite subjects of study his papers on appendicitis were of special value particularly those upon the relapsing form of the disease his work on pulmonary tuberculosis early led him to make careful inquiries into the climate of different sections of the country and few members of the profession had a more accurate knowledge of the subject he was a strong believer in the value of the mineral springs of this country and some years ago with dr deland he collected an enormous amount of material which was the basis for his report on the mineral springs of america in eighteen ninety three he edited the american textbook of medicine which had a large sale and served to keep his name prominently before the profession three as a man the late provost formed a most interesting study and as i had such a warm appreciation of his character i may in the privilege of friendship say a few words of a more personal nature i remember as though it were yesterday the occasion of our first meeting in eighteen eighty one i had come to philadelphia to look over the museums and hospitals i was much impressed with his cordiality the ease of his manner the freshness and elasticity of his mind 
He was just starting to his lecture, and I was delighted to accompany him. For years I had not listened to a clinic so well and so artistically planned and conducted with such readiness. I did not see him again until I became his colleague. In five years of pleasant fellowship in the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania, I remember to have been seriously vexed with him but once, and that was on account of my confrere, Howard Kelly. A number of us had backed that Kensington Colt, as we called him in those days. I forget for what appointment. I only remember that I was very keen about it at the time. At the last moment, Pepper entered a dark horse who won easily, to our great chagrin. To my warm expostulations, he listened with great patience, but after about five minutes of that delightful persuasiveness which was so freely at his command, I left him not only with all bitterness assuaged, but almost sorry that I had not supported his candidate. In Athens he would have been called a sophist, and I do not deny that he could, when the occasion demanded, play old Belial and make the worst appear the better cause to perplex and darken maturest counsel, but how artistically he could do it! His faults? I am not here, either to portray or to defend them. They say best men are molded out of faults, and for the most become much and more the better for being a little bad. He was human, and to those of a man he added the failings of a college president. To some sedate Philadelphians he seemed a modern Machiavelli, but a man engaged in vast schemes with many clashing interests is sure to be misunderstood and to arouse sharp hostility in many quarters. The average citizen, if he does not understand, is very apt to dread or to dislike a new Ulysses. In many ways the American is the modern Greek, particularly in that power of thinking and acting which was the strongest Hellenic characteristic. Born and bred in one of the most conservative of cities, surrounded by men who loved the old order and who hated change or even the suggestion of it, Pepper displayed from the outset an adaptability and flexibility truly Grecian. He was preeminently a man of felicities and facilities, to use a somewhat flash but most suitable phrase. Matthew Arnold's comment upon the happy and gracious flexibility which was so incarnate in Pericles has often occurred to me in thinking of the character of the late provost. Lucidity of thought, clearness and propriety of language, freedom from prejudice, freedom from stiffness, openness of mind, and amiability of manner. There was another Grecian feature which must not be lost sight of. You remember in the Timaeus how the Egyptian priest said to Solon, You Hellenes are never anything but children. There is not an old man among you. In mind you are all young. To the very last there was a youthful hopefulness and buoyancy of spirits about Pepper that supported him in many trials and troubles. I never knew him despondent or despairing. If things looked dark, if plans and projects on which his heart was set had miscarried, he kept the disappointment with a smile which robbed it of half its power. The persistency of this buoyant hopefulness often wore out the most obstinate opposition. In fact, it was irresistible. Nor was it the hopefulness which we condemn as visionary, but a resourceful hopefulness, based on confidence in himself, and most valuable quality of all, capable of inspiring confidence in others. Nor must I neglect to bear testimony to his inherent kindliness of heart busy and prosperous and so much absorbed in large projects and with the care of lives very important in a community a great physician is apt to slight the calls of the poor and needy whose lives are of importance only to themselves necessarily his contact with such is in the hospital wards the family physician has not a monopoly of the charity work the consultant has often to take a share and with his large and varied associations pepper had an unusual number of calls upon his time and sympathy as well as upon his purse and to all he responded with a gracious liberality 
Only a year or two ago an instance came to my notice which illustrated his kindness. From one of the lower counties of Maryland, one of those sad wrecks which the little red schoolhouse is apt to make of women, had been under Pepper's care at the university hospital. She had improved very much, had been able to return to work, but after a time had again broken down. She had written to him for advice. In reply, he urged her to put herself under my care at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, which was much more accessible, and he offered to give her a note of introduction to me. I was much impressed by the kindly tone of the letter, which was written with his own hand, an unusual event in his later years, and full of consideration and sympathy. Not endowed, it was supposed, with a very strong constitution, the wonder is that he should have been able to do so much and to live so long. The bridle of Thieges, an inherited or acquired delicateness which has often proved in its possessor a blessing to the race, was no check-rein to him, and I have heard him say that he preferred the life of a salmon to that of the turtle. Though premature in one sense, his death came after he had seen fulfilled the desire of his eyes, and to the rich life which he had lived the future could have added but little, though doubtless his restless spirit would have driven him into fresh fields. The reformation of medical education, the reorganization of the University of Pennsylvania, the establishment of a great commercial museum and a free library, these and a score of minor plans he had either seen completed or well under way. Surely if ever a man could sing a nunc dimittis it was William Pepper. But as no man liveth, so no man dieth to himself, and we may mourn with those who shared his inner life, and who so generously gave so much of it to us, of the profession, and to the public. For them we feel his loss to be irreparable, his death to be premature. For them we could have wished an extension of his time to the psalmist's limit. I have no desire to criticize the method of his life. Exceptional men cannot be judged by ordinary standards. The stress and strain of thirty years told severely on his arteries, and for two or three years there had been unmistakable warnings in attacks of angina pectoris. He kept at work with vigor unabated until the spring, when he had signs of dilatation of the heart with bronchitis and dyspnea. The last time I saw him, in May 1898, I think, he was in bed, improving rapidly, he said, and very cheerful, talking much of his plans, particularly of the commercial museum and of the library. He spoke of a proposed visit to the Pacific coast, and of the good it was sure to do him. Then came the sad announcement of his death in California a shock to all his friends, since with the discretion which we doctors often exercise, the secret of his serious attacks had been well kept. I may be permitted to quote one or two extracts from a letter from his physician who was with him at the time. He died at eight in the evening with a copy of Treasure Island in his hands. At seven I had left him gazing upon Mount Diablo, shadowed in the gathering darkness. I was called at eight, and found him in the attitude, and with the expression of angor animi, from which he never roused. He had suffered a few months before with cardiac dilatation. At the time of his death he was recovering the lost compensation, and appeared on the clear road to recovery. He had said a few days before, the battle has been won. Throughout his illness he exhibited the most perfect disposition and the greatest patience and forbearance. The fatal attack was, I think, about the seventh, extending over a period of three years. The last previous attack was in April, at the time he was lecturing upon angina pectoris. He knew that the end must come some day, but he did not expect it so soon. I have never seen so beautiful a nature in sickness. His conduct and disposition were worthy of Marcus Aurelius. With such a book as Treasure Island in his hand, we can imagine that the great enchanter of the Pacific had filled his mind with the possibilities of peace and quiet, 
so long denied him possibilities turned instantly to realities with the summons to the peace and quiet of an eternal rest some lines of the same writer express both the spirit in which william pepper utilized his time in the service of his fellow men and the chief lesson of his life to us who survive contend my soul for moments and for hours each is with service pregnant each reclaimed is as a kingdom conquered where to reign End of chapter nine chapter ten alfred stiele i doubt not that every fellow of this college had a feeling of thankfulness mingled with a sort of pride that alfred stiele was spared so long to grace and adorn our society his venerable presence was itself a sort of benediction his culture a refining influence and there was about him a certain niceness of nature an honest haughtiness and self-esteem which well became his position and his years the college has had fellows more distinguished men who have filled a wider space in our annals and who have been more closely identified with her history but it would be hard to name a fellow in the past half-century who was more deeply interested in her welfare more appreciative of her needs or one upon whom was a richer anointing of the spirit of the fathers i feel it a special privilege to be allowed to act as the mouthpiece of my colleagues in expressing our sense of the value of his work and the lessons of his life the physician of the last century whose floriot came in the fourth fifth and sixth decades is of all men the most to be envied coming out of the wilderness in which we had wandered for two thousand years he entered the promised land and under the leadership of lenech and louis of skoda and of virchow he saw the heathen dispossessed and the profession at last enter upon a heritage of scientific medicine One born in 1815 dr stille began his life work with the generation which saw the new pathology and the new clinical methods to this accident of the time of birth were added favoring social and local surroundings like sir thomas brown he could lift up one hand to heaven that he was born of honest parents and that modesty humility patience and veracity lay in the same egg and came into the world with him with milton he could feel that his endowments were happily not the worse for forty degrees of northern latitude among his papers are several interesting autobiographical fragments relating to this period after joining in the conic section rebellion at yale which led to the retirement of one half of the class he seems to have had for a time a leaning toward the law during the years of probation he says i tested the strength of my partiality for a medical career by some medical reading including bell's anatomy and bichat's general anatomy and attending the anatomical instruction at the jefferson medical college in this last i was joined by my friend mandeville who was at that time already a student of law I was induced to pursue these anatomical studies at the Jefferson College by Dr. George McClellan, who was then attending my sister Sarah for a tedious ailment, and also by the reputation of the professor of anatomy in that institution, Dr. Granville Sharp Pattison. He was certainly a most eloquent teacher, and he made the dry subject interesting by mixing with pure anatomy a good deal of physiology and surgery, and even a dash of poetry. I shall never forget his lecture upon the skull, in which he recited with admirable feeling the famous lines of Byron beginning, Is this a place where a god might dwell? indeed the charm of pattison's lectures was his enthusiasm tempered and guided by cultivation his voice was flexible and sonorous though not loud and his manner intensely earnest but never violent while i attended his lectures i also began the study of practical anatomy in the new and admirably constructed dissecting room of the same college and pursued it with much enthusiasm in company with mandeville 
The best of luck awaited him when, in 1835-6, he became house physician at Blockley under W. W. Gerhard, a clinical teacher of the very first rank, and fresh from the wards of the great French physician Louis. He was much indebted, too, to Pennock, of whom he has left the following appreciative sketch. Meanwhile, I studied physical exploration and diagnosis with Dr. Pennock, who, besides having been associated with Dr. Gerhard in his fever studies, also devoted himself specially to diseases of the heart. I had assisted him in, or been present at, some of the experiments on sheep which he performed to demonstrate the mechanism of the heart's action, and now at the hospital I was instructed by him in the clinical diagnosis of heart disease by physical methods. He was a man who united with a rare enthusiasm in the study of the heart's function and diseases, and indeed in whatever he undertook a transparent honesty and innocency of character, and a generous ardor of benevolence that made him beloved as well as admired. He was, in nearly all respects, in contrast with his friend Gerhard, who was frequently satirical, devoid of sentiment or imagination, and equally so of strong personal attachments. No doubt Gerhard was the more intellectual man, but Pinnock was the nobler of the two. His chief contribution to medical literature, besides his collaboration with Gerhard in the essay on typhus, was an edition of Hope's Treatise on the Heart, to which he added much that was valuable, including the experiments performed by Moore and himself. It is remarkable that both of these men were arrested in their professional career not by death, but disease. From about 1850, Gerhard suffered from disease within the cranium, which, although it did not render him a paralytic or an imbecile, extinguished every spark of his ambition and caused a permanent halt in his acquisition of knowledge. He repeated over and over again his old lectures, but added to them nothing new. In 1863 he did indeed record his observations of epidemic meningitis, but this was, I think, the only occasion of his revival. In remarks made at the dinner given on the occasion of his retirement from the chair of medicine, Dr. Stille referred to his two teachers in the following words. While still a medical student, two of my fellow townsmen returned from abroad, glowing with the fire they had caught in Paris, the then acknowledged center of medical science. Gerhard and Pennock were the apostles of the school of observation, under whose preaching I became a zealous convert. As soon as it was possible, I hastened to the enchanted scene of their European labors." I have written much and talked more on the subject of Louis and his band of American pupils, of whom Stille was a good representative. The mantle of Lenach fell upon Louis, who seems to have had, in singular measure, the gift of inspiring enthusiasm in his students and a touching personal devotion. No European teacher has ever appreciated more highly his transatlantic pupils, and not one has ever had a more distinguished band of followers. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that he had learned three things in Paris, not to take authority when I can have facts, not to guess when I can know, and not to think a man must take physic because he is sick. It seemed to me that this group of young fellows brought back from Paris first an appreciation of the value of method and accuracy in the study of the phenomena of disease, secondly a profound and at the time a much needed distrust of drugs, and thirdly a Gallic refinement and culture which stamped them one and all as unusual men. Let me name the list over as given to me by Stille himself. From Boston, James Jackson, Jr., H. I. Bowditch, O. W. Holmes, George C. Shattuck, Jr., John C. Warren, then past middle age, John Mason Warren, and John D. Fisher. From Philadelphia, George W. Norris, William W. Gerhard, Casper W. Pennock, Thomas Stewardson, Alfred Stille, Thomas D. Mutter, E. Campbell Stewart, Charles Bell Gibson, John B. Biddle, David H. Tucker. 
Baltimore, William Power (see biography of Charles Frick in Gross's Lives), Charleston, C. S. Gibbs, Peter C. Galliard, Peyer Porcher, Virginia, J. L. Cavell, L. S. Joynes, Randolph, New York, John A. Sweat, Abraham Dubois, Alonzo Clark, Charles L. Mitchell, Punnett, Charles D. Smith, Valentine Mott, Sr. In addition, Edward Peace, Meredith Clymer, William P. Johnston, W. S. W. Ruschenberger, and John T. Metcalf. There were many others, of course, some before Louise Day as Samuel G. Morton, who was Lenox's most distinguished American pupil, and some of those mentioned as Meredith Clymer, Ultimus Romanorum, and Metcalf, just gone, who did not come so directly under Louis' influence, but were pupils of Chomel and Andral. 2. Method and accuracy were from the first characteristic of Dr. Stillet's work. He played an interesting part in that splendid contribution of American medicine to the differentiation of typhus and typhoid fever. I will let him tell the story in his own words. In a manuscript, he says, the year 1836 is memorable for an epidemic of typhus, T. petechialis, which prevailed in the district of the city, which is the usual seat of epidemics caused or aggravated by crowding, viz. south of Spruce and between 4th and 10th Street. A great many of the poor creatures living in that overcrowded region, and who were attacked with typhus, were brought to the Philadelphia Hospital, where I had charge of one of the wards assigned to them i had the great good fortune to study these cases under dr gerhard his permanent reputation rests upon the papers published by him in hayes's journal in which he fully established the essential differences between this disease and typhoid fever all the original material he obtained in this country for determining the symptomatology of typhus was gathered by him during this epidemic but his first studies of the disease had been made in great britain the contrasted picture of typhoid fever was composed of the features he had become familiar with while studying that disease as a favored pupil of louis in paris so that he may be said to have been the first to meet the two diseases face to face with a full acquaintance with one of them and a daily increasing knowledge of the other on a small scale i went through the same experience for i had grown familiar with typhoid fever while following gerhard's clinical instructions in the pennsylvania hospital the year before and at every step of my study of typhus in the wards and post-mortem revealed new contrasts between the two diseases so that i felt surprised that the british physicians should have continued to confound them I was very diligent in making clinical notes and dissections, spending many hours every day in the presence of the disease. I, however, escaped its contagion, while several others of the resident physicians suffered attacks of it, one of which, I think, ended fatally. I look upon that arduous and even dangerous experience as one of my most valuable clinical lessons. In the draft of a letter dated February 1862, found among his papers, entitled Refutation of A. F. Stewart's Claims About Typhus and Typhoid Fevers, there is the following account. It is known that the question had already been conclusively solved by Drs. Pennock and Gerhard of Philadelphia in 1837, whose essay upon it was published in the February and August numbers for that year of the American Journal of the Medical Sciences, republished in the Dublin Journal of Medical Science, September 1837, page 148 analyzed in the london medico chirurgical review for october eighteen thirty seven page five fifty three and translated in a parisian medical journal l'experience in eighteen thirty eight the writer of the present communication having had the advantage of observing the typhus epidemic in the blockley hospital under the physicians just named afterward made a special study of typhoid fever in the wards of m louis in paris and had opportunities of observing typhus with volpes in naples tweedy in london allison in edinburgh and graves in dublin the results of these observations were contained in a paper of which valix speaks as follows 
in an unpublished memoir of dr stille an intern of dr gerhard during the prevalence of the epidemic in philadelphia which was read before the medical society of observation september fourteen and twenty eighth eighteen thirty eight and which we have before us the two diseases are compared symptom by symptom and lesion by lesion and apart from the phenomena of fever common to all febrile affections the opposite of what is observed in the one is sure to be presented in the other archives general february eighteen thirty nine page two thirteen among other conclusions reached by velix is the following english and american typhus is a different disease from typhoid fever a few months later archive general october eighteen thirty nine page twenty five and page one twenty nine the same physician published an analysis of thirteen cases of typhus observed in london by dr g c shattuck of boston fully confirming the conclusion just stated a paper founded on the same cases is also contained in the philadelphia medical examiner for february eighteen forty page one thirty three it was after the whole of these publications viz in april eighteen forty that dr stewart first communicated his observations to the parisian medical society and they were not published until october of the same year his apparent want of candor therefore in the paragraph above quoted from his communication to the times and gazette is for his own sake very much to be regretted i am fortunately able to show you the manuscript of dr stille's paper which with that of shattuck made a strong impression on the french physicians who still clung to the view that there was but one disease it is a pity that this admirable paper has never been printed a casual glance over the headings will give you an idea of the fullness and accuracy with which these able young fellows had worked out the differences between these two great diseases gerhard and pennock stille and shattuck appear to have been the first to fully grasp their essential clinical distinctions and to appreciate their merit one has only to read the british writings on fever at this period some years later a f stewart did good work in the same line and later still jenner made his important study but that in the first edition of bartlett on fevers eighteen forty two the two diseases should have been considered apart is the best testimony to the rapidity with which the new views were received in this country between two and three years of study in europe gave dr stille a fine training for his life work returning to philadelphia he began practice wrote for the journals taught students and gradually there came to him reputation and recognition after lecturing on pathology and the practice of medicine in the philadelphia association for medical instruction he was elected in eighteen fifty four to the chair of practice in the pennsylvania medical college in eighteen sixty four he succeeded dr pepper primus in the chair of medicine at the university of pennsylvania while always a student he was no hermit but from the start took a deep interest in the general welfare of the profession he was the first secretary of the american medical association and president in eighteen sixty seven the local societies recognized his work and worth and he became president of the pathological and of the county medical societies and in eighteen eighty five he took the chair of our ancient and honorable body he was from the outset of his career a strong advocate for higher medical education and from eighteen forty six the date of his first address on the subject to eighteen ninety seven the date of his last he pleaded for better preliminary training and for longer sessions no one rejoiced more in the new departure of the university in eighteen seventy six and he was a consistent advocate of advanced methods of teaching dr stille's medical writings show on every page the influence of his great master his first important work the elements of general pathology eighteen forty eight was based on the modern researches and every chapter echoed with his favorite motto tota ars medica est in observationibus i must quote one sentence from the introductory essay on medical truth 
but we assert that there is a genius not a speculative not a poetical not a mere fantastic faculty but a practical genius which is to say the least a far more rare endowment than that just mentioned a power which is capable of penetrating into all things within our reach and knowledge and of distinguishing their essential differences it creates nothing it does not even invent anything it only sees things as they are and discovers truth in what it sees for the truth as we are told by rousseau is in things and not in our minds and the less of ourselves we introduce into our judgments the nearer we shall approach to truth such was the genius of hippocrates of sydenham of morgagne of haller of Lenech, of abercrombie of hunter of bichat of sir astley cooper such is that of andral of chomel of louis of cruvayer of brodie of graves these men saw relations among the phenomena of diseases which were invisible to less gifted men and having seen them by virtue of their genius they did not stop there and build up a theory upon them assuming them to be true but immediately applied themselves to discover whether they had seen correctly they tested their inspirations by observation and experiment and when they found them unable to bear these tests they rejected them as delusions as idle dreams not even worth remembering but when on the other hand they found them confirmed they gave credit not to the original penetration which had guessed at the truth but to the series of facts which had established it apart from numerous smaller articles in the journals there are two important monographs by dr stillet one on cerebrospinal meningitis and the other on cholera in addition two minor studies were on dysentery in the publications of the united states sanitary commission and on erysipelas the work on cerebral spinal fever is a model of accurate systematic study based on a large series of cases seen in the philadelphia hospital and upon an exhaustive analysis of the literature the work on cholera is of the same kind to a generation of lesser writers they have served as unfailing sources of trustworthy information estimated by bulk the most important of dr stillet's work are the materia medica and therapeutics and the national dispensatory it was always a mystery to me how a man with his training and type of mind could have undertaken such colossal and one would have thought uncongenial tasks he was not so deeply imbued with skepticism as some of his contemporaries of him it could scarcely have been said as of jacob bigelow by professor peabody that his qualifications to teach therapeutics were on par with those of a learned mohammedan to teach christian exegesis dr stillet's attitude on the question of therapeutics was very sane in illustration let me quote one or two sentences of therapeutics we may say what has been said of the legislative powers of a state we cannot assign definite and immutable limits to them or lay down inflexible rules for their use the treatment of every case of sickness must be determined ultimately for and by itself tentatively by skilled men and as their practical sagacity may determine while they bear in mind that the virtues of a medicine depend less upon its intrinsic properties and powers than on the sagacity of the physician who administers it just as the efficiency of firearms depends less upon the explosives and the missile they contain than on the judgment and accuracy of aim of the man who discharges them he had grasped the great truth that the art as an art has its true and only foundation in clinical medicine in his valedictory address eighteen eighty four he said i have devoted whatever knowledge and skill i possess to the simple if difficult task of knowing and curing diseases i have striven in season and perhaps out of season to impress upon you that medicine is first of all an art but an art that can only be successfully practised when the physician is able to recognise the individual diseases he must meet with in practice and distinguish from one another those which are similar in appearance but unlike in nature again but every observant practitioner knows that he treats patients rather than diseases 
he does not regard the former as the chemist does his crucibles retorts and test glasses which have no reaction upon their contents but he knows that every substance taken into the body acts upon it and is itself acted upon by it and in innumerable modes and degrees according to the existing condition of the body and the quantity combination and form of administration of the medicine so that there is some ground for the sarcastic comment that the art of medicine consists in introducing a body of which we know little into another of which we know still less and yet again it is quite necessary for the physician to know when to abstain from the use of medicine as it is for him to prescribe when medication is necessary that he must as far as possible see the end of a disease from its beginning that he must never forget that medical art has a far higher range and aim than the prescription of drugs or even of food and hygienic means and that when neither of these avails to ward off the fatal ending it is still no small portion of his art to rid his patient's path of thorns if he cannot make it bloom with roses three on the roll of our fellows will be found the names of at least half a dozen distinguished bibliophiles to whom we are deeply indebted as they have kept alive in this society the interest of the average fellow in books and have made possible a great library dr stillet was not only a book lover but a discriminating and learned student our shells testify not less to his liberality than to his taste for rare and important monographs while the stillet library of the university of pennsylvania will remain a monument to his love of the literature and history of our profession but it was neither as a teacher nor as a writer that dr alfred stillet's influence was most deeply felt in a long career several generations of students and physicians were influenced by an earnest real man whose life was true and sincere whose ideals were lofty and whose devotion to duty came from pure and unselfish motives a life of probity a high sense of honor uniform courtesy as dr da costa remarked endeared him to the profession and crowned his declining years with all the things which should accompany old age nothing in his life which was one calling for courage of a high order became him more than the graceful way in which he grew old so far as i know the chapter on the old man in the profession has not yet been written Today, as in the sixteenth century the bitter mot of rabelais is true there be more old drunkards than old physicians take the list of fellows of our college look over the names and dates of graduation of the practitioners of this city and the men above seventy years of age form indeed a small remnant all the more reason that we should cherish and reverence them it interested me greatly in dr stillet and i only knew him after he had passed his seventieth year to note the keenness of his mind on all questions relating to medicine he had none of those unpleasant senile vagaries the chief characteristic of which is an intense passion for opposition to everything that is new he had that delightful equanimity and serenity of mind which is one of the most blessed accompaniments of old age he had none of those irritating features of the old doctor who have crawled out of the stream about his fortieth year sits on the bank croaking of misfortunes to come and with less truth than tongue lamenting the days that have gone and the men of the past he was not like the sage of agrigentum of whom matthew arnold sings whose mind was fed on other food was trained by other rules than are in vogue to-day whose habit of thought is fixed who will not change but in a world he loves not must subsist in ceaseless opposition from this unhappy attitude of mind he was saved by a serene faith in the future of the profession naturally he did not approve of much that is unpleasant in our modern ways in some of his last letters there is a touch of the old vigor with which he was wont to wrap the pretensions of the ignorant or the half-educated in a letter to me dated february seventh nineteen hundred he writes 
i never supposed the louis methods would be accepted by the profession generally they were too laborious and they gratified too little the thirst for popular applause and personal exultation that contaminate so many even men of merit not even their adoption and illustration by a certain number of physicians who drew their inspiration from the parisian fount has sufficed to prevent their being overwhelmed by the deluge of german speculation on pathology and therapeutics and again in the last letter i had from him june twenty seventh nineteen hundred referring to bartlett's sketch of hippocrates which he says i read and enjoyed as i do whatever helps to strip truth of her gods and present her in her native simplicity it seems inseparable from all progress in knowledge that it shall not be administered in too concentrated a form lest it produce repugnance and indigestion this has been found necessary in religion and how could philosophy escape it our medical principles and doctrines are found insipid by the vulgar unless they are confectioned to suit the popular palate with a large seasoning of human invention not the least important service of dr stillet was his persistent emphasis on lofty professional ideals of which his own life was in reality the best exemplar for to use his own words he was loyal to science and truth loyal to his art loyal to the history and traditions of his profession loyal to the principles and precepts which the peculiar relations of medical men to one another to the public and to their patients impose upon them on the occasion of the dinner given to him in eighteen eighty four dr stillet told an interesting incident which i quote here as his credo during one of my summer holidays while abroad it was my lot less vulgar then than now to climb the alps and observe the expedients used by the mountaineers in ascending the icy peaks i noted the laborious industry with which they cut for themselves footholds on the slippery steep and so mounted slowly to their destination this method profoundly impressed me at the time and i said to myself surely in such wise must one hew his way to fame and fortune and whether the point to be attained be the highest peak of all or only some humbler hilltop by the way it was clear that whatever else might win improbus labor omnia vincit what seemed revealed to me then among the sublime solitudes of nature has been echoed by a thousand voices along the whole pathway of my life it came to me also like a voice from the tomb in the words of an old family motto innocenter patienter constanter and it was repeated in the history of all the men i have known who secured for themselves a steadfast place in their day and generation i cannot doubt that in the bosom of every one who hears my voice there is felt a silent attestation of its truth it has been the keynote of my teaching as well as the guide of my actions and therefore how little soever of the good that has been attributed to me by your partial voices may in reality be mine i owe it to all the lessons of steady industry and undaunted perseverance that i learned from the alpine mountaineer among his papers is a most interesting and touching letter of advice to his brother morton whose brilliant career was cut short in his thirty-third year i cannot refrain from quoting the concluding sentences which express admirably his relations to his students and his general attitude toward the profession he loved it would be useless for me at this time to go into a more detailed development of the system of instruction i wish you to follow it will be gradually unfolded as you advance and may be modified by circumstances and in all your intercourse with me i wish you to look upon me merely as an older student than yourself who having trod the same path has a greater knowledge of its difficulties and pleasures and dangers who will be proud to be your guide and glory in inspiring you with an ardent love of the profession you have chosen 
I feel deeply impressed with the belief that your character and talents are such as eminently to qualify you for attaining distinction as a medical philosopher, and gaining the respect and affection of those among your fellow men who may require your professional services. I will not conceal from you that there is much before you to make even a strong resolution waver you must toil for years to fit you for the guardianship of the health and lives of men and yet again you must toil long and diligently to reap the reward of your labour but if you have a spark of benevolence in your heart if you have that only ambition which is not a vice to excel others in doing good if you think that the gratitude and the affection of those you may relieve from sickness is a sufficient recompense for much self-denial and self-sacrifice then you will not be disappointed you will be richly repaid for your days of labor and your nights of watching you will learn to cultivate a spirit of charity toward others and of justice toward yourself which will make your station in life respectable and your social and domestic relations hallowed by the light of an unbroken peace hear the conclusion of the whole matter the lesson of a long and good life it is contained in a sentence of his valedictory address only two things are essential to live uprightly and to be wisely industrious end of chapter ten chapter eleven sir thomas brown part one as a boy it was my good fortune to come under the influence of a parish priest of the gilbert white type who followed the seasons of nature no less ardently than those of the church and whose excursions into science had brought him into contact with physic and physicians father johnson as his friends loved to call him founder and warden of the trinity college school near toronto illustrated that angelical conjunction to use cotton mather's words of medicine and divinity more common in the sixteenth and seventeenth century than in the nineteenth an earnest student of sir thomas brown particularly of the religio medici he often read to us extracts in illustration of the beauty of the english language or he would entertain us with some of the author's quaint conceits such as the man without a navel adam or that woman was the rib and crooked piece of man the copy which i hold in my hand j t field's edition of eighteen sixty two my companion ever since my school days is the most precious book in my library i mention these circumstances in extenuation of an enthusiasm which has enabled me to make this almost complete collection of the editions of his works i show you this evening knowing full well the compassionate feeling with which the bibliomaniac is regarded by his saner colleagues one the man the little thomas was happy in his entrance upon the stage october nineteen sixteen o five among multiplied acknowledgments he could lift up one hand to heaven as he says that he was born of honest parents that modesty humility patience and veracity lay in the same egg and came into the world with him of his father a london merchant but little is known there is at devonshire house a family picture which shows him to have been a man of fine presence looking not unworthy of the future philosopher a child of three or four years seated on his mother's knee she married a second time sir thomas dutton a man of wealth and position who gave his stepson every advantage of education and travel we lack accurate information of the early years of the school days at winchester of his life at broadgate hill now pembroke college oxford and of the influences which induced him to study medicine possibly he got his inspiration from the regius professor of medicine the elder clayton the master of broadgate hall and afterwards of pembroke college that he was a distinguished undergraduate is shown in his selection at the end of the first year in residence to deliver an oration at the opening of pembroke college 
possibly between the years 1626, when he took the B.A., and 1629, when he commenced M.A., he may have been engaged in the study of medicine. But Mr. Charles Williams of Norwich, who is perhaps more familiar than any one living with the history of our author, does not think it likely that he began until he went abroad. In these years he could at least have entered upon the physic line, and could have proceeded to the M.B. He was too early to participate in the revival of science in Oxford, but even after that had occurred, Sydenham flung the cruel reproach at his alma mater that he would as soon send a man to her to learn shoemaking as practical physic. It was possible, of course, to pick up a little knowledge of medicine from the local practitioners and from the physic garden, together with the lectures of the Regius professor, who, as far as we know, had not at any rate the awkward failing of his more distinguished son, who could not look upon blood without fainting, and in consequence had to hand over his anatomy lectures to a deputy clayton's study and work would naturally be of a somewhat mixed character and at that period even many of those whose chief business was theology were interested in natural philosophy of which medicine formed an important part burton refers to an address delivered about this time by clayton dealing with the mutual relations of mind and body the anatomy of melancholy which appeared in sixteen twenty one must have proved a stimulating bon bouche for the oxford men of the day and i like to think of the eagerness with which so ardent a student as brown of pembroke would have pounced on the second and enlarged edition which appeared in sixteen twenty four he may indeed have been a friend of Burton, or he may have formed one of a group of undergraduates to watch Democritus Jr. leaning over the bridge and laughing at the bargees as they swore at each other. It is stated, I know not on what authority, that Brown practiced in Oxford for a time. After a visit to Ireland with his stepfather, he took the grand tour, France, Italy, and Holland, spending two years in study. Of his continental trip our knowledge is very meagre. He went to Montpellier, still famous, but failing, where he probably listened to the teaching of Riviere, whose praxis was for years the leading textbook in Europe, thence to Padua, where he must have heard the celebrated Sanctorius of the Medicina Statica, then on to Leiden, just rising into prominence, where it is said he took his doctor's degree in 1633. Of this, however, there is no certainty. A few years ago I looked through the register of that famous university, but failed to find his name. At the end of two years' travel he may have had cobwebs in his pocket, and the Leiden degree was expensive, as that quaint old contemporary of Brown, the Reverend John Ward of Stratford-upon-Avon, tells us. Diary. Mr. Burnett had a letter out of the Low Countries of the charge of a doctor's degree, which is at Leiden about sixteen pounds, besides feasting the professors at angers in france not above nine pounds and feasting not necessary neither no doubt the young englishman got of the best that there was in the teaching of the day and from the religio one learns that he developed from it an extraordinary breadth of culture and a charity not always granted to travellers he pierced beneath the shell of nationalism into the heart of the people among whom he lived feeling at home everywhere and in every clime. Hence the charity, rare in a Protestant, expressed so beautifully in the lines, I can dispense with my hat at the sight of a cross, but scarce with the thought of my Saviour. He must have made good use of his exceptional opportunities, as he was able to boast in a humble way, it is true, that he understood six languages. Returning to England in 1634, he settled at Shibden Dale, close to Halifax, not, as Mr. Charles Williams has pointed out, to practice his profession, but to recruit his health, somewhat impaired by shipwreck and disease. Here, in Upper Shibden Hall, he wrote the Religio Medici, the book by which today his memory is kept green among us. 
in his travels he had doubtless made many observations on men and in his reading had called many useful memoranda he makes it quite clear and is anxious to do so that the book was written while he was very young he says my life is a miracle of thirty years i have not seen one revolution of saturn my pulse hath not beat thirty years indeed he seems to be of plato's opinion that the pace of life slackens after this date and there is a note of sadness in his comment that while the radical humour may contain sufficient oil for seventy in some it gives no light past thirty and he adds that those dying at this age should not complain of immaturity in the quiet yorkshire valley with leisurable hours for his private exercise and satisfaction the manuscript was completed with as he says such disadvantages that i protest from the first setting pen to paper i had not the assistance of any good book communicated to one it became common to many and at last in sixteen forty two seven years after its completion reached the press in a depraved form in sixteen thirty seven at the solicitation of friends brown moved to norwich with which city so far as we know he had had no previous connection at that date the east anglian capital had not become famous in the annals of medicine true she had given keys to the profession but he had only practised there for a short time and does not seem to have had any special influence on her destinies sir thomas brown may be said to be the first of the long list of worthies who have in the past two and a half centuries made norwich famous among the provincial towns of the kingdom here for forty-five years he lived the quiet uneventful life of a student practitioner absorbed like a sensible man in his family his friends his studies and his patients it is a life of singular happiness to contemplate in sixteen forty one he married dorothy millam a lady of such a symmetrical proportion to her worthy husband that they seemed to come together by a kind of natural magnetism in the religio he had said some hard things of the gentle goddess and had expressed himself very strongly against nature's method for the propagation of the race he believed with milton that the world should have been populated without feminine and in almost identical words they wish that some way less trivial and vulgar had been found to generate mankind dame dorothy proved a good wife a fruitful branch bearing ten children we have a pleasant picture of her in her letters to her boys and to her daughter-in-law in a spelling suggestive of pitman's phonetics she seems to have had in full measure the simple piety and the tender affection mentioned on her monument in st peter's church the domestic correspondence wilkins's edition of the works gives interesting glimpses of the family life the lights and shadows of a cultured english home the two boys were all that their father could have wished edward the elder had a distinguished career following his father's footsteps in the profession and reached the dignity of the presidency of the royal college of physicians inheriting his father's tastes as the letters between them prove his wide interest in natural history and archaeology are shown in his well-known book of travels and i am fortunate in possessing a copy of the hydriotaphia with his autograph edward's son the tommy of the letters the delight of his grandfather also became a physician and practised with his father he died in seventeen ten in rather unfortunate circumstances and with him the male line of sir thomas ended of the younger son we have in the letters a charming picture a brave sailor lad with many of his father's tastes who served with great distinction in the dutch wars in which he met it is supposed a sailor's death the eldest daughter married henry fairfax and through their daughter who married the earl of buchan there are to-day among the buchans and erskines the only existing representatives of sir thomas the waves and storms of the civil war scarcely reached the quiet norwich home 
brown was a staunch royalist and his name occurs among the citizens who in sixteen forty three refused to contribute to a fund for the recapture of the town of newcastle it is astonishing how few references occur in his writings to the national troubles which must have tried his heart sorely in the preface to the religio he gives vent to his feelings lamenting not only the universal tyranny of the press but the defamation of the name of his majesty the degradation of parliament and the writings of both depravedly anticipatively counterfeitedly imprinted in one of the letters he speaks of the execution of charles i as horrid murder and in another he calls cromwell a usurper in civil wars physicians of all men suffer least as the services of able men are needed by both parties and time and again it has happened that an even balanced soul such as our author has passed quietly through terrible trials doing the day's work with closed lips corresponding with the most active decades of his life in which his three important works were issued one might have expected to find in them reference to the civil war or at least echoes of the great change wrought by the commonwealth but like fox in whose writings the same silence has been noticed whatever may have been his feelings he preserved a discreet silence his own rule of life no doubt is expressed in the advice to his son times look troublesome but you have an honest and peaceable profession which may employ you and discretion to guide your words and actions busy with his professional work interested in natural history in archaeology and in literature with a wide circle of scientific friends and correspondents the glimpses of brown's life which we have from the letters are singularly attractive he adopted an admirable plan in the education of his children sending them abroad and urging them to form early habits of independence his younger boy thomas he sent at the age of fourteen to france alone and he remarks in one of his letters to him he that hath learnt not in france travelleth in vain everywhere in the correspondence with his children there is evidence of good practical sense he tells one of the boys to cast off pudor rusticus and to have a handsome garb of his body even the daughters were taken to france in his souvenir of sir thomas brown mr charles williams has given an illustration of his house a fine old building which was unfortunately torn down some years ago though the handsome mantelpiece has been preserved an interesting contemporary account has been left by evelyn who paid a visit to sir thomas in sixteen seventy three he says the whole house being a paradise and a cabinet of rarities and that of the best collections especially metals books plants and natural things amongst other curiosities sir thomas had a collection of the eggs of all the fowl and birds he could procure that country especially the promontory of norfolk being frequented as he said by several kinds which seldom or never go further into the land as cranes storks eagles and a variety of other fowl after dr edward brown was established in london the letters show the keen interest sir thomas took in the scientific work of the day writing of his son's lecture on anatomy at the chirurgical hall he warns him that he would have more spectators than auditors and after that first day as the lecture was in latin very many will not be earnest to come hereafter he evidently takes the greatest interest in his son's progress and constantly gives him suggestions with reference to new points that are coming up in the literature here and there are references to important medical cases and comments upon modes of treatment it is interesting to note the prevalence of agues even of the severe hemorrhagic types and his use of peruvian bark in some of the letters a remarkable case of pneumothorax is described a young woman who had a jolking and fluctuation in her chest so that it might be heard by standers-by evidently he had a large and extensive practice in the eastern counties and there are numerous references to the local physicians 
there is a poem extolling his skill in the despaired of case of mrs e s three or four of the lines of which are worth quoting he came saw cured could caesar's self do more galen hippocrates london fourscore of famous college had these heard him read his lecture on his skeleton half dead and seen his modest eye search every part judging not seeing the correspondence with his son is kept up to the time of his death only part of the letters appear in wilkins life and there are many extant worthy of publication in sixteen seventy one he was knighted by charles the second in sixteen sixty four he was made an honorary fellow of the royal college of physicians with which through his son he had close affiliations his name does not appear in the roll of the royal society with the spirit and objects of which he must yet have had the warmest sympathy he was in correspondence with many of the leading men of the day evelyn grew elias ashmole dugdale paston aubrey and others the letters deal with a remarkable variety of subjects natural history botany chemistry magic and archaeology and so forth the pseudodoxia epidemica sixteen forty six extended his reputation among all classes and helped to bring him into close relationship with the virtuosi of the period there is in the bodleian a delightful letter from mr henry bates a wit of the court a few extracts from which will give you an idea of the extravagant admiration excited by his writings sir amongst those great and due acknowledgments this horizon owes you for imparting your sublime solid fancy to them in that incomparable piece of invention and judgment r m gives me leave sir here at last to tender my share which i wish i could make proportionable to the value i deservedly set upon it for truly sir ever since i had the happiness to know your religion i have religiously honoured you hugged your minerva in my bosom and voted it my vade mecum i am of that opinion still that next the legenda dei it is the masterpiece of christendom and though i have met some time with some omnes sic ego vero non sic men prejudicating pates who boggled at shadows in it and carped at adams and have so strapadoed me into impatience with their senseless censures yet this still satisfied my zeal toward it when i found non intelligunt was the nurse of their vituperant and they only stumbled for want of a lanthorn while interested actively in medicine brown does not seem to have been on intimate terms with his great contemporaries harvey sydenham or glisson though he mentions them and always with respect he was a prudent prosperous man generous to his children and to his friends he subscribed liberally to his old school at winchester to the rebuilding of the library of trinity college cambridge and to the repairs at christ church oxford a life placid uneventful and easy without stress or strain happy in his friends his family and his work he expressed in it that harmony of the inner and of the outer man which is the aim of all true philosophy to attain and which he inculcated so nobly and in such noble words in the religio medici and in the christian morals a description of him given by his friend the rev john whitefoot is worth quoting he was never seen to be transported with mirth or dejected with sadness always cheerful but rarely merry at any sensible rate seldom heard to break a jest and when he did he would be apt to blush at the levity of it his gravity was natural without affectation the end came unexpectedly in his seventy-seventh year after a sharp attack of colic on his birthday october nineteenth sixteen eighty two a curious possibility of which he speaks in the letter to a friend 
but in persons who outlive many years and when there are no less than three hundred and sixty-five days to determine their lives every year that the first day should make the last that the tail of the snake should return into its mouth precisely at that time and they should wind up upon the day of their nativity is indeed a remarkable coincidence which though astrology hath taken witty pains to solve yet hath it been very wary in making predictions of it there are three good portraits of sir thomas one in the college of physicians london which is the best known and has been often reproduced and from which is taken the frontispiece in greenhill's edition of the religio medici a second is in the bodleian and this also has frequently been reproduced the third is in the vestry of st peter's mancroft norwich through the kindness of mr charles williams it is here reproduced in many ways it is the most pleasing of the three and brown looks in it a younger man closer to the days of the religio there is a fourth picture the frontispiece to the fifth edition of the pseudodoxia but it is so unlike the others that i doubt very much if it could have been sir thomas if it was he must have suffered from the artist as did milton whose picture in the frontispiece to the poems sixteen forty five is a base caricature but brown has not had the satisfaction of milton's joke and happy revenge two the book as a book the religio medici has had an interesting history written at leisurable hours and for his private exercise and satisfaction it circulated in manuscript among friends and was by transcription successively corrupted until it arrived in a most depraved copy at the press two surreptitious editions were issued by andrew crook in sixteen forty two face page two fifty nine both in small octavo with an engraved frontispiece by marshall representing a man falling from a rock the earth into the sea of eternity but caught by a hand issuing from the clouds under which is the legend Achelo salus johnson suggests that the author may not have been ignorant of crook's design but was very willing to let a tentative edition be issued a stratagem by which an author panting for fame and yet afraid of seeming to challenge it may at once gratify his vanity and preserve the appearance of modesty there are at least six manuscripts of the religio in existence all presenting minor differences which bear out the author's contention that by transcription they had become depraved one in the wilkin collection in the castle museum norwich is in the author's handwriting had brown been party to an innocent fraud he would scarcely have allowed crook to issue within a year a second imperfect edition not simply a second impression as the two differ in the size and number of the pages and present also minor differences in the text the authorized edition appeared in the following year by the same publisher and with the same frontispiece with the following words at the foot of the plate a true and full copy of that which was most imperfectly and surreptitiously printed before under the name of religio medici face page two six zero it was issued anonymously with a preface signed a b to such as have or shall peruse the observations upon a former corrupt copy of this book a curious incident here links together two men types of the intellectual movement of their generation both students both mystics the one a quiet observer of nature an antiquary and a physician the other a restless spirit a bold buccaneer a politician a philosopher and an amateur physician sir kenelm digby committed to winchester house by the parliamentarians had heard favourably from the earl of dorset of the religio medici though late in the day the magnetic motion as he says was impatient to have the book in his hands so he sent at once to st paul's churchyard for it he was in bed when it came 
this good-natured creature i could easily persuade to be my bedfellow and to wake me as long as i had any edge to entertain myself with the delights i sucked in from so noble a conversation and truly i closed not my eyes till i had enriched myself with or at least exactly surveyed all the treasures that are lapped up in the folds of those new sheets sir kenelm holds the record for reading in bed not only did he read the religio through but he wrote observations upon it the same night in the form of a letter to his friend which extends to three-fourths of the size of the religio itself as johnson remarks he returned his judgment of it not in the form of a letter but of a book he dates it at the end the twenty-second i think i may say the twenty-third for i am sure it is morning and i think it is day of december sixteen forty two johnson says that its principal claim to admiration is that it was written within twenty-four hours of which part was spent in procuring brown's book and part in reading it sir kenelm was a remarkable man but in connection with his statements it may be well to remember the reputation he had among his contemporaries stubbs calling him the pliny of our age for lying however this may be his criticisms of the work are exceedingly interesting and often just this little booklet of sir kenelm has floated down the stream of literature reappearing at intervals attached to editions of the religio while his weightier tomes are deep in the ooze at the bottom the religio medici became popular with remarkable rapidity as johnson remarks it excited attention by the novelty of paradoxes the dignity of sentiment the quick succession of images the multitude of abstrusive allusions subtlety of disquisition and the strength of language a cambridge student merryweather travelling in europe translated it into latin and it was published in sixteen forty four by hackius at leyden in a very neat volume a second impression appeared in the same year and also a paris edition a reprint of the leyden the continental scholars were a good deal puzzled and not altogether certain of the orthodoxy of the work merryweather in a very interesting letter sixteen forty nine says that he had some difficulty in getting a printer at leyden salmasius to whom hay a book merchant took it for approbation said that there was in it many things well said but that it contained also many exorbitant conceptions in religion and would probably find much frowning entertainment especially amongst the ministers two other printers also refused it the most interesting continental criticism is by that distinguished member of the profession Guy Patin, professor in the paris faculty of medicine in a letter to charles spon of lyon dated paris october twenty one sixteen forty four he mentions having received a little book called the religio medici written by an englishman a very mystical book containing strange and ravishing thoughts in a letter dated sixteen forty five he says the book is in high credit here the author has wit and there are abundance of fine things in the book he is a humorist whose thoughts are very agreeable but who in my opinion is to seek for a master in religion may in the end find none patin thought the author in a parlous state and as he was still alive he might grow worse as well as better evidently however the work became a favorite one with him as in letters of sixteen fifty three seven he refers to it again in different editions it is remarkable that he nowhere mentions the author by name but subsequently when edward brown was a student in paris patin sends kindly greetings to his father End of chapter eleven part one chapter eleven sir thomas brown part two much discussion occurred on the continent as to the orthodoxy of the religio it is no slight compliment to the author that he should have been by one claimed as a catholic by another denounced as an atheist while a member of the society of friends saw in him a likely convert 
the book was placed on the index in england with the exception of digby's observations there were no adverse criticisms of any note alexander ross that interesting old southampton schoolmaster who seems always to have been ready for an intellectual tilt wrote a criticism entitled medicus medicatus or the physician's religion cured by a lenative or gentle potion in england there were two reprints in sixteen forty five and it appeared again in the years sixteen fifty six sixteen fifty nine sixteen sixty nine sixteen seventy two and in sixteen eighty two the year of brown's death a comparison of the early editions shows that all have the same frontispiece and are with slight variations reprints of that of sixteen forty three the book also began to be reprinted with the pseudodoxia epidemica third edition sixteen fifty nine the latin editions followed each other rapidly as i mentioned it first appeared in leiden in sixteen forty four and was reprinted the same year there and in paris then in sixteen fifty in leiden again in sixteen fifty two in strasbourg and in the same place in sixteen sixty five and sixteen sixty seven the most important of these editions was that of strasbourg sixteen fifty two with elaborate notes by moltkius of which gui Patin speaks as miserable examples of pedantry and indeed stigmatizes the commentator as a fool the dutch translation appeared in sixteen fifty five and a french in sixteen sixty eight so that altogether during the author's lifetime there were at least twenty editions of the work in the seventeenth century there were in all twenty-two editions in the eighteenth century there were four english editions one latin and one german then a long interval of seventy-seven years elapsed until in eighteen thirty one thomas chapman a young exeter college man brought out a neat little edition my own copy of which is made precious by many marginal notes by s t coleridge who was one of the earliest and most critical among the students of sir thomas in the same year the first american edition was published edited by the rev alexander young of boston in eighteen thirty eight appeared an excellent edition by j a st john traveller linguist author and editor and in eighteen forty four longman's edition by john pierce the librarian of the city library bristol this edition was republished in america by the house of lee and blanchard philadelphia the only occasion i believe on which the religio has been issued by a firm of medical publishers in eighteen forty five appeared pickering's beautiful edition edited with many original notes by the rev henry gardiner in many ways the most choice of the nineteenth century issues in eighteen sixty two james tickner fields the well-known boston scholar and publisher brought out a very handsome edition of which for the first time in the history of the book an edition de luxe was printed on larger paper in eighteen sixty nine appeared sampson low and company's edition by willis bunt and in eighteen seventy eight rivington's edition edited by w p smith then in eighteen eighty one there came what must always remain the standard edition edited by dr greenhill for the golden treasury series and reprinted repeatedly by macmillan and company to his task dr greenhill brought not only a genuine love of sir thomas brown but the accuracy of an earnest painstaking scholar since the year eighteen eighty one a dozen or more editions have appeared of which i may mention the excellent one by dr lloyd roberts of manchester i may finish this dry summary by noting the contrast between the little parchment-covered surreptitious edition of sixteen forty two and the sumptuous folio of the vale press in all including those which have appeared with the collected works there have been about fifty-five editions brown states that the work had also been translated into high dutch and into italian but i can find no record of these editions nor of a german translation sixteen eighty mentioned by watt 
Space will allow only a brief reference to Brown's other writings, Pseudodoxia Epidemica, or inquiries into very many received tenets and commonly presumed truths, appeared in 1646 in a small folio. In extent, this is by far the most pretentious of Brown's works. It forms an extraordinary collection of old wives' fables and popular beliefs in every department of human knowledge, dealt with from the standpoint of the science of that day. In a way, it is a strong protest against general credulity and inexactness of statement, and a plea for greater accuracy in the observation of facts and in the recording of them. Walter Pater has drawn attention to the striking resemblance between Brown's chapter on the sources of error and Bacon's doctrine of the idola, shams which men fall down and worship. He discusses cleverly the use of doubts, but, as Pater remarks, Brown was himself a rather lively example of entertainments of the idols of the cave, idola specus, and like Boyle, Digby, and others, he could not quite free himself from the shackles of alchemy and a hankering for the philosopher's stone. The work was very popular and extended the reputation of the author very widely. Indeed, in 1646, Brown was not known at large as the author of the Religio, as his name had not appeared on the title page of any edition issued at that date. The Pseudodoxia was frequently reprinted, a sixth edition being published in 1672, and it appeared in French, both in France and in Holland. Equaling in popularity among certain people, the Religio, certainly next to it in importance, is the remarkable essay known as Hydriotaphia, Urn Burial, or a discourse of the sepulchral urns lately found in Norfolk, 1658. Printed with it is The Garden of Cyrus, a learned discourse on gardens of all forms in all ages naturally when an unusual number of funeral urns were found at walsingham they were brought to the notice of brown the leading antiquary of the county instead of writing a learned disquisition upon their date he thought them roman they were in reality saxon with accurate measurements and a catalogue of the bones he touches upon the whole incident very lightly but using it as a text breaks out into a noble and inspiring prose poem a meditation upon mortality and the last sad rites of all nations in all times with learned comments on modes of sepulchre illustrated with much antiquarian and historical lore running through the work is an appropriate note of melancholy at the sad fate which awaits the great majority of us among whom the iniquity of oblivion must blindly scatter her poppy the greater part must be content to be as though they had not been to be found in the register of god not in the record of men nowhere in his writings does the prose flow with a more majestic roll take for example this one thought if the nearness of our last necessity brought a nearer conformity unto it there were a happiness in hoary airs and no calamity in half senses but the long habit of living indisposes us for dying when avarice makes us the sport of death when even david grew politically cruel and solomon could hardly be said to be the wisest of men but many are too early old and before the days of age. Adversity stretcheth our days, misery makes Alcamina's nights, and time hath no wings unto it. Closely connected in sentiment with the urn burial is the thin folio pamphlet, the rarest of all Brown's works, printed posthumously in 1690, a letter to a friend upon occasion of the death of his intimate friend it is a splendid dissertation on death and modes of dying and is a unique study of the slow progress to the grave of a consumptive it is written in his most picturesque and characteristic vein with such a charm of diction that some critics have given it the place of honour among his works pater in most enthusiastic terms speaks of it with the urn burial as the best justification of brown's literary reputation 
the tender sympathy with which the poor relics of humanity which brown expresses so beautifully in these two meditations has not been meted to his own who knows the fate of his bones or how often he is to be buried he asks in eighteen forty while workmen were repairing the chancel of st peter mancroft the coffin of sir thomas was accidentally opened and one of the workmen took the skull which afterwards came into the possession of dr edward lubbock who deposited it in the museum of the norfolk and norwich infirmary when i first saw it there in eighteen seventy two there was on it a printed slip with these lines from the hydriotaphia to be knaved out of our graves to have our skulls made drinking bowls and our bones turned into pipes to delight and sport our enemies our tragical abominations escaped in burning burials the skull has been carefully described by mr charles williams to whom i am indebted for the loan of photographs in addition to the letter to a friend there are three posthumous works certain miscellany tracts sixteen eighty four edited by archbishop tennyson and posthumous works seventeen twelve containing chiefly papers of antiquarian interest in the same year seventeen twelve appeared the christian morals edited by archdeacon jeffrey of norwich from a manuscript found among brown's papers probably a work of his later life it forms a series of ethical fragments in a rich and stately prose which in places presents a striking parallelism to passages in the hebrew poetry the work is usually printed with the religio to which in reality it forms a supplement of the collected editions of brown's works the first a fine folio appeared in sixteen eighty six in eighteen thirty six simon wilkin himself a norwich man edited the works with the devotion of an ardent lover of his old townsman and with the critical accuracy of a scholar all students of sir thomas remain under a lasting debt to mr wilkin and it is pleasant to know that through the kindness of his daughter-in-law mrs wilkin of sidmouth a sir thomas brown library has been founded in connection with the castle museum norwich in which mr simon wilkin's collections have been placed three appreciation critics from johnson to walter pater have put on record their estimate of brown and of his place in literature among these for keenness of appreciation pater takes the first rank lamb and coleridge dearly loved the old norwich physician in whom they found a kindred spirit in america the new england writers tickner fields holmes and lowell were ardent students of his works lowell in particular is fond of apt quotations from him and in one place speaks of him as our most imaginative mind since shakespeare but no one has put so briefly and so clearly the strong character of our author as the french critic taine let us conceive a kindred spirit to shakespeare's a scholar and an observer instead of an actor and a poet who in place of creating is occupied in comprehending but who like shakespeare applies himself to living things penetrates their internal structure puts himself in communication with their actual laws imprints in himself fervently and scrupulously the smallest details of their figure who at the same time extends his penetrating surmises beyond the region of observation discerns behind visible phenomena a world obscure yet sublime and trembles with a kind of veneration before the vast indistinct but populous abyss on whose surface our little universe hangs quivering such a one is sir thomas brown a naturalist a philosopher a scholar a physician and a moralist almost the last of the generation which produced jeremy taylor and shakespeare no thinker bears stronger witness to the wandering and inventive curiosity of the age no writer has better displayed the brilliant and sombre imagination of the north 
no one has spoken with the more elegant emotion of death the vast night of forgetfulness of the all-devouring pit of human vanity which tries to create an immortality out of ephemeral glory or sculptured stones no one has revealed in more glowing and original expressions the poetic sap which flows through all the minds of the age the growing popularity of brown's writings testifies to the assured position he holds if not in the hearts of the many at least in the hearts of that saving remnant which in each generation hands on the best traditions of our literature we who are members of his profession may take a special pride in him among physicians or teachers of physic there is perhaps but one name in the very first rank rabelais stands apart with the kings and queens of literature among the princes of the blood there are differences of opinion as to rank but sir thomas brown holmes and john brown of edinburgh form a group together high in the circle of the three two were general practitioners oliver wendell holmes only in the early part of his life and for forty years a teacher of anatomy but all three have far closer ties with us than goldsmith smollett or keats whose medical affiliations were titular rather than practical burton brown and fuller have much in common a rare quaintness a love of odd conceits and the faculty of apt illustrations drawn from out-of-the-way sources like montaigne's burton's even more brown's bookishness is of a delightful kind and yet as he maintains his best matter is not picked from the leaves of any author but bred among the weeds and tares of his own brain in his style there is a lack of what the moderns call technique but how pleasant it is to follow his thoughts rippling like a burn not the stilted formality of the technical artist in words the cadences of whose precise and mechanical expressions pall on the ear as has been remarked the religio medici is a tour de force an attempt to combine daring scepticism with humble faith in the christian tradition sir thomas confesses himself to be naturally inclined to that which misguided zeal terms superstition he cannot hear the ave maria bell without an elevation he has no prejudices in religion but subscribes himself a loyal son of the church of england in clear language he says in brief where the scripture is silent the church is my text where that speaks it is but my comment when there is a joint silence of both i borrow not the rules of my religion from rome or geneva but from the dictates of my own reason he is hard on the controversialist in religion every man is not a proper champion for truth nor fit to take up the gauntlet in the cause of verity and so forth while he disclaims any taint or tincture of heresy he confesses to a number of heretical hopes such as the ultimate salvation of the race and the efficacy of prayers for the dead he freely criticizes certain seeming absurdities in the bible narrative his travels have made him cosmopolitan and free from all national prejudices i feel not in myself those common antipathies that i can discover in others whose national repugnancies do not touch me nor do i behold with prejudice the french italian spaniard or dutch but where i find their actions in balance with my countrymen's i honour love and embrace them in the same degree i was born in the eighth climate but seem for to be framed and constellated unto all i am no plant that will not prosper out of a garden all places all airs make unto me one country i am in england everywhere and under any meridian only the fool multitude that chooses by show he holds up to derision as the numerous piece of monstrosity which taken asunder seem men and the reasonable creatures of god but confused together make but one great beast and a monstrosity more prodigious than hydra he has a quick sympathy with the sorrows of others and though a physician his prayer is with the husbandman and for healthful seasons 
no one has put more beautifully the feeling which each one of us has had at times about patience let me be sick myself if sometimes the malady of my patient be not a disease unto me i desire rather to cure his infirmities than my own necessities where i do him no good methinks it is scarce honest gain though i confess tis but the worthy salary of our well-intended endeavours he has seen many countries and has studied their customs and politics he is well versed in astronomy and botany he has run through all systems of philosophy but has found no rest in any as death gives every fool gratis the knowledge which is won in this life with sweat and vexation he counts it absurd to take pride in his achievements though he understands six languages besides the patois of several provinces as a scientific man brown does not take rank with many of his contemporaries he had a keen power of observation and in the pseudodoxia and in his letters there is abundant evidence that he was an able naturalist he was the first to observe and describe the peculiar substance known as adipocere and there are in places shrewd flashes such as the suggestion that the virus of rabies may be mitigated by transmission from one animal to another but we miss in him the clear dry light of science as revealed in the marvellous works of his contemporary harvey busy as a practical physician he was an observer not an experimenter to any extent though he urges join sense unto reason and experiment unto speculation and so give life unto embryon truths and verities yet in their chaos he had the highest veneration for harvey whose work he recognized as epoch-making his piece de circule sang which discovery i prefer to that of columbus he recognized that in the faculty of observation the old greeks were our masters and that we must return to their methods if progress were to be made he had a much clearer idea than had sydenham of the value of anatomy and tells his young friend power of falifax to make autopsia his fidus achates that he should have believed in witches and that he should have given evidence in sixteen sixty four which helped to condemn two poor women is always spoken of as a blot on his character but a man must be judged by his times and his surroundings while regretting his credulity we must remember how hard it was in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries not to believe in witches how hard indeed it should be to-day for any one who believes implicitly the old testament and men of the stamp of reginald scott and johannes virus who looked at the question from our point of view were really anomalies and their strong presentation of the rational side of the problem had very little influence on their contemporaries for the student of medicine the writings of sir thomas brown have a very positive value the charm of high thoughts clad in beautiful language may win some readers to a love of good literature but beyond this is a still greater advantage like the thoughts of marcus aurelius and the enchiridion of epictetus the religio is full of counsels of perfection which appeal to the mind of youth still plastic and unhardened by contact with the world carefully studied from such books come subtle influences which give stability to character and help to give a man a sane outlook on the complex problems of life sealed early of this tribe of authors a student takes with him as compagnons de voyage lifelong friends whose thoughts become his thoughts and whose ways become his ways mastery of self conscientious devotion to duty deep human interest in human beings this best of all lessons you must learn now or never and these are some of the lessons which may be gleaned from the life and from the writings of sir thomas brown end of chapter eleven part two chapter twelve fracastorius one upon few pictures in literature do we dwell with such greater pleasure than that of catullus returning to his home near verona 
wearied with the pleasures of the capital sick at heart after the death of his much beloved brother and still we may fancy aching with the pangs of misprized love but at the sight of paninsularum sirmio insularum que ocellus he breaks out into joyful song and all his cares vanish fifteen centuries later another bard of sirmio sang the joys of the lago di goda mid caphian hills and while we cannot claim for fracastor a place beside his immortal townsman he occupies a distinguished position in our annals as the author of the most successful medical poem ever written and as the man from whom we date our first accurate knowledge of the processes of infection and contagion the facts relating to the life of fracastorius are to be obtained from the venice edition of his works fifteen eighty four and from the remarkably full and critical study by menken the best account in english is by greswell he was born in fourteen eighty three at verona of an ancient family the fracastoria the name is also spelt fracastorius there are related of his early days two marvellous stories that he was born with his lips so united that a surgeon had to be called in to separate them and that while an infant in his mother's arms he escaped unhurt while she was killed by a lightning stroke he early gave signs of unusual ability and was sent to padua at that time well deserving the encomium of shakespeare fair padua nursery of the arts here he made warm friends with many brilliant young men with whom in after life he remained on terms of close intimacy and to some of whom his poems were dedicated it is uncertain how long he resided at padua but at the outbreak of war he joined the venetian forces under the command of his friend livianus at whose defeat and capture fracastor returned to his native town there is no information as to his teachers in medicine but menken suggests that from hieronymus turianus he got his most important training he seems very quickly to have gained reputation as a physician and his services were sought by rich and poor alike it is stated that he practised without pecuniary reward poetry astronomy cosmography and natural philosophy shared with medicine his time and his labours he kept up an extensive correspondence with many distinguished men in science and in letters he performed wonders by his exact knowledge of herbs and simples by searching the best books of the ancients the most excellent antidote discordium was of his preparing the age in which he lived saw nothing equal to his learning but his honesty so writes the author of the life prefixed to the english translation of the morbus gallicus he lived for the greater part of the time in the country near verona amid the hills overlooking the lago di garda here says his biographer after a moderate ascent is seen the villa of fracastor in the midst of a level ground yet so elevated as to command a view of the lake the house is plain and has little to boast from artificial ornament but much from the natural beauty of the situation it is of square form with an open aspect on every side except the north on the east on which part the adesia rolls its rapid current hastening from the interior of germany and laves the foot of the mountain it commands a view of verona with innumerable villas scattered here and there in the subjacent plain on the west the appearance of the lago de garda is no less pleasing here hills rising in alternate succession meet the view here the sometimes disturbed and tumultuous billows of the lake the charming peninsula of catullus vessels with extended sails and fishing barks seen approaching from remote distances and numerous towns and hamlets seated on the sunny promontories here our hero Lamo was accustomed to enjoy the conversation of his friends here he found that tranquillity and rural seclusion equally propitious to the muses and to severer studies and here he produced many of those works which spread his celebrity throughout europe and covered his brow with the wreath of fame in a poem addressed to turianus fracastor has himself celebrated the beauties of his home mid caphian hills he died of apoplexy in fifteen fifty three aged seventy one 
Monuments to his memory were erected at Padua by his friend Romnusius and by his fellow citizens. He was of low stature, but of good bulk, his shoulders broad, his hair black and long, his face round, his eyes black, his nose short and turning upwards by his continual contemplation of the stars. A lively air was spread over his countenance that displayed the serenity and ingenuity of his mind. Mencken makes fun of this description, particularly of the snub nose, and certainly the pictures give a fine Roman nose of full proportions. The important works of Fracastor are the two of which I shall speak, an astronomical work, Homocentrica, with a discussion of the old question of critical days, appeared in 1538. The word on Sympathia and Antipathia, Book I, appeared in 1546, in the same volume with De Contagione. Many fine editions of the collected works appeared after his death, and in the seventeenth century there were six or seven editions. The minor poems are to be found in all of them. 2. The scientific reputation of Fra Castorius rests upon the work De Contagione, and so forth, the title page of which is here reproduced. It contains, among other things, three contributions of the first importance, a clear statement of the problems of contagion and infection, a recognition of typhus fever, and a remarkable pronouncement on the contagiousness of phthisis in the sixteenth century and indeed for a much later period following the views of hippocrates and galen the fevers were thought to be due to a corruption or putridity of the humours and no very clear ideas have been expressed as to their mode of propagation still less of their origin the simple classification into ephemeral putrid and hectic forms was maintained through the recognition by the arabians of specific varieties such as smallpox and measles had stimulated greatly the study of fevers in the course of an active professional life fracastorius had witnessed the rapid spread of syphilis and repeated outbreaks of the plague and exanthematic typhus so that he had had exceptional opportunities to study the problems presented by them in answer to the question what is contagion he replies as the name indicates contagion is an infection passing from one individual to another and the infection is absolutely the same and the virus is the same in him who receives and in him who gives a fire in one house destroying an adjoining one does not do so by contagion as in the sense in which the word is used it is not a wholesale destruction but a change in the elements of which the body is composed brought about by particles of such minuteness that they do not come within range of our senses there are three fundamentally distinct classes of infections one diseases infecting by contact alone two those infectious by means of an intermediate agent fomites as garments and so forth and three those which infect at a distance through the air as the pestilent fevers and so forth he draws an analogy between the diseases of the first class and the putrefaction passing by contact from one grape or pear to another the seeds of contagion seminaria contagionum passing from one to another the contagion through fomites is the same in reality as in the direct the virus remains intact and is as active as in the body from which it came and it may be preserved two or three years just as odors are kept by small particles which retain their activity the whole question of fomites he discusses with a clearness new to medicine indeed i do not know that the word was used by any previous writer more curious and more astonishing he thinks are the contagions of the third class which act at a distance and seem indeed to be of a different nature and to act on a different principle the germs are more powerful and more subtle with a greater facility in penetrating bodies they differ extraordinarily among themselves some attack trees and grains others animals some attack men only others oxen some the old others only the young some males others only females the different germs attack different organs some the eyes others the deeper organs as the lungs 
Fracastorius draws a remarkable parallel between the processes of contagion and the fermentation of wine. It is not the same as putrefaction, which differs in the absence of any new generation and is accompanied with an abominable smell. Certain poisons resemble contagions in their actions, but they differ essentially in not producing in the individual a principle or germ capable of acting on another person. In the second book, the special fevers are considered under the two divisions of non-pestilent and pestilent, the former characterized by a milder course, embracing chiefly smallpox and measles, between which, however, he does not draw a very clear distinction in fifteen o five and fifteen twenty eight there appeared for the first time in italy a disease characterized by high fever early loss of consciousness and a copious petechial and lenticular rash fracastorius gives an excellent description of it as a disease quite distinct from the other pestilent fevers particularly the plague with which it had been confounded and we have no difficulty in recognizing it as an epidemic or exanthematic typhus the chapter de Fise contagiosa is of special interest to us as one of the earliest and clearest statements on the subject he says that previous writers have spoken of phthisis as originating in catarrh attacking the lungs or the rupture of a blood vessel or an abscess in the lung or the sequence of a pleurisy or a pneumonia but very few have spoken of contagion as an all-important cause habitual residence with a consumptive he regards as one of the most common sources of the disease the germs of which may remain attached to clothing and rooms for a year or more he recognizes the similarity of the hereditary and the contagious forms the third book devoted to treatment is not very satisfactory though there is a modern flavor in the statement that the germs which must be first attacked may be scattered or broken or chased away or dispelled by antipathy in the section on the treatment of phthisis he has not progressed beyond galen or celsus by far the best chapter in the book is devoted to syphilis an extended consideration in prose of the subject the poetical consideration of which as a younger man had made him famous three the countless contributions on the subject of syphilis in the fifteenth and sixteenth century belong now to the musty volumes of forgotten lore only two possessing perennial interest appear and reappear as witnesses to the vigor and vitality of the minds which produce them both were written by poets but the better poet wrote in prose and while not a physician gave one of the most realistic pictures of the disease which exists in literature ulrich von hutten poet satirist soldier reformer the greatest name after luther and erasmus in the reformation suffered with the new disease for many years the famous treatise on guaiacum fifteen nineteen is an account of his own case and those of his friends and of their weary sufferings until relieved by the new drug guaiacum lignum sanctum the mode of preparation of which and indications for use he lays down with the skill of an artist apart altogether from the unique interest attaching to von hutten as a man his little book is well worth reading as giving a graphic first-hand account of syphilis as it appeared early in the sixteenth century german editions are easy to procure one edited by oppenheimer was recently published by hirschwald berlin nineteen o two the other contribution is the celebrated poem of fracastorius the title page of which is here reproduced page two eighty two next to the famous regimen sanitatis of the school of salernum it ranks as the most popular poem in medical literature the original edition is a small quarto issued from a verona press and not a very good example of the printing of the period to its enduring popularity the numerous editions in the surgeon general's library washington and in the british museum bear witness and every few years a new translation appears in french german or italian an english translation by nahum tate in 1686 was published afterwards as a sort of supplement with separate pagination to dryden's examen poeticum or miscellany poems 1693 
third part a little quarto of seventy pages in latin verse it brought to the author both literary and professional fame his contemporaries exhausted the resources of the language in praise of a performance whose virgilian beauties excelled anything that had been written since classical days modern commentators have been more critical and have not found the poem so full of divine graces a well-known scholar whose judgment i asked sent the following i am frankly disappointed with fracastorius's poem the latin and the metrical propriety are admirable but there seems to me to be an intolerable amount of gas in it and i think he attached more importance to the form than to the matter i had hoped he would have been more definite about the form in which the disease showed itself in the sixteenth century and the remedies he proposes seem to me to be used more as an opportunity of introducing a number of sounding words of trees and places in a setting of classical mythology than as a series of well-considered prescriptions but perhaps i do him injustice lucretius with his account of the plague at athens would have given him a better model following the example of von hutten who dedicated his treatise to the archbishop of mainz fracastorius inscribed his work to his friend bembo a prince of the church and secretary to pope leo x as at this time the disease was not thought to be wholly of venereal origin such a dedication would not be deemed inappropriate apart altogether from the poetical interest which after all is subsidiary the work is of the greatest value as a contemporary picture of the disease embodying the opinions of an intelligent observer upon its origin in one other point it is notable the word syphilis invented by fracastor for the disease occurs in the poem as the name of one of the characters nowhere in the poem does he say why the disease is called after the shepherd or why he invented it but in his section on le mal francais in de contagione fifteen forty six he says in my poem i gave it the name syphilis it had been known by many names morbus gallicus mal francais the french pox the neapolitan disease and morbus venerus and so forth but from this time the new name became common and gradually came into general use to appreciate the rapid popularity of the poem it is to be remembered that in the early part of the sixteenth century syphilis was regarded as a mysterious epidemic hitherto unknown which had struck terror into all hearts by the rapidity of its spread the ravages it made and the apparent helplessness of the physicians to cure it the poem is an exposition of fracastor's views on the origin symptomatology and cure of the new disease which had seized astonished europe he accepts the usual statement that it first appeared in the french army before naples about fourteen ninety five to naples first it came from france and justly took from france its name companion of the war he discussed the american origin the popular one of the day say goddess to what cause we shall at last assign this plague unknown to ages past if from the western climes twas wafted o'er when daring spaniards left their native shore resolved beyond the atlantic to descry conjectured worlds or in the search to die more probable is it he thinks that the malign influence of the planets particularly the conjunction of mars and saturn had brought about conditions favourable to the outbreak of the plague which had existed for ages but slumbered at intervals long since he scattered his infernal flame and always being had though not a name our elements are slaves to the rabble of the sky and when a planet enters a new course some mighty work of fate is to be expected two hundred years ago when mars and saturn were last in conjunction an unknown fever raged through the east and similar plagues were predicted by the astronomers as a result of their recent position in the skies the description of the symptoms is very complete and there is no difficulty in recognizing the disease there is a period of incubation the moon four monthly rounds shall steer 
before the appearance of convincing symptoms and all this time the malady lurks within and grows confirmed gradually the victim begins to feel depressed the roses fade from his cheeks a leaden hue spreads over his face and then local sores appear on the genitalia fracastor with the majority of the writers of that date thought the disease had very often an extra genital origin what night's ungrateful shades arise then began the execrable pains in arms shoulders and legs soon foul blotches spread over the skin and pustules form the muscles are attacked deep ulcers form and the bones are laid bare instead of tuneful speech imperfect sounds result from involvement of the vocal cords in places the humour grows fixed and hardens to a node he then pictures a fair and beautiful youth full of the pride of life and the joys of health stricken with the terrible plague and deformed out of all recognition and it reminds him of the state of his beloved italy torn with strife and at the mercy of foreign foes now for our second task and what relief our age has found against this raging grief the patient's constitution and the temper of his blood must be considered get out in the open air away from fens and lakes take to the chase but not too actively the boar but not the stag may be attempted even the plough the rake and the axe are not to be despised the very house yields exercise the hall has room for fencing and the bounding ball minerva not venus may be sought diet is all-important avoid fish as they convert more to humours than to nourishment pork may be eaten and poultry but all coarser foods must be spurned milk is the best drink wine as a rule is to be avoided plenty of fresh vegetables are to be taken if strength suffices the patient may be bled particularly in the spring a bitter tonic of fennel and hops is to be ordered the greater part and with success more sure by mercury perform the happy cure a wondrous virtue in that mineral lies its healing power was revealed to one ilsius a huntsman who was afflicted with the disease in syria Calero, a goddess directed him how to get the precious metal from the spacious voids and subterranean roads and after bathing in the lakes of liquid silver he was healed full directions for in unction are given the lard of swine is used for a vehicle mixed with larch gum and turpentine the whole body is to be smeared except the head and breast and then the patient is to sweat profusely under thick bed clothing the course is to be repeated for ten days until the mass of humours now dissolved within to purge themselves by spittle shall begin victorious health is now at hand and all that remains is to take a bath with rosemary and lavender vervain and yarrow to wash all the dregs away but the virtues of the sacred tree must also employ his muse to tell of blessing never seen or sung before the tree is first described growing in a spacious isle with branches ever green so hard is the substance that it makes a saw toothless and scarcely receives a flaw from the axe in variegated hue the wood resembles the gaudy bow and the natives conscious of its use plant it on the hills and vales the mode of preparation and administration is as follows or break in splinters which they steep a while in fountains and when soaked in vessels boil regardless how too fierce a fire may make the juice run o'er whose healing froth they take with which they bathe their limbs where pustules breed and heal the breaches where dire ulcers feed half boiled away the remnant they retain and adding honey boil the chips again to use no liquor when they dine their country's law and greater priest enjoin the first decoction with the rising light they drink and once again at fall of night this course they strictly hold when once begun till cynthia has her monthly progress run 
housed all the while where no offensive wind nor the least breath of air can entrance find it is interesting to compare the account of the cure with that given by ulrich von hutten while not so full in detail it agrees in the main and particularly in the last injunction to house the patient during it so that no fresh air can reach him and to restrict the diet to just so much food as can barely life preserve in both the cure was to last for thirty days as fournier remarks in a note in his translation of the morbus gallicus the identity of the directions in these two writers pharmacological and general speak for a fixed and consecrated plan which was followed with scrupulous exactness there is told the story of the discovery of the new world by columbus and the joy of the sailors in its wonders unhappily they shot some beautiful birds beloved of the sun-god and a prophecy of dire ills was uttered by one of the birds which escaped nor end your sufferings here a strange disease and most obscene shall on your bodies seize by chance before they left the natives held the great festival to the sun-god but grief was on all faces all languished with the same obscene disease but the priest in snowy robes displayed the boughs of healing guayacum with which he purged the tainted ground this the native prince assured the spanish general was the disease the holy bird had predicted would attack his men and he told the story of the origin of the plague and the discovery of guayacum as a cure a shepherd once distrust not ancient fame possessed these downs and syphilis his name he kept the flocks of king alcathus and one year the drought was so extreme that the cattle perished for want of water so incensed was syphilis that he blasphemed the sun-god in good set terms and decided from henceforth to offer no sacrifices to him but to worship king alcithus this shepherd won all the people to his way and the king was overjoyed and proclaimed himself in earth's low sphere to be the only and sufficient deity but the sun-god enraged darted forth infection on air earth and streams and syphilis became the first victim of the new disease he first wore buboes dreadful to the sight first felt strange pains and sleepless past the night from him the malady received its name becoming a general pestilence the sun-god was appealed to and his priests promised a cure if a proper sacrifice was made to appease the offended deity the lot fell on syphilis who was bound on the altar with his throat laid open to the uplifted knife but at the last moment juno interceded and commanded them to slay a heifer in his stead an annual sacrifice in commemoration of this event was held and a swine bound to the altar to witness syphilis his crime the guiacum was given as a cure for the disease the afflicted sailors learned of the natives how to prepare the remedy and not forgetful of their country's good freighted their largest ships with the rich wood iberian coasts you first were happy made with this rich plant and wondered at its aid known now to france and neighboring germany cold scythian coasts and temperate italy to europe's bounds all bless the vital tree joseph the other long poem of fracastorius was translated into english by joshua sylvester with the following remarkable title the maiden's blush joseph mirror of modesty map of piety maze of destiny or rather divine providence from the latin of fracastorius translated and dedicated to the high hopeful charles prince of wales london sixteen twenty twelve mo End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen harvey and his discovery part one one only those of us mr president and fellows who have had the good fortune to hold the distinguished position which by your kind grace sir i hold to-day 
only those of us who have delivered the harveyan oration can appreciate the extraordinary difficulties besetting a subject every aspect of which has been considered very often too by men who have brought to the task a combination of learning and literary skill at once the envy and the despair of their successors but i take it sir that in this ambervalia or commemorative festival for blessing the fruits of our great men ordained definitely as much by him whose memory is chiefly in our minds to-day our presence here in due order and array confers distinction upon an occasion of which the oration is but an incident but honour worthy of such a theme should be associated with full knowledge of the conditions under which these great men lived and moved and here comes in the real difficulty because it is rarely possible to bring the fruits of independent critical investigation into their lives and works particularly hard is it for those of us who have had to live the life of the arena our best efforts bear the stamp of the student not of the scholar in my own case a deep reverence for the mighty minds of old and a keen appreciation of the importance to our profession of a study of history may be put in the scales against defects for the appreciation of which i have still remaining sufficient self-detachment the lesson of the day is the lesson of their lives but because of the ever-increasing mental strain in this age of hurry few of us have the leisure fewer still i fear the inclination to read it thoroughly only with a knowledge of the persistency with which they wage the battle for truth and of the greatness of their victory does the memory of the illustrious dead become duly precious to us history is simply the biography of the mind of man and our interest in history and its educational value to us is directly proportionate to the completeness of our study of the individuals through whom this mind has been manifested to understand clearly our position in any science to-day we must go back to its beginnings and trace its gradual development following certain laws difficult to interpret and often obscured in the brilliancy of achievements laws which everywhere illustrate this biography this human endeavour working through the long ages and particularly is this the case with the history of the organised experience of the race which we call science in the first place like a living organism truth grows and this gradual evolution may be traced from the tiny germ to the mature product never springing minerva like to full stature at once truth may suffer all the hazards incident to generation and gestation much of history is a record of the mishaps of truths which have struggled to the birth only to die or else to wither in premature decay or the germ may be dormant for centuries awaiting the fullness of time secondly all scientific truth is conditioned by the state of knowledge at the time of its announcement thus at the beginning of the seventeenth century the science of optics and mechanical appliances had not made possible so far as the human mind was concerned the existence of blood capillaries and blood corpuscles jenner could not have added to his inquiry a discourse on immunity sir william perkin and the chemists made coke possible pasteur gave the conditions that produced lister davy and others furnished the preliminaries necessary for anaesthesia everywhere we find this invariable filiation one event following the other in orderly sequence mind begets mind as harvey says opinion is the source of opinion democritus with his atoms and eudoxus with his chief good which he placed in pleasure impregnated epicurus the four elements of empedocles aristotle the doctrine of the ancient thebans pythagoras and plato geometry euclid de generazione and thirdly to scientific truth alone may the homo mensura principle be applied since of all mental treasures of the race it alone compels general acquiescence 
that this general acquiescence this aspect of certainty is not reached per saltum but is of slow often of difficult growth marked by failures and frailties but crowned at last with an acceptance accorded to no other product of mental activity is illustrated by every important discovery from copernicus to darwin the growth of truth corresponds to the states of knowledge described by plato in the theatirus acquisition latent possession conscious possession scarcely a discovery can be named which does not present these phases in its evolution take for example one of the most recent long years of labor gave us a full knowledge of syphilis centuries of acquisition added one fact to another until we had a body of clinical and pathological knowledge of remarkable fullness for the last quarter of a century we have had latent possession of the cause of the disease as no one could doubt the legitimate inference from discoveries in other acute infections the conscious possession has just been given to us after scores of investigators had struggled in vain with the problem came schauden with an instinct for truth with a capacity to pass beyond the routine of his day and with a vision for the whole where others had seen but in part it is one of the tragedies of science that this brilliant investigator with capabilities for work so phenomenal should have been cut off at the very threshold of his career the cancer problem still in the stage of latent possession awaits the advent of a man of the same type in a hundred other less important problems acquisition has by slow stages become latent possession and there needs but the final touch the crystal in the saturated solution to give us conscious possession of the truth but when these stages are ended there remains the final struggle for general acceptance locke's remark that truth scarce ever yet carried it by vote anywhere at its first appearance is borne out by the history of all discoveries of the first rank the times however are changing and it is interesting to compare the cordial welcome of the pallid spirochette with the chilly reception of the tubercle bacillus villemin had done his great work Kochheim and Salmonson had finally solved the problem of infectivity when Koch published his memorable studies. Others before him had seen the bacillus, but the conscious possession of the truth only came with his marvelous technique. Think of the struggle to secure acceptance. The seniors among us who lived through that instructive period remember well that only those who were awake when the dawn appeared assented at once to the brilliant demonstration we are better prepared to-day and a great discovery like that of schauden is immediately put to the test by experts in many lands and a verdict is given in a few months we may have become more plastic and receptive but i doubt it even our generation that great generation of the last quarter of the nineteenth century had a practical demonstration of the slowness of the acceptance of an obvious truth in the long fight for the aseptic treatment of wounds there may be present some who listened as i did in october eighteen seventy three to an introductory lecture at one of the largest of the metropolitan schools the burden of which was the finality of surgery the distinguished author and teacher dwelling on the remarkable achievements of the past concluded that the art had all but reached its limit little thinking that within a mile from where he spoke the truth for which thousands had been striving now a conscious possession in the mind of joseph lister would revolutionize it with scores of surgeons here and there throughout the world this truth had been a latent possession wounds had healed per primum since Meshon's day and there were men before joseph lister who had striven for cleanliness in surgical technique but not until he appeared could a great truth become so manifest that it everywhere compelled acquiescence yet not without a battle a long and grievous battle as many of us well knew who had to contend in hospitals with the opposition of men who could not not who would not see the truth sooner or later insensibly unconsciously the iron yoke of conformity is upon our necks and in our minds as in our bodies the force of habit becomes irresistible 
from our teachers and associates from our reading from the social atmosphere about us we catch the beliefs of the day and they become ingrained part of our nature for most of us this happens in the haphazard process we call education and it goes on just as long as we retain any mental receptivity it was never better expressed than in the famous lines that occurred to henry sedgwick in his sleep we think so because all other people think so or because or because after all we do think so or because we were told so and think we must think so or because we once thought so and think we still think so or because having thought so we think we will think so in departing from any settled opinion or belief the variation the change the break with custom may come gradually and the way is usually prepared but the final break is made as a rule by some one individual the masterless man of kipling's splendid allegory who sees with his own eyes and with an instinct or genius for truth escapes from the routine in which his fellows live but he often pays dearly for his boldness walter bejo tells us that the pain of a new idea is one of the greatest pains to human nature it is as people say so upsetting it makes you think that after all your favorite notions may be wrong your firmest beliefs ill-founded it is certain that till now there was no place allotted in your mind to the new and startling inhabitant and now that it has conquered an entrance you do not at once see which of your old ideas it will not turn out with which of them it can be reconciled and with which it is at essential enmity it is on this account that the man who expresses a new idea is very apt to be abused and ill-treated all this is common among common men but there is something much worse which has been illustrated over and over again in history how eminent soever a man may become in science he is very apt to carry with him errors which were in vogue when he was young errors that darken his understanding and make him incapable of accepting even the most obvious truths it is a great consolation to know that even harvey came within the range of this law in the matter of the lymphatic system it is the most human touch in his career by no single event in the history of science is the growth of truth through the slow stages of acquisition the briefer period of latent possession and the period so glorious for us of conscious possession better shown than in the discovery of the circulation of the blood you will all agree with me that a fellow in this college must take his courage in both hands who would in this place and before this audience attempt to discuss any aspect of this problem after nearly three centuries of orations the very pictures and books in this hall might be expected to cry out upon him but i have so taken my courage confident that in using it to illustrate certain aspects of the growth of truth i am but obeying the command of plato who insists that principles such as these cannot be too often or too strongly enforced there is a younger generation too the members of which are never the worse for the repetition of a good story stale though it may be in all its aspects to their elders and then there is that larger audience to be considered to which the season is never inappropriate to speak a word two the sixteenth century drawing to a close had been a period of acquisition unequalled in history brooding over the face of the waters of medievalism the spirit of the renaissance brought forth a science of the world and of man which practically created a new heaven and a new earth and the truths announced by copernicus and galileo far transcended the searching schoolman's view and half had staggered that stout stagerite among other things it had given to medicine a new spirit a new anatomy and a new chemistry in the latter part of the fifteenth century hippocrates and galen came to their own again a wave of enthusiasm for the fathers in medicine swept over the profession and for at least two generations the best energies of its best minds were devoted to the study of their writings 
how numerous and important is that remarkable group of men the medical humanists of the renaissance we may judge by a glance at bailey's biographie medicale in which the lives are arranged in chronological order from garbo of bologna surnamed the expositor to rabelais more than a hundred and fifty biographies and bibliographies are given and at least one half of these men had either translated or edited works of the greek physicians of our founder one of the most distinguished of the group and of his influence in reviving the study of galen and so indirectly of his influence upon harvey dr payne's story still lingers in our memories leonicenus lenniker gontier monti coke camerarius keys fuchs zerby corneras and men of their stamp not only swept away arabian impurities from the medicine of the day but also revived greek ideals and introduced scientific methods the great practical acquisition of the century was a new anatomy vesalius and his followers gave for the first time an accurate account of the structure of the human body and while thus enlarging and correcting the work of galen contributed to weaken the almost divine authority with which he dominated the schools nearly another century passed before chemistry in the hands of boyle and others reached its modern phase but the work of paracelsus based on that of the pious spagyrist basil valentine had by following its possibilities directed men's minds strongly to the new science but the new spirit alone was essential since it established the intellectual and moral freedom by which the fetters of dogma authority and scholasticism were forever loosened from the minds of men into this world we may say stepped a young folkstone lad when on the last day of may fifteen ninety three he matriculated at cambridge harvey's education may be traced without difficulty because the influences which shaped his studies were those which had for a century prevailed in the profession of this country we do not know the reason for selection of keys college which so far as i can gather had no special connection with the canterbury school perhaps it was chosen because of the advice of the family physician or of a friend or of his rector or else his father may have known keys or the foundation may already have become famous as a resort for those about to enter on the physic line or quite as likely as we so often find in our experience some trivial incident may have turned his thoughts towards medicine when he came up in fifteen ninety three there were those of middle age who could tell racy stories of keys the co-founder of the college against whose iron rule they had rebelled charged not only with a show of a perverse stomach to the professors of the gospel but with atheism the last days of key's noble life were embittered by strife and misunderstanding doubtless the generous souls among them had long since learned to realize the greatness of his character and were content to leave the heat of his faith to god's sole judgment and the light of his good works to men's imitation with which words half a century later the inimitable fuller concludes a short sketch of his life i like to think that perhaps one of these very rebels noting the studious and inquisitive nature of harvey had put into the lad's hand the little tractate de libris propriis from which to glean a knowledge of the life and works of their great benefactor the contemplation of such a career as that of keys could not but inspire any young man with enthusiasm no one in the profession in england had before that time reached a position which can be called european an enthusiastic student and the friend of all the great scholars of the day a learned commentator on the works of the fathers the first english student of clinical medicine a successful teacher and practitioner a keen naturalist a liberal patron of learning and letters a tender and sympathetic friend johannes keys is one of the great figures in our history nor need i before this audience dwell on his devotion to our interests except to say that the memory of no fellow on our roll should be more precious to us four years hence on october sixth will occur the quarter centenary of his birth as well in love as in gratitude we could celebrate it in no more appropriate manner 
and in none that would touch his spirit more closely than by the issue of a fine edition of his principal works including the manuscript annals of the college for the preparation of this there are those among us well fitted not less by veneration for his memory than by the possession of that critical scholarship which he valued so highly when harvey set out on the grand tour italy was still the mater gloriosa studiorum to which one hundred years earlier so tradition says linacre on leaving had erected an altar the glamour of the ideals of the renaissance had faded somewhat since the days when john free an oxford man had made the ancient learning his own and had so far bettered the instruction of his masters that he was welcomed as a teacher in padua ferrara and florence in a measure too the national glory had departed dimmed amid the strife and warfare which had cost the old republics their independence many years earlier fracastorius one of our medical poets had sung of her decadence to what a state o wretched italy has civil strife reduced and mouldered thee where now are all thy ancient glories hurled where is thy boasted empire of the world what nook in thee from barbarous rage is freed and has not seen thy captive children bleed and matters had not improved but had grown worse in the sixteenth century italian influence had sunk deeply into the social professional and commercial life of england more deeply indeed than we appreciate and it was not until a generation or two later that the candlesticks were removed from the cisalpine towns to montpellier paris and leyden in fifteen ninety eight a well-to-do young englishman who wished to study medicine thoroughly went to north italy and most naturally to padua fair padua nursery of the arts whose close affiliations with us may be gathered from the fact that she has given us more precedents than any university save oxford and cambridge in the years that had passed since vesalius had retired in disgust the fame of its anatomical school had been well maintained by fallopius columbus and fabricius worthy successors of the great masters of each may be said what douglas says of the first names in docendo maxima methodicus in medendo felicissimus in secundo expertissimus while the story of harvey's student life can never be told as we could wish we know enough to enable us to understand the influences which moulded his career in fabricius he found a man to make his life model to the enthusiastic teacher and investigator were added those other qualities so attractive to the youthful mind generous sympathies and a keen sense of the wider responsibilities of his position as shown in building at his own expense a new anatomical theatre for the university wide as was the range of his master's studies embracing not anatomy only but medicine and surgery also the contributions by which he is most distinguished are upon subjects in which harvey himself subsequently made an undying reputation the activity of his literary life did not begin until he had been teaching nearly forty years and it is a fact of the highest significance that during the very period of harvey's stay in padua fabricius must have been deep in the study of embryology and of the anatomy of the vascular system his great work on generation was the model on which harvey based his own in some ways more accurate studies studies in which as my colleague professor brooks of the johns hopkins university has pointed out he anticipated wolf and von baer the work of fabricius which really concerns us here is the divinorum osteolis others before him had seen and described the valves of the veins carolus one of the great stephani silvius and paul sarpi but an abler hand now attacked the subject and has left us a monograph which for completeness and for accuracy and beauty of illustration has scarcely its equal in anatomical literature if we compare 
plate seven for example with the illustrations of the same structures in the bidloo or the cooper anatomy published nearly one hundred years later we can appreciate the advantages which harvey must have enjoyed in working with such a master indeed it is not too far-fetched to imagine him scalpel in hand making some of the very dissections from which these wonderful drawings were taken but here comes the mystery how fabritius a man who did such work how a teacher of such wide learning and such remarkable powers of observation could have been so blinded as to overlook the truth which was tumbling out so to speak at his feet is to us incomprehensible but his eyes were sealed and to him as to his greater predecessors in the chair clear vision was denied the dead hand of the great pergamite lay heavy on all thought and descartes had not yet changed the beginning of philosophy from wonder to doubt not without a feeling of pity do we read of the hopeless struggle of these great men to escape from slavish submission to authority but it is not for us in these light days to gauge the depth of the sacred veneration with which they regarded the fathers their mental attitude is expressed in a well-known poem of browning's those divine men of old time have reached thou sayest well each at one point the outside verge that rounds our faculty and where they reach who can do more than reach willing to correct observations or to extend anatomy by careful dissection it was too much to expect from them either a new interpretation of the old facts or a knowledge of the method by which those facts could be correctly interpreted the ingenious explanation which fabricius gave of the use of the valves of the veins to serve as dams or checks to the flow of the blood so that it would not irrigate too rapidly and overflow the peripheral vessels to the deprivation of the upper parts of the limbs shows how the old physiology dominated the most distinguished teacher of the time in the most distinguished school in europe this may have been the very suggestion to his pupil of the more excellent way was it while listening to this ingenious explanation of his master that in a moment of abstraction dimly dreaming perhaps of an english home far away and long forsaken there came to harvey a heaven-sent moment a sudden inspiration a passing doubt nursed for long in silence which ultimately grew into the great truth of sixteen sixteen the works of Asaelius, of Fallopius, and of Fabricius effected a revolution in anatomy, but there was not at the close of the sixteenth century a new physiology. Though he had lost an anatomical throne, Galen ruled absolutely in all conceptions of the functions of the body, and in no department more serenely than in that relating to the heart, the blood, and its movements upon his views i need not dwell further than to remind you that he regarded the liver as the source of the blood of which there were two kinds the one in the veins the other in the arteries both kinds in ceaseless ebb and flow the only communication between these closed systems being through pores in the ventricular septum he knew the lesser circulation but thought it only for the nutrition of the lungs the heart was a lamp furnished with oil by the blood and with air by the lungs practically until the middle of the seventeenth century galen's physiology ruled the schools and yet for years the professors had been in latent possession of a knowledge of the circulation indeed a good case has been made out for hippocrates in whose works occur some remarkably suggestive sentences in the sixteenth century the lesser circulation was described with admirable fullness by servetus and by columbus and both sarpi and caesopinus had hippocratic glimmerings of the greater circulation these men with others doubtless were in latent possession of the truth but every one of them saw darkly through galenian glasses and theirs was the hard but the common lot never to reach such conscious possession as everywhere to make men acquiesce one must have the disinterestedness of the dead to deal with a problem about which controversy has raged and in which national issues have been allowed to blur the brightness of an image which would be clear as day to those with eyes to see 
nor would i refer to a matter long since settled by those best competent to judge had not the well-known work of luciani the distinguished professor of physiology at rome appeared recently in german dress and spread broadcast views to which with a chauvinism unworthy of their history our italian brethren still adhere it has been well said that he alone discovers who proves and in the matter of the circulation of the blood this was reserved for the pupil of fabricius skipping many arduous years we next meet him as lumlian lecturer to the college three the really notable years in the annals of medicine are not very numerous we have a calendar filled with glorious names but among the saints of science if we know an era it is as much as can be expected perhaps because such men are less identified with achievements than representative of the times in which they live with many of our greatest names we cannot associate any fixed dates the greeks who made hippocrates possible are associated by tradition with some theory or a small point in anatomy or merely with the place of their birth and the floruit cannot always be fixed with accuracy hippocrates himself erisistratus galen and aretius have no days in our calendar we keep no festival in their honour as the churches honour st jerome and st chrysostom it is not until after the renaissance that certain years anni mirabilis stand out in bold relief as connected with memorable discoveries or with the publication of revolutionary works nevertheless only a few in each century even the sixteenth so rich in discoveries has not more than five or six such years and not one of them is connected with work done in this country in the seventeenth century it is hard to name four made memorable by the announcement of great discoveries or the publication of famous works in the eighteenth century there are barely three while in the century just completed though it is replete with extraordinary discoveries one is hard pressed to name half a dozen years which flash into memory as made ever memorable by great achievements of the three most important anesthesia sanitation and antiseptic surgery only the first can be dated eighteen forty six and that for its practical application for the other two discoveries who will settle upon the year in which the greatest advance was made or one which could be selected for an anniversary in our calendar there is one dies mirabilis in the history of the college in the history indeed of the medical profession of this country and the circumstances which made it memorable are well known to us at ten o'clock on a bright spring morning april seventeenth sixteen sixteen an unusually large company was attracted to the new anatomical theatre of the physician's college amen street the second lumlian lecture of the annual course given that year by a new man had drawn a larger gathering than usual due in part to the brilliancy of the demonstration on the previous day but also it may be because rumours had spread abroad about strange views to be propounded by the lecturer i do not know if at the college the same stringent rules as to compulsory attendance prevailed as at the barber surgeon's hall doubtless not but the president and censors and fellows would be there in due array and with the help of the picture of the anatomy lecture by bannister which is in the hunterian collection glasgow and a photograph of which dr payne has recently put in our library we can bring to mind this memorable occasion we see the anatomy one of the six annually handed over to the college on the table the prosector standing by the skeleton near at hand and very probably on the wall the very tabulae of dissection of the arteries veins and nerves that hang above us to-day but the centre of attention is the lecturer a small dark man wand in hand with black piercing eyes a quick vivacious manner and with an ease and grace in demonstrating which bespeaks the mastery of a subject studied for twenty years with a devotion that we can describe as hunterian a fellow of nine years standing there was still the salt of youth in william harvey when not we may suppose without some trepidation he faced his auditors on this second day 
a not uncritical audience including many men well versed in the knowledge of the time and many who had heard all the best lecturers of europe the president henry atkins after whose name in our register stands the mysterious word corb had already had his full share of official lectures less burdensome three hundred years ago than now let us hope the lecture of the previous day had whetted his somewhat jaded appetite the censors of the year formed an interesting group john argent a cambridge man a great prop of the college and often president of whom but little remains known richard palmer also of cambridge and remembered now only for his connection with prince henry's typhoid fever as dr norman moore has told us matthew gwynne of oxford first professor of physic at gresham college and a playwright of some note in his day and theodore golston of merton college one of our great benefactors and for two hundred and sixty-seven years past and gone purveyor-in-chief of reputation to the younger fellows of the college myern would be there not yet a fellow but happy in his escape from the paris faculty still dusty with conflict he would scent the battle of far in the revolutionary statements which he heard Meverell, fresh from incorporation at cambridge also not yet a fellow mondeford often president whose little book vir bonus sets forth his life paddy a noteworthy benefactor a keen student still gratefully remembered at oxford would have strolled in with his old friend gwynne baldwin hamy the elder also a benefactor would be there and perhaps he had brought his more interesting son then preparing to enter leyden whose memory should be ever green among us let us hope thomas winston probably an old fellow student at padua and later appointed professor of physic at gresham college was absent as we can then be more charitable towards the sins of omission in his work on anatomy published after his death which so far as i can read contrary to the statement of monk roll of the college contains no word of the new doctrine as an old Paduan and fresh from its anatomical school, the younger Craig would not be absent. Flood, the Rosicrucian, of course, was present, attracted perhaps by rumors of anti-Galenian doctrines which had served to keep him out of the college. Nor would he be likely to be absent at the festival of one whom he calls his physical and theosophical patron and certainly on such an occasion that able aberdonian alexander reed would be there whose somatographia had just appeared with an extraordinarily full account of the vascular system reed was a good anatomist one of our most distinguished medico-chirurgical fellows and a liberal benefactor if as has been stated he was not a convert on account of his age it was on account of his youth for the harveyan doctrine if in meagre form is to be found in the later editions fifth of his manual but we would miss lodge the poet cried up at the last for physic as he had recently started for the continent and we may be sure that harvey's old fellow students at padua fortescue fox willoughby monsell and darcy would honour their friend and colleague with their presence and edward lister also a fellow paduan the first of his name in a family which has given three members to our profession two distinguished and one immortal it was not a large gathering as the fellows members licentiates and candidates numbered only about forty but as the lecture was a great event in the community there would be present many interested and intelligent laymen of the type of digby and ashmole and pepys the curious as they were called for whom throughout the seventeenth century the anatomy lecture equalled the play in attraction as it was delivered in latin only interspersed here and there with english words and illustrations there were probably more who heard than who comprehended as sir thomas browne indicated to his son edward when he lectured at chirurgians hall it is a fortunate and perhaps a unique circumstance in bibliography that the manuscript of this course of lecture should have been preserved and that we should be able to follow the demonstration step by step a long and formidable procedure as the whole anatomy of the thoracic organs was discussed 
i dare say there was a prolonged break between the morning and the afternoon lecture for a fine dinner such as pepys described when on february twenty seventh sixteen sixty three he went with harvey's pupil scarborough to chirurgeon's hall and was used with extraordinary great respect towards the close after discussing in novel and modern terms the structure and action of the heart harvey summoned up in a few sentences the conclusion of the matter they stand as follows in the prelecciones published by the college in eighteen eighty six w h constat per fabricum cordi sanguinem per fomines in aortum perpetuo transferi as by two clacks of a water bellows to raise water constat per ligaturum transitum sanguinis ab arteris ad venis unda perpetuum sanguinis motum in circulo fieri pulsu cordis probably few in the lecture hall appreciated the full meaning of these words which to some must have seemed a blot on the whole performance while others perhaps all with the feelings of the fishes after st anthony's well-known sermon much delighted were they but preferred the old way returned to their homes wondering what he would say on the morrow when the divine banquet of the brain was to be spread before them one thing was certain the lecture gave evidence of a skilled anatomist of remarkably wide experience and well versed in literature from aristotle to fabricius while harvey could agree with john hunter who states in a manuscript introductory lecture in the college library i deliver nothing i have not seen and observed myself he could not add with him i am not a reader of books nearly one hundred references to some twenty authors occur in the manuscript of the thorax or as he calls it the parlor lecture end of chapter thirteen part one chapter thirteen harvey and his discovery part two it is a great pity that we have no contemporary account of the impression on such men as myron or reed of the new doctrines for which we have the author's statement that they were taught annually and elaborated so far as i know there is no reference to show that the lectures had any immediate influence in the profession or indeed that the subject matter ever got beyond the circle of the college we are not without a first-hand account by the author of his reception these views as usual pleased some more others less some chid and calumniated me and laid it to me as a crime that i had dared to depart from the precepts and opinions of all anatomists others desired further explanation of the novelties it is difficult for us to realize the mental attitude of the men who listened year by year as the turn of the parlor lecture came their opinions no less firmly held than is our positive knowledge did not get much beyond the great dictator hippocrates puts us in mind of it galen has a thousand times inculcated the same the prince of the arabian tribe avicenne has set his seal unto it this expresses their mental state and such a heresy as a general circulation could scarcely be appreciated and in a man of such good parts as harvey would in pity be condoned just as we overlook the mild intellectual vagaries of our friends bootless to ask impossible to answer is the question why harvey delayed for twelve years the publication of his views he seems to have belonged to that interesting type of man not uncommon in every age who knows too much to write it is not a little remarkable that this reticence of learning has been a strong mental feature in some of the greatest of discoverers perhaps it was the motive of copernicus who so dreaded the prejudices of mankind that for thirty years he is said to have detained in his closet the treatise of revolutions from what harvey says very much the same reasons restrained the publication of his work to the lesser circulation with the authority of galen and columbus to support it men will give their adhesion 
but the general circulation is of so novel and unheard of character that i do not only fear injury to myself from the envy of a few but i tremble lest i have mankind at large for my enemies so much doth want and custom that has become as another nature and doctrine once sown and that hath struck deep root and wrested from antiquity influence all men he felt as he says to riolan that it was in some sort criminal to call in question doctrines that had descended through a long succession of ages and carried the authority of the ancients but he appealed unto nature that bowed to no antiquity and was of still higher authority than the ancients men have been for years in conscious possession of some of the greatest of truths before venturing to publish them napier spent twenty years developing the theory of logarithms and bacon kept the novum organum by him for twelve years and year by year touched it up indeed rowley states that he saw twelve copies two other famous discoveries by englishmen have the same curious history the two which can alone be said to be greater than the demonstration of the circulation of the blood zachariah wood speaks of harvey as the surmiser of the little world to distinguish him from another englishman who first went about the greater world but a greater than both isaac newton had grasped the secret of a cosmic circulation and brooded in silence over the motion of the spheres for more than twenty years before publishing the principia between the writing of the rough sketch in eighteen forty two and the appearance of the origin of species seventeen years elapsed and from the date of the journal notes eighteen thirty six in which we have the first intimation of darwin's theory more than twenty years in harvey's case this intellectual reticence this hesitation to quit the peaceful haven as he says has cost us dear only a happy accident gave us the dedenrazione and the college can never be too grateful to sir george ent for that christmas visit sixteen fifty so graphically described to which we owe one of the masterpieces of english medicine how many seventeenth-century treatises we could have spared to have had the practice of medicine conformable to his thesis of the circulation of the blood how instructive his prospective medical observations would have been we can gather from the remarkable series of cases scattered through the manuscript notes and his published writings his treatise apart on eventilation or respiration the medical anatomy or anatomy and its application to medicine as he says i also intend putting to press the work from observations in my possession on organs of motion in animals all of these with the work on generation in insects and others mentioned by dr merritt then library keeper sixteen sixty seven were probably dispersed when those sons of belial ransacked his chambers at whitehall still the die is cast and my trust is in the love of truth and the candour that inheres in cultivated minds with these words he consoles himself knowing from experience that the publication of even a portion of the work would raise a tempest zachariah wood in the preface to the english edition sixteen seventy three expresses what many of his contemporaries must have felt truly a bold man indeed o disturber of the quiet of physicians o seditious citizen of the physical commonwealth who first of all durst oppose an opinion conformed for so many ages by the consent of all de bach of amsterdam describes the dilemma in which teachers found themselves this new thing i did examine which the first entrance did seem very easily to be refuted but being weighed in a just balance and having added to reason my own eyesight it was found inexpugnable nay the very prick of truth in forcing to be embraced with both arms what should i do must hippocrates be left galen slighted no if we follow the truth sensed with reason and our sense we are still hippocrates his we are still galen's english edition sixteen fifty three 
the history of the next thirty years illustrates the truth of locke's dictum in the struggle for acceptance not the least interesting part of the story it should be told at greater length and with more detail than it has yet received more than i am able to give it that the repeated demonstrations aided by the strong personal influence of the man brought the college as a body to the new views is witnessed rather by the esteem and affection the fellows bore to harvey than by any direct evidence the appearance of the book in sixteen twenty eight made no great stir it was not a literary sensation a not uncommon fate of epoch-making works the authors of which are too far ahead of their contemporaries to be appreciated the same thing happened to newton's principia as sir william petty remarks i have not met with one man that put an extraordinary value on the book among englishmen primrose alone brought up among the strictest sect of the galenists and at the time not a fellow wrote a criticism from the old standpoint sixteen thirty two and remained unconvinced twelve years later as his controversy with regius shows and only one special treatise in favour of the circulation was written in england that of sir george ent a pupil and friend of harvey who wrote sixteen forty one specially against parisanus a venetian a foeman quite unworthy of his quill in the universities the new doctrine rapidly gained acceptance in cambridge through the influence of glisson while in part to harvey's work and influence may be attributed that only too brief but golden renaissance of science at oxford a little incident mentioned in the autobiographical notes of the celebrated wallace shows how the subject was taken up quite early in the universities and i look into it the speculative part of physic and anatomy as parts of natural philosophy and as dr glisson has since told me i was the first of his sons who in a public disputation maintained the circulation of the blood which was then a new doctrine though i had no design of practising physic this was in the early thirties but the older views were very hard to displace and as late as sixteen fifty one we find such intelligent members of the invisible college as boyle and petty carrying out experiments together in ireland to satisfy themselves as to the truth of the circulation of the blood it took much longer for the new views to reach the textbooks of the day from no work of the period does one get a better idea of the current anatomical and physiological teaching in london than from crook's body of man sixteen fifteen and sixteen thirty one collected out of vesalius platinus platerius laurentius valverda bacchinus and others it is an epitome of their opinions with the comments of the professor who read the anatomy lecture to the company of the barber surgeons in the preface to the first edition he speaks of the contentment and profit he had received from dr davis's lumleian lectures at the college of physicians there is no indication in the second edition that he had benefited by the instruction of dr davies's successor galen is followed implicitly with here and there minor deviations the views of columbus on the lesser circulation are mentioned only to be dismissed as superfluous and erroneous the gresham professor of the day dr winston makes no mention of the new doctrine in his anatomy lectures which were published after his death sixteen fifty one and are of special interest as showing that at so late a date a work could be issued with a galenian physiology unchanged in alexander reed's manual the popular textbook of the day the harveyan views are given in part in the fifth edition in which as he says in the preface the book of the breast is altogether new an item of no little interest since he was a man advanced in years and as he says the hour-glass hasteneth and but a few sands remain unrun Highmore, the distinguished Dorsetshire anatomist and a pupil of Harvey, in his well-known anatomy published in 1651, gives the ablest exposition of his master's views that had appeared in any systematic work of the period, and he urges his readers to study the de motu cordis as fontum ipsum from which to get clearer knowledge 
he quotes an appropriate motto for the period laudanus veteris sed nostris ultimer annis but even so late as sixteen seventy one the old views were maintained in the english edition of riolan and yet the knowledge of harvey's views must have spread widely not only in the profession but in that large outside circle of distinguished men who felt the new spirit of science working in their veins from converse or from the lumlian lectures which no doubt he often attended ken elm digby must have had the information about harvey's views on generation as at the date of the issue of his two treatises sixteen forty four they had not been published anywhere though he knew well the motion of the blood as expounded by harvey and had in making his great antidote studied the action of the viper's heart digby like descartes could not emancipate himself from the old views as shown in the following passage but if you desire to follow the blood all along every step in its progress from the heart round about the body till it return back again to its centre dr harvey who most acutely teaches this doctrine must be your guide he will show you how it issueth from the heart by the arteries from whence it goeth on warming the flesh until it arrive to some of the extremities of the body and by then it is grown so cool by long absence from the fountain of its heat and by evaporating its own stock of spirits without any new supply that it hath need of being warmed anew it findeth itself returned back again to the heart and is there heated again which return is made by the veins as its going forwards is performed only by the arteries sir william temple well expresses the attitude of mind of the intellectual philistine of the time who looked for immediate results speaking of the work of harvey and of copernicus he says whether either of these be modern discoveries or derived from old foundations is disputed nay it is so too whether they are true or no for though reason may seem to favor them more than the contrary opinions yet sense can hardly allow them and to satisfy mankind both these must concur but if they are true yet these two great discoveries have made no change in the conclusions of astronomy nor in the practice of physic and so have been but little use to the world though perhaps of much honor to the authors it is pleasant to notice that our old friend sir thomas brown with his love of paradox declared that he preferred the circulation of the blood to the discovery of america of the reception of harvey's views in holland and germany there is nothing to add to the admirable account given by willis the early and strenuous advocacy of descartes must have influenced the dutch physicians but in this as in so many other things the infection of his early years proved too powerful and he could not get rid of the ancient spirits of the discovery of the circulation he says it is la plus belle et la plus utile que l'on peut faire en médecine tout a fait contraire au sein sic touchant le mouvement du coeur which he held to be due to an ebullition of the spirits a sort of ferment espèce de levain existing in it the theory was more actively discussed in holland than elsewhere and the writings of drake wallius regius plempius sylvius de bach Carinius, te bertolini the dane and others threshed out the whole question very thoroughly and their views with those of hoffmann schlegel and others are referred to by willis and given in a greater detail by riolan in the oft-quoted statement that harvey conquering envy hath established a new doctrine in his lifetime hobbes was right so far as england and holland are concerned but it was far otherwise in france where he met with a bitter and protracted hostility the medical school of the university of paris at the time one of the best organized and most important in europe declined to accept the circulation of the blood during his lifetime and for some years after his death the history of the period is pictured for us in vivid colors in the journal intime 
which we patin kept up with his friends spon and falsinet of lyon and the Balens, père et fils with all his faults particularly his scandalous lack of charity one cannot but feel the keenest sympathy with this dear old man devoted to his saints hippocrates and galen fernel and dure and to his teachers pietra and riolan to him the circulation of the blood was never more than an ingenious paradox to such a lover of books and of good literature everything can be forgiven and in his letters we follow with deepest interest his vigorous campaign against his dear enemies the cuisiniers arabes who had enslaved people and physicians alike the haemophobes the chemists the astrologers and the stibiate or as he calls it the stygiate group to him the koran was less dangerous than the works of paracelsus the appearance of the new geneva edition of which he deeply deplores reverence for galen and friendship with riolan rather than any deep interest in the question inspired his opposition to him the new doctrine was ridiculous and it was he who called the partisans of it circulateurs in allusion to the latin word circulator meaning charlatan in sixteen fifty two he writes to spone that the question is still open whether the blood passes through the septum of the heart or through the lungs in sixteen fifty nine he promises to send him a work of vinian against the circulation more extraordinary still is the fact that as late as sixteen seventy twelve years after harvey's death the thesis of one cordell a bachelor of medicine publicly discussed the circulation of the blood and we patin who presided decided in the negative the fiction of an ingenious narrator le doux songe of harvey are the terms in which he speaks of it the whole passage is worth quoting as possibly the last public denouncement of what seemed a rank heresy to the old galenists readers note here follows an extended passage in french which this reader is not competent to read End note. as i said we can forgive a great deal to the man who has left us such a picture of seventeenth-century life drawn all unconsciously with a master hand and through the mists of prejudice and hate we can recognize the good sense which had the courage to protest against the forfanterie arabesque et bezodresque in much of the therapeutics of the day though a professor in the paris faculty and a brilliant lecturer patin at that time did not occupy such a distinguished position nor was his opposition of such importance as that of riolan john riolan the son the most experienced physician in the université of paris the prince of dissection of bodies and the king's professor and dean of anatomy and of the knowledge of simples chief physician to the queen mother of louis xiii as he is quaintly but very truly described by harvey brought up by his father to regard hippocrates and galen as the sources of all wisdom the intensity of his zeal increased with his years until at last to see the physic of galen kept in good repair became the passion of his life the deep pity of it all is that such mental blindness should have stricken a really great man for he was a brilliant anatomist and teacher the author of the best anatomical textbook of its day a man of affairs profoundly versed in literature a successful practitioner and for years the head of the profession in france the opposition of such a man was serious and naturally had a profound influence not content with the comparatively brief statement in enchiridion sixteen forty eight riolan published in england the following year his opuscula anatomica nova one very large section of which is taken up with the problem of circulation it was this probably as much as a present of the enchiridion that induced harvey to break his long silence and to reply after a report of a discussion upon a thesis in sixteen forty five and a statement of objections a most interesting discussion follows of the literature in which the opinions of various writers are examined particularly those of cartesius conringius walius and plimpius 
it is quite possible that the second disquisition of harvey to riolan published with the first in duodecimo form at cambridge in sixteen forty nine was brought out by riolan's latter publication though it is not directly referred to little did harvey appreciate that his old friend was both blind and deaf incapable of seeing obvious facts it was not a question of being conversant with anatomy or of having had experience on both of which points harvey dwells at length riolan knew his anatomy as well as or better than any man of his generation it was not that he would not but that he could not see the truth which was staring him in the face as Reno mentions, an occasional thesis, Fagan, 1663, Matoch, 1665, supporting the circulation, did slip through the faculty, but the official recognition in France did not come until 1673, when Louis XIV founded a special chair of anatomy at the Jardin des Plantes for the propagation of the new discoveries the satire of moliere and the arete burlesque of boileau completed the discomfiture of the anti-circulateurs but it had taken nearly half a century to overcome the opposition of those who saw in the new doctrines the complete destruction of the ancient system of medicine four even when full-grown in the conscious stage truth may remain sterile without influence or progress on any aspects of human activity one of the most remarkable of phenomena in mental biography is the failure of the greeks to succeed after giving the world such a glorious start they had every essential for permanent success scientific imagination keen powers of observation and if in the days of hippocrates the mathematical method of interrogating nature prevailed rather than the experimental galen carried the latter to a degree of perfection never again reached until the time of harvey only when placed in its true position in relation to greek religion and philosophy as has been done so skilfully by compares do we realize the immensity of the debt we owe to those our young light-hearted masters and compares makes clear the nature of the debt of greek thought to the practical sense of the physicians but alas upon the fires they kindled were poured the dust and ashes of contending philosophies and neither the men of the alexandrian school nor the brilliant labors of the most encyclopedic mind that has ever been given to medicine sufficed to replenish them fortunately here and there amid the embers of the middle ages glowed the coals from which we have lighted the fires of modern progress the special distinction which divides modern from ancient science is its fruitful application to human needs not that this was unknown to the greeks but the practical recognition of the laws of life and matter has in the past century remade the world in making knowledge effective we have succeeded where our masters failed but this last and final stage always of slow and painful consummation is evolved directly from truths which cannot be translated into terms intelligible to ordinary minds newton's great work influenced neither the morals nor the manners of his age nor was there any immediate tangible benefit that could be explained to the edification or appreciation of the ordinary man of his day yet it set forward at a bound the human mind as did such truths as were proclaimed by copernicus by kepler by darwin and others in a less conspicuous manner harvey's triumph was on the same high plane there was nothing in it which could be converted immediately into practical benefit nothing that even the sydenhams of his day could take hold of and use not so much really in the demonstration of the fact of the circulation as in the demonstration of the method the inventum mirabili sought for by descartes the novum organum of bacon lies the true merit of harvey's work while bacon was thinking harvey was acting and before descartes had left his happy school at la fleche 
Harvey was using la nouvelle méthode, and it is in this way that the de motu cordis marks the break of the modern spirit with the old traditions. No longer were men to rest content with careful observation and with accurate description. No longer were men to be content with finely spun theories and dreams which serve as a common subterfuge of ignorance and here for the first time a great physiological problem was approached from the experimental side by a man with a modern scientific mind who could weigh evidence and not go beyond it and who had the sense to let the conclusions emerge naturally but firmly from the observations to the age of the hearer in which man had heard and heard only had succeeded the age of the eye in which men had seen and had been content only to see but at last came the age of the hand the thinking devising planning hand the hand as an instrument of the mind now reintroduced into the world in a modest little monograph of seventy-two pages from which we may date the beginning of experimental medicine no great discovery in science is ever without a corresponding influence on medical thought not always evident at first and apt to be characterized by the usual vagaries associated with human effort very marked in each generation has been the change wrought in the conceptions of disease and in its treatment by epoch-making discoveries as to the functions of the body we ourselves are deeply involved to-day in toxins and antitoxins in obstinens to lases and extracts as a direct result of the researches in bacteriology and in internal secretion there were sanguine souls in harvey's days who lamented with florier that the discovery had not brought great and general innovations into the whole practice of physic but had the old lichfield physician lived he would have seen the rise of a school based directly upon the studies of harvey and sanctorius the brilliant reasonings of descartes and the works of bellini and borelli the mechanical school rose in its pride on solid foundations which appealed to practical men with singular force very soon that beatific epitome of creation man was marked out like a spot of earth or a piece of timber with rules and compasses and the medical terminology of the day became unintelligible to the older practitioners who could make nothing of the wheels and pulley wedges levers screws cords canals and cisterns sieves and strainers and they cracked their jokes on angles cylinders celerity percussion resistance and such like terms which they said had no more to do with physic or the human body than a carpenter has in making venice treacle or curing a fever once accepted men had a feeling that so important a discovery must change all the usual conceptions of disease as has been said before harvey tells that he had in preparation a practice of medicine conformable to his thesis of the circulation of the blood and it soon became customary to put in the title pages of works some reference to the new doctrine even riolan's opuscula anatomia makes an allusion to it Walius, a keen defender of harvey published in sixteen sixty a little compendium of practice ad circulationem sanguinis ad ornata but there is nothing in it to suggest any radical change in treatment rofink's dissertationes anatomica sixteen fifty embracing the older and more recent views in medicine are ad circulationem accommodate and even as late as sixteen ninety the well-known anatomy of dionys was suivant la circulation with the loss of his work on the practice of medicine it is impossible to say whether harvey's own practice was modified in any way to part from the spirits and humours must have left his attitude of mind very sceptical and that his therapeutic way was not admired as aubrey tells us speaks for a change which may have set many against him 
more important than any influence upon treatment was the irresistible change in the conceptions of disease caused by destruction of the doctrine of spirits and humours which had prevailed from the days of hippocrates while harvey as he says had in places to use the language of physiology that is the language of the day he makes it very clear particularly in the second letter to riolan that he will have none of the old doctrine to which the de motu cordis dealt the death-blow but the moving hand reminds your orator mr president of a bounden duty laid upon him by our great dictator to commemorate on this occasion by name all of our benefactors to urge others to follow their example to exhort the fellows and members to study out the secrets of nature by way of experiment and lastly for the honour of the profession to continue in love and affection among ourselves no greater tribute to harvey exists than in these simple sentences in which he established this lectureship breathing as they do the very spirit of the man and revealing to us his heart of hearts doubtless no one more than he rejoices that our benefactors have now become so numerous as to nullify the first injunction and the best one can do is to give a general expression of our thanks and to mention here and there as i have done the more notable among them but this is not enough while we are praising famous men honored in their day and still the glory of this college the touching words of the son of sirach reminds us some there be that have no memory who are perished as though they had never been and are become as though they had never been born such renown as they had time has blotted out and on them the iniquity of oblivion has blindly scattered her poppy a few are embalmed in the biographical dictionaries a few are dragged to light every year at sotheby's or the memory is stirred to reminiscence as one takes down an old volume from our shelves but for the immense majority on the long roll of our fellows names 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 nothing more a catalogue as dry and meaningless as that of the ships or as the genealogy of david in the book of chronicles even the dignity of the presidential chair does not suffice to float a man down the few centuries that have passed since the foundation of the college who was richard forster who was henry atkins perhaps two or three among us could tell at once and yet by these men the continuity and organic life of the college has been carried on and in maintaining its honour and furthering its welfare each one in his day was a benefactor whose memory it is our duty as well as our pleasure to recall much of the nobility of the profession depends upon this great cloud of witnesses who pass into the silent land pass and leave no sign becoming as though they had never been born and it was the pathos of this fate not less pathetic because common to all but a few that wrung from the poet that sadly true comparison of the race of man to the race of leaves the story of harvey's life and a knowledge of the method of his work should be the best stimulus to the fellows and members to carry out the second and third of his commands and the final one to continue in love and affection among ourselves should not be difficult to realize sorely tried as he must have been and naturally testy only once in his writings so far as i have read does the old adam break out with his temperament and with such provocation this is an unexampled record and one can appreciate how much was resisted in those days when tongue and pen were free over and over again he must have restrained himself as he did in the controversy with riolan of whom for the sake of old friendship he could not find it in his heart to say anything severe Today his commands are easier to follow when the deepened courtesies of life have made us all more tolerant of those small weaknesses inherent in our nature which give diversity to character without necessarily marring it. 
To no man does the right spirit in these matters come by nature, and I would urge upon our younger fellows and members, weighing well these winged words, to emulate our great exemplar, whose work shed such lustre upon British medicine, and whom we honour in this college, not less for the scientific method which he inculcated, than for the admirable virtues of his character. End of chapter 13, part 2 End of An Alabama Student and Other Biographical Essays by William Osler